uh, when Republicans think that the economy is actually in pretty good shape. So it just shows you sort of how the, the messages, the, the different messages are crossing each other and people don't necessarily appear to be listening to each other. And, and both parties are delivering completely different arguments about the state of the country. Uh, Caitlin, uh, on that point, uh, the idea of speaking about the coronavirus pandemic as if it's already behind us, as we heard in that past tense usage by Larry Kudlow, how does that fit into Republicans' overall messaging about the pandemic? And what's the status of any continuing negotiations to help Americans affected by this economic downturn? Well, that past tense referral to the pandemic really fits with the messaging coming from Republicans this week, which has largely been, remember how things were before the pandemic hit, kind of taking a passive approach to the pandemic and trying to remind voters that the economy uh, and everything, in their view, was going pretty well. In polling, we do see that Donald Trump does get positive grades on the economy, but we also see that he gets negative grades on his handling of the coronavirus pandemic, and that is helping to fuel Joe Biden's support in a lot of these battleground state polls. But it raises an interesting question about why not address what people are feeling right now with the pandemic. Those poll numbers suggest that voters are willing to give the president a little bit of a benefit of the doubt on the economy, kind of acknowledging that, sure, presidents, of course, don't create pandemics, but the response to it is something that is certainly within the purview of the president. And this is something that the campaign, that Republicans don't want to talk about because they're not getting uh, good grades on it. And it is still ongoing, of course, as you mentioned, 1,200 deaths just yesterday still. But this is an attempt by Republicans to try to portray a scenario or what they view as a scenario in which things were going okay before all of this happened. But I do think voters are going to ask, okay, but it happened. What are we going to do about it? Um, Eugene, I want to ask you about uh, some of the criticism of Joe Biden that we heard last night with respect to race. We heard, for instance, the Kentucky Attorney General uh, criticize Joe Biden's comment, uh, which seemed to suggest that the black vote was something that Democrats, they say, uh, have taken for granted. How is it that Republicans at the convention so far have framed these issues of race with respect to uh, what they say the Democratic Party is trying to do? It's been very similar to the Republican approach to race uh, in years past. The main argument from the GOP to black voters is if you give us a chance, we will show you what we can do. Uh, that hasn't been effective. As you know, uh, the Democratic candidates have won the black vote uh, consistently since 1965. Uh, and that's for various reasons. But this year, it's for one reason more than anything else. And that's because most black Americans, according to polling, actually believe that Donald Trump is a racist. And that's not just based on his policies, but based on his comments and his tweets and other actions. And so what we have seen at the Republican National Convention is uh, many black individuals, such as the Kentucky Attorney General, trying to make a case uh, for the Trump administration, arguing that it is the best uh, vote for people of color moving forward if they want to see more solutions presented for uh, all of the racial unrest and other issues uh, related to systemic di uh, discrimination. And Eugene, are some of those appeals directed not just at black voters, but at perhaps uh, moderate white voters who may be uncomfortable with some of the rhetoric that they have heard from the president himself? Absolutely. We've seen from many white voters who support Trump that they actually are quite uncomfortable with how the president handles race issues. Specifically, we saw the president attacking protesters this past summer, uh, despite the fact that Black Lives Matter as an idea is actually popular with the majority of Americans. And so they certainly want to see a president uh, who is backing away from uh, such divisive rhetoric. And even if we haven't seen the president do that exactly, seeing individuals like Tim Scott and Nikki Haley come out and say that they believe actually that uh, this president is more sensitive to issues concerning people of color soothes a lot of the concerns that we're seeing many of these white suburban college educated voters uh, who were previously on the Trump train and thinking about getting off actually stay on. Hmm. Um, Caitlin, I want to ask you about some of what we saw with respect to the choreography of how the convention unfolded last night. We saw, for instance, the president in multiple segments surrounded by the trappings of the office of the presidency, 
as part of this political convention, uh, which, you know, has raised a number of questions about potential violations of the Hatch Act, not necessarily the president himself, but those employees, including the uh, acting Homeland Security uh, uh, director at that naturalization ceremony. But how did last night fit into a broader pattern of how the president approaches typical political norms? Is that having an impact on voters at all? Well, the president's approach to typical political norms is to completely shatter them. And I think it's important to talk about the legal parameters of this and the political parameters of this. Um, the, the White House was in clear violation of the Hatch Act, uh, not only with the presentation at the White House, and we'll see the president again speaking to a, a crowd and when he accepts the nomination formally at the White House tomorrow, but also appearances by the DHS secretary and, of course, the secretary of state while on a foreign trip in Jerusalem. Um, so that is a clear violation. The, the president, however, and the White House have indicated time and time again that they don't really care about these violations. And they think, according to Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, who gave an interview to Politico today and said that he thinks that voters outside the Beltway don't care about these things. The thing is, however, that this is a president that is waging a law and order reelection campaign. And that law and order campaign really comes with an asterisk in a lot of cases, uh, because this is kind of signaling to people, um, or should signal to people, that um, th there are certain rules uh, that, that he follows and certain rules that he does not follow. Um, so it definitely sends that message. Whether or not people uh, care about the details, this is important to note what it is doing, and Republicans feel like voters are just not going to care, and they like the pomp and circumstance that the White House provides as a setting and also shows the president in the job. Well, Ed, you know, back in 2016, we all recall there were these urgent warnings about caravans of migrants moving towards the southern U.S. border, uh, warnings from Republicans, including Donald Trump. Now, four years later, we saw in that Republican convention uh, last night that naturalization ceremony. What does the Trump administration's actual record look like when it comes to both legal and illegal immigration? They've been trying to restrict both, Elaine, and, you know, that's to the... Uh, enjoyment and the, and the glee of a lot of uh, the president's diehard supporters and those that are uh, very much opposed to allowing more immigrants into the country, and as much to the consternation of some fellow Republicans who are concerned that even legal immigration has been restricted or, or that the president at least is trying to push for it. Uh, and so, you know, it, it is a signature issue for him. He is able to say that, yes, a few hundred more miles of wall uh, have been built. Of course, they're not being paid for by Mexico. Um, and, and I think last night was designed to sort of not only reinforce that he was celebrating legal immigration, uh, but that, uh, you know, also trying to suggest that by even holding that ceremony and holding it in the White House and holding it with the five new American citizens that were there, that he is somehow at least trying to be perceived as compassionate, understanding, and welcoming of immigrants. But make no mistake, his administration has, on this issue especially, tried to really tear up what was there before and change it entirely. Uh, and, you know, what we saw in that event, uh, or that part of the event last night, plus several of the speeches we've seen Monday and Tuesday, is really, again, all designed to try to recast the president as somebody who is far more understanding uh, and welcoming and, you know, accepting uh, of, of, of minorities, of immigrants, something that he's been criticized on, something that the polling shows is part of the reason why he's struggling to hold on to the support that he enjoyed four years ago. Whether this will work or whether voters are going to see right through it, you know, remains to be seen. And we may not know that now for several days or weeks. Um, Eugene, we also saw Republicans put religion very much at the forefront yesterday. There was that primetime speech by an anti-abortion activist. We saw Secretary of State Mike Pompeo making the case uh, for the president from Jerusalem. What was behind some of the messages that we heard last night? Well, that's, I mean, that's designed to shore up, oh, was this for Eugene or for Ed? Eugene, I'm sorry, Eugene. Oh, sorry. I thought you said Ed. It's okay. It's okay. Well, what we do know is that one of the reasons that 
uh, President Trump was so successful in 2016, it's because he had the support of white evangelical voters. Uh, but that's actually one of the demographics where the president is losing some support with. He's still certainly winning overwhelmingly uh, conservative Christians, but not at the same rates that he was in 2016. And that's in part because Joe Biden is actually known for his deep religious values. Uh, we know he's a Catholic and he makes so many decisions in policy world, in the policy world and in his personal life based on his Catholic faith. Also, people are very concerned. People of faith are very concerned that the president's uh, actions and his comments do not reflect someone who has deeply held convictions. And so they're looking elsewhere. As a result, we have seen people who believe that uh, President Trump is the best option for conservative Christians, and specifically white evangelicals, try to make the case uh, that his ideas, that his values, that his worldview uh, would actually benefit and align most with white evangelicals. And we're, we're likely going to see more of that being made uh, clear tonight and probably even tomorrow as well. All right. We'll close it out with you, Ed. Uh, so we're going to hear from Vice President Mike Pence tonight. What's his pitch to the electorate? Well, we're told it will be optimistic. It will focus especially on attacking or raising questions about Vice President Biden's stance on the economy and on foreign policy. He's also expected to talk about the success that he believes the Trump administration has had in dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. Remember, he's been directly involved in the day-to-day -day oversight of the government's response to that. He'll speak at Fort McHenry just outside Baltimore, another example of this convention being moved from private facilities to government-run facilities. And he will be joined by a modest crowd there who will watch him speak. Um, and, and, you know, it comes at a time, in fact, just as we were coming on the air, we released new CBS News polling that looks at Vice President Pence and his standing among Republicans. 56% of Republican voters enthusiastic about having him uh, speak this week and having him on the ticket. No surprise that his support is strongest among the most conservative and church-going of Republicans. That is part of the reason why Donald Trump picked him four years ago, part of the reason why he was able to help shore up support for the president four years ago, and part of why we're seeing him run that playbook yet again. He has gone in recent weeks to several different battleground states to focus on small events where he talks about the concerns that the Biden administration, if it were elected, would roll back various freedoms, would uh, potentially affect the economy. And he reminds voters, as he did four years ago, that a Trump administration means conservative judges, means a conservative majority is maintained on the, on the Supreme Court, and could be at risk if Democrats win the White House and the Senate this fall. All right. Ed O'Keefe, Caitlin Huey Burns, and Eugene Scott, thank you all very much. Coming up after the break, we'll be joined by a Republican candidate in what some are calling the most competitive congressional district in the U.S. Why all eyes are on this South Carolina contest. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's recording. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. 
and yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. An extraordinary moment in America. Can you understand the anger that we see over here? Absolutely, I understand the anger. Do you think there's systemic racism and how should we address it? There's a lot of progress still to be made. What are the questions white Americans should be asking? Questions about racial disparities. The mood of the country now has significantly changed. Do you think when it comes to reforming police in this country and healing race relations in this country, we have reached a tipping point? the biggest names in politics. Whoa, that's news. Do you think that the president has the authority to send in active duty troops? Face the questions you want answered. Did the CDC let the American people down? Tell me about the decision. When was it made? Who made it? What is the next area that you are concerned about? What does that mean for the risk of reinfection here in the United States? You bring up a very good point, Margaret. Margaret, that's a great question. Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan on CBS. George Floyd's death has inspired a movement. We are witnessing it right now. I think there's a level of bias in every individual. Is bias training enough? It's a start. We have to talk to people, listen. What do you think history teaches us about this moment we're in? This is a time for us not to rest. Why is it important, do you guys think, to come out? If we just stayed home, nothing would change. What do you hope no one comes from this? This is what's coming from it, and the change is here. Women are running for Congress in record numbers this year. That's in part because of a surge in Republican women candidates. According to the Center for American Women and Politics at Rutgers University, more than 300 women are in the running for a House seat this November. 211 are Democrats and 96 are Republicans. Both are all-time highs. One of them is Nancy Mace. She's the first woman to graduate from the Corps of Cadets at the Citadel, the military College of South Carolina. She's also a representative in the South Carolina State House. She's seeking to unseat Democratic Congressman Joe Cunningham. He won South Carolina's first congressional district by 4,000 votes in 2018. The victory was the first for a Democrat in the district since 1978. Experts saw Cunningham's win as a major upset. President Trump outpaced Hillary Clinton in the district by 13 points during the 2016 election. And Nancy Mace joins me now. She's the Republican candidate in South Carolina's first congressional district. Representative Mace, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Elaine, for having me on today. I really appreciate you highlighting this race. It's one of the top races in the country. Yes. Um, so I, I mentioned the president's margin of victory in that district in 2016. Why do you believe a Democrat was able to flip a Republican stronghold in the midterms? Well, certainly in the midterms in South Carolina's first congressional district, and we had a lot of Republicans that voted for the president that simply didn't turn out because he wasn't on the ballot. And I do believe that this year being a presidential year, we're going to have record turnout by Republicans. We just saw in the Republican primary that I won by 31 points in a four-person primary. Uh, we had record turnout for that. And I believe those are the kind of numbers that we're going to be seeing in November. And I'm running against a person who voted to impeach the president, who won this district by 13 points, voted to impeach him not once, 
but twice. And he's voted with Nancy Pelosi almost 90 percent of the time since he's been in office. He's been very partisan. And I offer to bring a new independent voice to the district. Well, as you know, there is a lot of outside money in this race. How do you plan right. to appeal to voters who went for Joe Cunningham? Um, well, certainly I, I am raising money as hard as I can. Um, this, is a, this is a big race, and there's going to be millions of dollars spent on both sides of the aisle in this thing. But the difference between Congressman Cunningham and I is that I grew up here. I'm from here. I have broken barriers all my life, including when I graduated from the Citadel 21 years ago. I'm a businesswoman and a state lawmaker. And although I'm Republican, I have a very fiscally conservative record as a state lawmaker. I also have a strong history of reaching across the aisle and working with Democrats on issues that are important to everybody in South Carolina's first congressional district. And for example, just a few months ago, um, our governor signed my prison reform bill into law. And so Democrats talk a lot about these issues, but they don't actually do anything about it. And I've been in the district. I grew up here. I know the issues. And I've been working on them in my work as a state lawmaker over the last three years. So the argument isn't that tough. I just have to get the word out. And if people are tired of buying what Nancy Pelosi is selling, then they should send a new Nancy to Congress. And my website is nancymace.org. All right. Get that plug in there. Um, I want to ask you, a Representative, about Always. women voters. Right. In our CBS News poll done before the convention, Joe Biden closed the gap to just six points among white women. Black women are, are siding with Democrats by a 93 to 4 margin. Right. Is the Republican Party, you think, doing enough to appeal to women? Certainly. I mean, we have a record number of Republican women that are running for Congress this year. So many moms, single moms like myself, we have raised our hand and said enough is enough. Our kids and our country are worth fighting for. And that's why I'm running for this seat, too. And it's really important for all of us, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, to set example for our children, for our communities. And there are record numbers of women on both sides running for office. And I think it's quite remarkable. Um, but I'm running to win, and I'm really excited about this race. As a businesswoman, um, I've been breaking barriers also all my life. And South Carolina has never elected a Republican woman to Congress. And I plan to make that difference this year in November. I know, Representative, you recently talked publicly about the fact that you're recovering from the coronavirus. How are right. you doing now? Um, well, I would uh, describe my recovery as, uh, as some of us have been reading about this in, in the last couple of weeks as a long hauler. I will tell you, COVID-19 is a serious illness, and I was very sick. And even at one point, I struggled to catch my breath. And my oldest, my son, who's an eighth grader this year, turned to me and he said, Mommy, you sound like Darth Vader when you breathe. But it's not just being sick with COVID-19 for a few days or a couple of weeks. It's the, the process of recovery for some patients can, can take weeks or even months to recover from. And so I want folks to take this illness very seriously, um, to take care of not only ourselves and our families, but our communities as well. It's a, it's a very important issue that we're focused on here in the district and making sure that, one, people know and are aware of how serious it is. And it's not until really that you either know someone or know someone in your community and they talk about it openly like we have um, so that people can take it seriously, because there are a lot of precautions we should take. I'm glad you're able to be with us now to, to talk about this. It is such an important yeah. uh, issue. You know, we are uh, speaking uh, during the week that the Republican convention is happening. Right. And I'm sure you saw last night there was a gathering in the Rose Garden. Uh, we heard and saw the First Lady speak there. But I couldn't help but mm -hmm. notice it did not appear as though those chairs were necessarily socially distanced six feet. What did you think when you saw this, having gone through this yourself, what would be, um, you know, your, your message or what were your thoughts when you saw this? And how has this maybe affected your thinking with respect to policy on this issue? Yeah, no, I think it's important. Any event that I personally do as a state lawmaker, or even as a mom or a businesswoman, it's important that we are socially distant, that we stay six feet apart, that we wear masks, that we use hand sanitizer and wash our hands before and after events. That's really important. Um, and I know just from campaigning, it really has changed the way that we do business, the way that we that we also campaign and the way that we interact with our neighbors even. And it is really important for us to socially distance. And just me personally, any event that I have done, we've always made sure that we limit the number of people, we stay six feet apart, and we try to accommodate those guidelines as best as possible. 
Do you think that do, it would be yeah. helpful to... Oh, go ahead. Yes, go ahead, Representative. No, I was just going to say, I just I appreciate the message I am seeing at the convention this week, one of hope and, and of the American dream. We saw Ambassador Nikki Haley and Senator Tim Scott give remarkable speeches, and South Carolina has, has created some of the greatest leaders that our country has seen in a really long time. And I admire everything that they're doing also to bring that message of hope and the American dream and the American spirit to the American people. Uh, that was going to be my next question is, what is it that yeah. you would like to hear from the president, um, you know, also with respect to the coronavirus? Because it has right. been pointed out that, uh, for instance, his economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, talked about this pandemic in the past tense. And you use the word long hauler to describe your recovery, yep. which refers to the fact that it is a tough it is a tough it road is. to recovery, as as, mm -hmm. as you can personally attest to. Um, do you think that in the effort to be optimistic, it may in fact be sending a bit of a mixed message about how serious the virus really is? No, I don't think so at all. I think that we need to offer hope to the American people. I think that this election really is not about anyone particularly running for office. It's not about my Democratic opponent. It's not about Nancy Mace running for Congress. It really should be about the American people and about our future. If you had asked me just a few years ago, I would have never said this, but I do believe it's the election of our lifetime. And as a single working mom, I believe that my kids and my country are worth fighting for. Pre-COVID-19, we had one of the greatest economies in generations. I know in my hometown of Charleston, South Carolina, we had an unemployment rate of 1.86%. If you wanted a job, you had a job. And so these are things that we have to work on together both as Republicans and Democrats, we have to be united and show that front. That's why I'm working really hard to show that I've been bipartisan throughout my tenure as a state lawmaker, because I believe in that message of hope. And I do believe that there are certain economic policies that can provide immediate relief to families and to businesses. Our country, at least South Carolina's first congressional district, our backbone of our economy are small businesses. And there are things that Congress can do right now to provide relief to students, to businesses, and the families everywhere, but because we're so divided and so divisive in this country, literally burning down cities and pulling people out of cars, beating them unconscious, we're not focused and distracted. And we've got to come back together and be one country, the United States of America. And that's what I'm really seeing in the speeches being delivered this week. It's giving all of us hope. Nancy Mace, Representative, I'm glad to have the chance to talk to you. I'm glad you're doing well. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Elaine. Appreciate it. Coming up after the break, Republicans are hoping voters remember how the economy was doing before the pandemic, ahead of Election Day. When we come back, a look at how consumers are feeling about the economy now. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original <laughs> recording. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. 
and yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. An extraordinary moment in America. Can you understand the anger that we see over here? Absolutely. I understand the anger. Do you think there's systemic racism and how should we address it? There's a lot of progress still to be made. What are the questions white Americans should be asking? Questions about racial disparities. The mood of the country now has significantly changed. Do you think when it comes to reforming police in this country and healing race relations in this country, we have reached a tipping point? George Floyd's death has inspired a movement. We are witnessing it right now. I think there's a level of bias in every individual. Is bias training enough? It's a start. We have to talk to people, listen. What do you think history teaches us about this moment we're in? This is a time for us not to rest. Why is it important, do you guys think, to come out? If we just stayed home, nothing would change. What do you hope no one comes from this? This is what's coming from it, and the change is here. Latinos and Latinas on the front lines are in an all-out battle against COVID-19, navigating a crisis. And essential workers are critical to our society, to our very existence. High poverty rates, low wages, lack of access to adequate health care. CBS News will help make sense of the devastating impact COVID-19 is having on America's Latin community and look for answers in a special presentation. We, the people, all the people. Pandemia, Latinos in Crisis, streaming now on CBSN. We're taking a look at voter enthusiasm for Vice President Mike Pence as he gears up to speak on day three of the Republican convention. CBS News Director of Elections and Surveys Anthony Salvanto has the details. Hey, Elaine. So Vice President Pence is speaking tonight. Let's take a look at how Republicans feel about having him on the ticket. The short answer is good. In fact, enthusiastic. Most are. Now, almost all of them like it, but in particular, like we you have... want to look at the groups within the Republican Party who are especially enthusiastic about having Vice President Pence. That is the very conservative, three quarters of whom are enthusiastic, even more so than just the somewhat conservative, and in particular, white evangelicals, even more so than all. You will recall back in 2016 that one of the reasons strategists thought he was put on the ticket was to shore up that Republican base, among whom white evangelicals have been such staunch supporters of the president. So that is clearly still working. In fact, you ask more, more broad-based questions like, are your culture and way of life safer since Donald Trump took office? and 71% of Republicans say, yes, it is. So that's one key thing to look at. The other part, when we talk about looking back, and I'm sure the vice president will talk about the president's accomplishments as he sees them. Since the president took office, Republicans feel the borders are more secure, the U.S. safer from terrorism, and in one of those key points and promises the president made, especially through the upper Midwest, the Rust Belt, Republicans feel that manufacturing jobs have been returning. So putting all that together, I want to take you back again one second to the electoral map, where the president is in tight races both across the Sun Belt and in that upper Midwest. When we talk about the Republican base, shoring that up is at least one step 
towards moving some of these Sunbelt states into his column, North Carolina, for one, which he probably needs to win, Georgia, which he won comfortably last time, which he almost certainly needs to win, maybe in Arizona. And then beyond that, and the question for this convention, can the Republican Party expand beyond that base? Well, that comes in the upper Midwest, where he would have to flip a few more of those states, too. And finally, Elaine, let me show you this, because it's important to note for down-ballot races, congressional, uh, congressional candidates, senatorial candidates, not all of whom who are in tough races will be hearing from at the convention. But what is it that Republican voters a senator or congressional candidate who does what Donald Trump wants or who is independent of Donald Trump, by and large, 69% say that they want somebody who will do what Donald Trump wants, underscoring not just how important that base is, but how it has very much become Donald Trump's Republican Party. Elaine. All right, Anthony Salvanto, thank you. Republicans are promoting President Trump's pre-pandemic economic track record as one of the strongest indicators of his success. During the national convention this week, speakers have repeatedly pointed to the nation's steady economy before the coronavirus hit. They argue Mr. Trump is the man best equipped to get it back on track. However, the latest CBS News Battleground Tracker poll shows Democratic voters are far less optimistic about the state of the economy. While 67% of Republicans say the economy's condition is good, only 35 percent of voters overall feel the same way. For more on this, let's bring in Axios Markets editor Dion Raboen. Dion, thank you very much for being with us. How are we seeing those concerns reflected in consumer confidence? Yeah, uh, in a word, consumer confidence is bad. It's down. Uh, it's near the lowest it's been in more than six years. Uh, in terms of numerous reports, you've got the conference board's report that just came out a couple of days ago. You've got the University of Michigan report that came out a couple of weeks ago, and both show consumer confidence plumbing lows. Uh, even as the stock market has taken off and taken flight, even as the housing market has taken off and taken flight, uh, you're seeing consumer confidence stay low. And, and again, it's at the lowest levels it's been in about six years, since long before President Trump came to the White House. Well, you mentioned this positive outlook by Wall Street. Why this disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street? Yeah, that is the big question right now. Stocks have been booming. Uh, since March 23rd, when the Fed stepped in with its QE Infinity program, um, stocks are up more than 50%. The NASDAQ has reached a number of new all-time highs. It's up about 50% from where it was a year ago. So Wall Street is content to just ride that wave, to buy the dip, uh, and to, you know, play the game as it goes. Whereas households are seeing, um, you know, you're seeing record job losses. You are seeing business closures at a rate that's the highest we've seen since the Great Recession. Um, all these things that affect so-called Main Street are looking really bad, even as the stock market continues to take off and reach these new all-time highs on the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Well, last night we heard uh, White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow characterize what, in his view, is the improving economy. Uh, let's go ahead and listen to a little bit of what he said. Right now, our economic health is coming back with emergency spending and tax cuts. Americans are going back to work. There's a housing boom. There's an auto boom, a manufacturing boom, a consumer spending boom. Uh, Dion, what's your assessment of those statements? It, you know, it's like a lot of things the Trump campaign and Trump himself says. They're all true, technically, but without context. So we are absolutely in a housing boom. Objectively, 2020 has been a great year for the housing market if you take out those lockdown months of, of May and June. Um, and if you look at the, the auto sector absolutely booming. Uh, manufacturing is coming back if you exclude jobs in terms of sentiment surveys. But if you step back and you look at the big picture in terms of where are we 
um, this right now in the month of August or where were we in July versus where we were in January, we're still down. The economy is still significantly in worse shape than it was at the beginning of the year and there, where it was in February and really where it was last year. Uh, GDP this year for the U.S. is not expected to grow to what it was in 2019, as in it's going to be negative this year. And economists expect GDP to be negative next year and potentially even in 2022, as in below where we were in 2019. So this economy is clearly it's moving backwards, but we are growing from that hole, that massive hole that the coronavirus pandemic put us in in March, April and May. Hmm. Well, nationwide unemployment is around 10 percent. What are you expecting, Dion, from this week's unemployment numbers? That's a great question, because on the one side, you've got an economy that is slowing. Job gains have been slowing. Job losses have been accelerating. You're seeing more layoffs than you had um, in the prior months. In May and June, you really just saw um, workers going back to work in huge numbers. That has dissipated and really could be washing out. And you could potentially see a negative print, though that's unlikely just because of the massive number of people who lost their jobs from March through May. Uh, those, a lot of those people are coming back to work. But what we're also seeing is a number of new companies having to lay people off that didn't necessarily have to lay people off before. It's a kind of new wave and what I call the second jobs apocalypse that's happening right now. It's a lot of white collar workers. A lot of these businesses and companies that weren't directly impacted by the coronavirus pandemic didn't have to shut down. They're now seeing that their business models don't work. They're not able to make sales and generate revenue at the pace they would need to stay in business. A lot of them are shedding staff and a lot of them are just shutting their doors. So it's going to be very interesting whether we can maintain forward momentum for August because a lot of the real time data indicators that the New York Federal Reserve tracks that a lot of the banks uh, on Wall Street track have been showing a consistent move in reverse or a stall out into neutral over the past month or so. Finally, Dion, the Congressional Budget Office projects the federal budget deficit could hit a whopping $3.7 trillion this year. What are the potential consequences of another tax cut like the president wants or if Congress approves more funding? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And we are really learning uh, through trial and error and by doing about whether or not all these things that uh, conservative Republicans and folks who cautioned about the budget and the national debt and the national deficit, uh, we're going to see if they were right. And we're also going to get a chance to see if this modern monetary theory, MMT, has any merit. Because if Democrats or Republicans, whoever's in charge in January 2021, wants to keep this economy from falling back into another hole, we're going to have to spend more. Uh, this $3.7 trillion is probably going to grow. It's probably going to be closer to $4 trillion uh, by the end of this year. We're approaching the end of the fiscal year, but Congress still has more spending to do. Uh, Wall Street is expecting another $1 to $1.5 trillion of spending to come from Congress after Labor Day. Uh, and and it really, it's necessary spending because the economy just is not moving because the coronavirus has not been contained. So. Again, whoever's in office in January is going to have to authorize more spending because we're going to need some stimulus to get this economy picked back up. That's probably going to come from tax cuts, additional spending, new programs, things like that. And we're going to see these budget numbers balloon. Uh, the U.S. debt to GDP is at the highest it's ever been, the worst it's ever been. And that number is poised to get worse, not better. And look, um, the Federal Reserve economists that I talk to both on the right and on the left have said this is no time to be worried about the deficit. Uh, S Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin said we're in a war with this virus and we've got to beat it. And that means spending. And so this debt hole that the U.S. is in is only going to get bigger. And we've got to hope that interest rates don't spike the way, you know, the deficit hawks have warned for years. We've got to hope that the country doesn't quote unquote, go bankrupt or, you know, have to turn to any sorts of other forms of funding that people still want to buy U.S. debt. Right now they do. The debt markets are working great. The Fed is keeping interest rates low. 
and there's no reason for panic. But we'll see. We're going to find out just how far we can push uh, the bounds of fiscal policy and spending and debt finance spending here in the next year or so. Just so much uncertainty, but truly we are in an emergency situation. Dion Rabowin, Dion, thanks very much for sharing your insight with us. Thanks so much for having me. Preparations are underway on the Gulf Coast for Hurricane Laura. Officials say damage from the Category 4 storm could be devastating, including storm surges not seen in decades. Mireya Villarreal has the latest. Galveston, Texas is bracing for the worst. People boarding up and bussing out. We're just doing as I said and leaving. Farmers move their cattle to higher ground as Hurricane Laura approaches landfall near the Texas-Louisiana state line. So things changing rapidly here, but what's not changing is the fact that this is going to be a catastrophic life-threatening event. NOAA's satellite view shows the hurricane bursting with lightning as warm winds continue feeding the storm. It's a very healthy storm and what that tells us is there's still actually room for further intensification. Forecasters are warning of winds up to 145 miles per hour and a storm surge as high as 20 feet capable of sinking entire communities. You're going to hear ranges of storm surge that we haven't heard in Louisiana since Hurricane Audrey in 1957. You're going to hear the word unsurvivable. In southern Louisiana, the Duffy family filled sandbags to protect their home from rising water. It's possible that it could go into doors, garages, whatever. So until the pumps catch up, you always have an issue with street flooding. Just three years since the devastation of Hurricane Harvey, Texas is asking citizens to be ready for the worst. We urge everybody who may be in harm's way to take these few last hours to get out of harm's way. More than a half a million people have been ordered to evacuate in the bullseye of Laura's projected path, with meteorologists warning of grave and immediate danger. Mireya Villarreal, CBS News, Beaumont, Texas. The Republican National Convention is now in full swing. We'll speak with the senior advisor to the Trump campaign about what to expect for the rest of the week. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. Donald Trump will never turn his back on those who serve and protect us at home and abroad. You know, it's been a heartbreaking time for the women and men in our law enforcement community. And in this time of great testing for them, let's let them know, here and now, all across this country, we will always stand with those who stand on the thin blue line of law enforcement in America. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original That's reporting. Right. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. 
and yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24 7. You can watch CBSN 24 7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. The National Basketball Association is postponing its three playoff games tonight after the Milwaukee Bucks decided to boycott in protest over the shooting of Jacob Blake. The 29-year-old is now paralyzed after police shot him Sunday in Kenosha, Wisconsin. That's according to the family's attorney. While there were prayers at the RNC last night for Blake, President Trump has not directly mentioned him. He has said he will send in the National Guard to Kenosha. Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers authorized the presence of the state's National Guard yesterday. At least two people were killed in the city last night after the demonstrations turned violent. Steve Cortez joins me now. He is a Trump campaign senior advisor. Welcome, Steve. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we know the president has received a briefing about Jacob Blake's shooting. Does he plan on reaching out to the family? Um, he already did reach out to the family. I don't believe they have yet connected, but he already did. Uh, Mrs. Blake, oh. uh, the mother, spoke about that uh, on the air herself, so that she missed his call, unfortunately. But yes, he is trying to connect with the family. I wonder um, what his message might be uh, specifically about the incident itself. I mean, we heard him, as we mentioned, talk about the fact that, uh, you know, to have National Guard uh, troops there. But what about the shooting itself? What is the message there from the president? Well, the president won't have, in my at least has not so far, and in my estimation will not anytime quickly have a message about the shooting itself because the investigation is unfolding. And of course, it's not the place of the president to insert himself into that uh, investigation, which is being conducted, I hope, very properly by local law enforcement. Uh, but what is his his absolute interest in, Was in uh, Wisconsin right now and in Kenosha and the situation there is protecting public safety. And that's why he said this situation was spiraling out of control in Kenosha. He said that he wanted to send the National Guard. Thankfully, the governor has agreed to that request. And so law and order will be established because no matter what happened between uh, the police uh, and, you know, the videos to me, as somebody who's not in law enforcement, the videos to me are troubling. Uh, but no matter what happened, uh, the, there is no acceptable amount of violence as a response. Uh, we cannot have our anarchy in the streets. We cannot have violence in the streets of any town in America, uh, particularly in the heartland in a place like Kenosha. Uh, yeah, um, I also want to ask you about the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, last night, we heard First Lady Melania Trump uh, address the crisis head on. She expressed her sympathy for the American families uh, who have been so profoundly affected by the virus. I wonder, is that, Steve, something that we'll be hearing from, uh, from the president directly? You know, regarding his acceptance speech, of course, we're not going to reveal yet uh, the text of that speech. But I will tell you that the president, he ha as he has in the past, will continue to, of course, express uh, his solidarity with the American people who have suffered, like people all over the world have, uh, from the Wuhan virus. And, you know, look, I think this is the important point. There's been a lot of economic suffering, a lot of health suffering in this country and all over the world. Uh, none of this is the fault of Donald Trump. None of it is the fault of the Democrats. The only people who are at fault are the Chinese Communist Party, who knowingly deceived the world. They infected the globe and crashed the international economy. They knew they had human-to-human -human transmission, but they chose to deceive us, uh, and they chose to not be transparent and invite in 
international medical authorities when this when this entire crisis could have likely been contained. We can't rewind the clock, unfortunately, and change their dreadful behavior. But what we can do is manage the situation from here forward, both from a health and economic perspective. And thankfully, on both of those fronts, and things are getting demonstrably better yeah. in this country. And I, I wonder um, what the message is to um, those families that are disproportionately affected um, you know, by this virus. We know the African-American community. We know uh, the Hispanic community disproportionately affected by this. What's the message to them? Uh, look, the, the message to all Americans, irrespective of their of their color or ethnic background, uh, is that the federal government, President Trump and the federal administration, uh, have acted swiftly and strongly to provide the kind of backup that is necessary for the virus to the states and localities. And what I mean by that specifically is excess capacity, which thankfully was never needed, but was there if it was needed, if local healthcare systems had become overwhelmed. Again, thankfully that never happened, but the federal government stepped in in a significant way. And then also providing the equipment that is necessary, things like ventilators. Uh, thankfully, again, no one was ever uh, for want of a ventilator in the United States. I think also what's important to point out here, uh, and this in no way diminishes the very real suffering of American citizens from this China virus, but the corporate media in this country is trying very hard to push a narrative that the United States is somehow uniquely suffering or that the United States is doing singularly poorly in relation to handling the virus. And that's just not the case. If we look at the statistics in, uh, in, in real terms, the per capita death rate, for example, the United States is doing far better than many peer industrial nations. We're, we're doing far better than the UK or Belgium, Sweden, Italy, Spain. Um, we're doing about the same as France. So the idea, this, this false narrative which is being pushed, uh, that the US is somehow underperforming uh, is just not the reality. Nonetheless, we know that the suffering was real. We also know that the trends are getting demonstrably better, thank goodness. Um, the, the positivity rates, the hospitalization rates, all of them are trending down dramatically right now. Uh, so we're headed in the right direction in terms of the virus and in a related trend in terms of the economy. I know our time is running short. I do want to ask you, at least a 1,000 guests are expected for the president's acceptance speech tomorrow. Uh, what can you tell us about the campaign's plans to ensure safety amid the COVID-19 pandemic and compliance with, uh, with local regulations and safety precautions? Right. Well, first of all, it's, of course, outside. I will also tell you the South Lawn of the White House is quite massive. Uh, so you can fit a lot of people there with social distancing. Uh, we're going to be safe. We're going to have an incredible celebration of America, uh, but we're going to be doing it outside and we're going to be doing it uh, in, in consistently with safety protocols. All right, Steve Cortez. Thank you very much, Steve, for joining us. Thank you. History was made today after the first statue in Central Park commemorating real women was unveiled. It marks Women's Equality, Equality Day, recognizing the fight for women's suffrage in the U.S. The biggest names in politics. Whoa, that's news. Do you think that the president has the authority to send in active duty troops? Face the questions you want answered. Did the CDC let the American people down? Tell me about the decision. When was it made? Who made it? What is the next area that you are concerned about? What does that mean for the risk of reinfection here in the United States? You bring up a very good point, Margaret. Margaret, that's a great question. Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan on CBS. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original <laughs> reporting. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Kihano, it's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. 
Republicans are trying to reassure American voters, even as multiple crises bear down on the American people. Speakers at the party's national convention have tried making the case that an optimistic and hopeful future is on the horizon, but only if President Trump is given another four years in the White House. First Lady Melania Trump headlined night two of the convention. She said her husband will always tell you where he stands and wants nothing more for the country than to prosper. She also expressed her sympathy to families impacted by the coronavirus, a message largely absent from previous speakers. I want to acknowledge the fact that since March, our lives have changed drastically. The invisible enemy, COVID-19, swept across our beautiful country and impacted all of us. My deepest sympathy goes out to everyone who has lost a loved one. And my prayers are with those who are ill or suffering. Other speakers, including the president's economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, implied the pandemic was already in the past. Then came a once in 100 year pandemic. It was awful. Health and economic impacts were tragic. Hardship and heartbreak were everywhere. But presidential leadership came swiftly and effectively with an extraordinary rescue for health and safety to successfully fight the COVID virus. But in just the last 24 hours, some 1,200 people in the United States have died from the coronavirus. That brings the nationwide death toll to nearly 180,000. More than 5.8 million people in the U.S. have been infected. The economic damage is also far from over. More than 10 million Americans remain out of work. Some experts worry many of those job losses could become permanent. The coronavirus is far from the only issue the country is grappling with right now. At least two people are dead and a third wounded in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Authorities have arrested the alleged attacker, a 17-year-old. Protests are in their third night over the shooting of Jacob Blake Jr. by police. Blake is a 29-year-old black man who police shot several times in front of his three children. Attorneys for his family say he's now paralyzed from the waist down. The president has not yet commented on the shooting itself. He did, however, tweet that he is sending the National Guard to Kenosha, Wisconsin, to protect against, quote, looting, arson, violence, and lawlessness. Parts of the country are also dealing with environmental disasters. Wildfires have burned more than a million acres in Northern California. At least seven people are dead and 200,000 are displaced. 20 million people on the Gulf Coast are also in the path of Hurricane Laura. It's expected to hit as a Category 4 storm as early as tonight. The National Hurricane Center is calling the potential storm surge, quote, unsurvivable. Tonight, we'll see if and how Republicans address these issues. They are turning to Vice President Mike Pence for night three of the convention. Second Lady Karen Pence will also speak. They'll be joined by Senators Marsha Blackburn and Joni Ernst and Counselor to the President Kellyanne Conway, who recently announced she will be leaving her post soon to focus on her family. Let's go ahead and bring in our panel, Ed O'Keefe, Caitlin Huey Burns, and Eugene Scott. Ed is a CBS News political correspondent. Caitlin is a CBSN political reporter. And Eugene is a politics reporter for The Washington Post. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Ed, let me start with you. We know that the president wanted to present a more optimistic view of the country. Are we hearing enough about the problems actually plaguing America right now? Well, if you ask the Biden campaign, they would say no, that there is not a frank and realistic conversation underway about what is going on in this country. As they put it earlier today, the American people cannot afford for Donald Trump to bury his head in the sand any longer, criticizing the fact that the convention has done little to discuss the coronavirus outside of what the first lady said last night and the odd past tense sentence structure of Larry Kudlow, the economic advisor, who seemed to suggest in his remarks that the virus was over and gone. Uh, so you've seen them sort of focus on that idea that perhaps uh, they're not rooted in reality or that Republicans are trying to get the country to think about a sort of pre-January world and what they would do 
to restore that. But, you know, that's similar to what Republicans were saying last week about Democrats, that they weren't talking about the violence in the streets and the rioting that has been underway across the country in response to police shootings of black men, uh, that there hasn't been more of a conversation about the fact that Biden is calling to potentially shut down the country again and upend the economy uh, when Republicans think that the economy is actually in pretty good shape. So it just shows you sort of how the, the messages, the, the different messages are crossing each other and people don't necessarily appear to be listening to each other. And, and both parties are delivering completely different arguments about the state of the country. Uh, Caitlin, uh, on that point, uh, the idea of speaking about the coronavirus pandemic as if it's already behind us, as we heard in that past tense usage by Larry Kudlow, how does that fit into Republicans' overall messaging about the pandemic? And what's the status of any continuing negotiations to help Americans affected by this economic downturn? Well, that past tense referral to the pandemic really fits with the messaging coming from Republicans this week, which has largely been, remember how things were before the pandemic hit, kind of taking a passive approach to the pandemic and trying to remind voters that the economy uh, and everything, in their view, was going pretty well. In polling, we do see that Donald Trump does get positive grades on the economy, but we also see that he gets negative grades on his handling of the coronavirus pandemic. Pandemic, and that is helping to fuel Joe Biden's support in a lot of these battleground state polls. But it raises an interesting question about why not address what people are feeling right now with the pandemic. Those poll numbers suggest that voters are willing to give the president a little bit of a benefit of the doubt on the economy, kind of acknowledging that, sure, presidents, of course, don't create pandemics, but the response to it is something that is certainly within the purview of the president. And this is something that the campaign, that Republicans don't want to talk about because they're not getting uh, good grades on it. And it is still ongoing, of course, as you mentioned, 1,200 deaths just yesterday still. But this is an attempt by Republicans to try to portray a scenario or what they view as a scenario in which things were going okay before all of this happened. But I do think voters are going to ask, okay, but it happened. What are we going to do about it? Um, Eugene, I want to ask you about uh, some of the criticism of Joe Biden that we heard last night with respect to race. We heard, for instance, the Kentucky Attorney General uh, criticize Joe Biden's comment, uh, which seemed to suggest that the black vote was something that Democrats, they say, uh, have taken for granted. How is it that Republicans at the convention so far have framed these issues of race with respect to uh, what they say the Democratic Party is trying to do? It's been very similar to the Republican approach to race uh, in years past. The main argument from the GOP to black voters is if you give us a chance, we will show you what we can do. Uh, that hasn't been effective. As you know, uh, the Democratic candidates have won the black vote uh, consistently since 1965. Uh, and that's for various reasons. But this year, it's for one reason more than anything else. And that's because most black Americans, according to polling, actually believe that Donald Trump is a racist. And that's not just based on his policies, but based on his comments and his tweets and other actions. And so what we have seen at the Republican National Convention is uh, many black individuals, such as the Kentucky Attorney General, trying to make a case uh, for the Trump administration, arguing that it is the best uh, vote for people of color moving forward if they want to see more solutions presented for uh, all of the racial unrest and other issues uh, related to systemic di uh, discrimination. And Eugene, are some of those appeals directed not just at black voters, but at perhaps uh, moderate white voters who may be uncomfortable with some of the rhetoric that they have heard from the president himself? Absolutely. We've seen from many white voters who support Trump that they actually are quite uncomfortable with how the president handles race issues. Specifically, we saw the president attacking protesters this past summer, uh, despite the fact that Black Lives Matter as an idea is actually popular with the majority of Americans. And so they certainly want to see a president uh, who is backing away from uh, such divisive rhetoric. And even if we haven't seen the president do that exactly, seeing individuals like Tim Scott and Nikki Haley come out and say that they believe actually that uh, this president is more sensitive to issues concerning people of color soothes a lot of the concerns that we're seeing many of these white suburban college educated voters uh, who were previously on the Trump train and thinking about getting off actually stay on. 
Mm. Um, Caitlin, I want to ask you about some of what we saw with respect to the choreography of how the convention unfolded last night. We saw, for instance, the president in multiple segments surrounded by the trappings of the office of the presidency as part of this political convention, uh, which you know has raised a number of questions about potential violations of the Hatch Act, not necessarily the president himself, but those employees, including the uh, acting Homeland Security. Uh, a director at that naturalization ceremony. But how did last night fit into a broader pattern of how the president approaches typical political norms? Is that having an impact on voters at all? Well, the president's approach to typical political norms is to completely shatter them. And I think it's important to talk about the legal parameters of this and the political parameters of this. Um, the, the White House was in clear violation of the Hatch Act, uh, not only with the presentation at the White House, and we'll see the president again speaking to a, a crowd and when he accepts the nomination formally at the White House tomorrow, but also appearances by the DHS secretary and, of course, the secretary of state while on a foreign trip in Jerusalem. Um, so that is a clear violation. The, the president, however, and the White House have indicated time and time again that they don't really care about these violations. And they think, according to Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, who gave an interview to Politico today and said that he thinks that voters outside the Beltway don't care about these things. The thing is, however, that this is a president that is waging a law and order reelection campaign. And that law and order campaign really comes with an asterisk in a lot of cases, uh, because this is kind of signaling to people, um, or should signal to people, that um, th there are certain rules uh, that, that he follows and certain rules that he does not follow. Um, so it definitely sends that message. Whether or not people uh, care about the details, this is important to note what it is doing. And Republicans feel like voters are just not going to care, and they like the pomp and circumstance that the White House provides as a setting and also shows the president in the job. Well, Ed, you know, back in 2016, we all recall there were these urgent warnings about caravans of migrants moving towards the southern U.S. border, uh, warnings from Republicans, including Donald Trump. Now, four years later, we saw in that Republican convention uh, last night that naturalization ceremony. What does the Trump administration's actual record look like when it comes to both legal and illegal immigration? They've been trying to restrict both, Elaine, and, you know, that's to the... Uh, enjoyment and the, and the glee of a lot of uh, the president's diehard supporters and those that are uh, very much opposed to allowing more immigrants into the country, and as much to the consternation of some fellow Republicans who are concerned that even legal immigration has been restricted or, or that the president at least is trying to push for it. Uh, and so, you know, it, it is a signature issue for him. He is able to say that, yes, a few hundred more miles of wall uh, have been built. Of course, they're not being paid for by Mexico. Um, and, and I think last night was designed to sort of not only reinforce that he was celebrating legal immigration, uh, but that, uh, you know, also trying to suggest that by even holding that ceremony and holding it in the White House and holding it with the five new American citizens that were there, that he is somehow at least trying to be perceived as compassionate, understanding, and welcoming of immigrants. But make no mistake, his administration has, on this issue especially, tried to really tear up what was there before and change it entirely. Uh, and, you know, what we saw in that event, uh, or that part of the event last night, plus several of the speeches we've seen Monday and Tuesday, is really, again, all designed to try to recast the president as somebody who is far more understanding uh, and welcoming and you know, accepting of, of, of minorities, of immigrants, something that he's been criticized on, something that the polling shows is part of the reason why he's struggling to hold on to the support that he enjoyed four years ago. Whether this will work or whether voters are going to see right through it, you know, remains to be seen. And we may not know that now for several days or weeks. Um, Eugene, we also saw Republicans put religion very much at the forefront yesterday. There was that primetime speech by an anti-abortion activist. We saw Secretary of State Mike Pompeo making the case uh, for the president from Jerusalem. What was behind some of the messages that we heard last night? Well, what we do know is that one of the reasons that 
uh, President Trump was so successful in 2016, it's because he had the support of white evangelical voters. Uh, but that's actually one of the demographics where the president is losing some support with. He's still certainly winning overwhelmingly uh, conservative Christians, but not at the same rates that he was in 2016. And that's in part because Joe Biden is actually known for his deep religious values. Uh, we know he's a Catholic and he makes so many decisions in policy world, in the policy world and in his personal life based on his Catholic faith. Also, people are very concerned. People of faith are very concerned that the president's uh, actions and his comments do not reflect someone who has deeply held convictions. And so they're looking elsewhere. As a result, we have seen people who believe that uh, President Trump is the best option for conservative Christians, and specifically white evangelicals, try to make the case uh, that his ideas, that his values, that his worldview uh, would actually benefit and align most with white evangelicals. And we're, we're likely going to see more of that being made uh, clear tonight and probably even tomorrow as well. All right. We'll close it out with you, Ed. Uh, so we're going to hear from Vice President Mike Pence tonight. What's his pitch to the electorate? Well, we're told it will be optimistic. It will focus especially on attacking or raising questions about Vice President Biden's stance on the economy and on foreign policy. He's also expected to talk about the success that he believes the Trump administration has had in dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. Remember, he's been directly involved in the day-to-day -day oversight of the government's response to that. He'll speak at Fort McHenry just outside Baltimore, another example of this convention being moved from private facilities to government-run facilities. And he will be joined by a modest crowd there who will watch him speak. Um, and, you know, it comes at a time, in fact, just as we were coming on the air, we released new CBS News polling that looks at Vice President Pence and his standing among Republicans. 56% of Republican voters enthusiastic about having him uh, speak this week and having him on the ticket. No surprise that his support is strongest among the most conservative and church-going of Republicans. That is part of the reason why Donald Trump picked him four years ago, part of the reason why he was able to help shore up support for the president four years ago, and part of why we're seeing him run that playbook yet again. He has gone in recent weeks to several different battleground states to focus on small events where he talks about the concerns that the Biden administration, if it were elected, would roll back various freedoms, would uh, potentially affect the economy. And he reminds voters, as he did four years ago, that a Trump administration means conservative judges, means a conservative majority is maintained on the, on the Supreme Court, and could be at risk if Democrats win the White House and the Senate this fall. All right, Ed O'Keefe, Caitlin Huey Burns, and Eugene Scott, thank you all very much. Coming up after the break, we'll be joined by a Republican candidate in what some are calling the most competitive congressional district in the U.S. Why all eyes are on this South Carolina contest. Stay with us, you're streaming Red and Blue. So, I've got a question for you. What if you could watch all the CCO news you want and see all your favorite CCOers anytime, anywhere? Well, you can. Go ahead and grab your phone. Come on, I know it's close by. And go to WCCO.com or get the app and poof, there we are, right next to all those other networks you stream. Bonus time, it's free. You heard right, zip not a zilch, free. CBSN Minnesota, built by CBS News, powered locally by WCCO. Wherever you are, wherever you go, breaking Bay Area news live. This is CBSN Bay Area. I'm Michelle Griego. CBSN Bay Area. In your hand, on demand, and absolutely free. Highly updated top local stories and weather where you live. Available everywhere. Powered by KPIX 5 News. CBSN Bay Area. Always on, always free at KPIX.com. We spoke to black officers all around the country about the challenges that they face. When you're not in uniform, are you ever concerned for your safety? Out of uniform, I'm, I'm just another guy. I'm a black man first. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices.
Women are running for Congress in record numbers this year. That's in part because of a surge in Republican women candidates. According to the Center for American Women and Politics at Rutgers University, more than 300 women are in the running for a House seat this November. 211 are Democrats and 96 are Republicans. Both are all-time highs. One of them is Nancy Mace. She's the first woman to graduate from the Corps of Cadets at the Citadel, the military College of South Carolina. She's also a representative in the South Carolina State House. She's seeking to unseat Democratic Congressman Joe Cunningham. He won South Carolina's first congressional district by 4,000 votes in 2018. The victory was the first for a Democrat in the district since 1978. Experts saw Cunningham's win as a major upset. President Trump outpaced Hillary Clinton in the district by 13 points during the 2016 election. And Nancy Mace joins me now. She's the Republican candidate in South Carolina's first congressional district. Representative Mace, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Elaine, for having me on today. I really appreciate you highlighting this race. It's one of the top races in the country. Yes. Um, so I, I mentioned the president's margin of victory in that district in 2016. Why do you believe a Democrat was able to flip a Republican stronghold in the midterms? Well, certainly in the midterms in South Carolina's first congressional district, and we had a lot of Republicans that voted for the president that simply didn't turn out because he wasn't on the ballot. And I do believe that this year being a presidential year, we're going to have record turnout by Republicans. We just saw in the Republican primary that I won by 31 points in a four-person primary. Uh, we had record turnout for that. And I believe those are the kind of numbers that we're going to be seeing in November. And I'm running against the person who voted to impeach the president, who won this district by 13 points, voted to impeach him not once, but twice. And he's voted with Nancy Pelosi almost 90 percent of the time since he's been in office. He's been very partisan. And I offer to bring a new independent voice to the district. Well, as you know, there is a lot of outside money in this race. How do you plan right. to appeal to voters who went for Joe Cunningham? Um, well, certainly I, I am raising money as hard as I can. Um, this, is a, this is a big race, and there's going to be millions of dollars spent on both sides of the aisle in this thing. But the difference between Congressman Cunningham and I is that I grew up here. I'm from here. I have broken barriers all my life, including when I graduated from the Citadel 21 years ago. I'm a businesswoman and a state lawmaker. And although I'm Republican, I have a very fiscally conservative record as a state lawmaker. I also have a strong history of reaching across the aisle and working with Democrats on issues that are important to everybody in South Carolina's first congressional district. And for example, just a few months ago, um, our governor signed my prison reform bill into law. And so Democrats talk a lot about these issues, but they don't actually do anything about it. And I've been in the district. I grew up here. I know the issues. And I've been working on them in my work as a state lawmaker over the last three years. So the argument isn't that tough. I just have to get the word out. And if people are tired of buying what Nancy Pelosi is selling, then they should send a new Nancy to Congress. And my website is nancymace.org. All right. Get that plug in there. Um, I want to ask you, a Representative, about Always. women voters. In our CBS News poll done before the convention, Joe Biden closed the gap to just six points among white women. Black women are, are siding with Democrats by a 93 to 4 margin. Right. Is the Republican Party, you think, doing enough to appeal to women? Certainly. I mean, we have a record number of Republican women that are running for Congress this year. So many moms, single moms like myself, we have raised our hand and said enough is enough. Our kids and our country are worth fighting for. And that's why I'm running for this seat, too. And it's really important for all of us, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, to set example for our children, for our communities. And there are record numbers of women on both sides running for office. And I think it's quite remarkable. Um, but I'm running to win, and I'm really excited about this race. As a businesswoman, um, I've been breaking barriers also all my life. And South Carolina has never elected a Republican woman to Congress. And I plan to make that difference this year in November. I know, Representative, you recently talked publicly about the fact that you're recovering from the coronavirus. How are you doing now? Um, well, I would uh, describe my recovery as, uh, as some of us have been reading about this in, in the last couple of weeks as a long hauler. I will tell you, COVID-19 is a serious illness, and I was very sick. 
And even at one point, I struggled to catch my breath. And my oldest, my son, who's an eighth grader this year, turned to me and he said, Mommy, you sound like Darth Vader when you breathe. But it's not just being sick with COVID-19 for a few days or a couple of weeks. It's the, the process of recovery for some patients can, can take weeks or even months to recover from. And so I want folks to take this illness very seriously, um, to take care of not only ourselves and our families, but our communities as well. It's a, it's a very important issue that we're focused on here in the district and making sure that, one, people know and are aware of how serious it is. And it's not until really that you either know someone or know someone in your community and they talk about it openly like we have um, so that people can take it seriously because there are a lot of precautions we should take. I'm glad you're able to be with us now to, to talk about this. It is such an important yeah. uh, issue. You know, we are uh, speaking uh, during the week that the Republican convention is happening. Right. And I'm sure you saw last night there was a gathering in the Rose Garden. Uh, we heard and saw the First Lady speak there. But I couldn't help but mm -hmm. notice it did not appear as though those chairs were necessarily socially distanced six feet. What did you think when you saw this, having gone through this yourself? What would be, um, you know, your, your message or what were your thoughts when you saw this? And how has this maybe affected your thinking with respect to policy on this issue? Yeah, no, I think it's important. Any event that I personally do as a state lawmaker, or even as a mom or a businesswoman, it's important that we are socially distant, that we stay six feet apart, that we wear masks, that we use hand sanitizer and wash our hands before and after events. That's really important. Um, and I know just from campaigning, it really has changed the way that we do business, the way that we that we also campaign and the way that we interact with our neighbors even. And it is really important for us to socially distance. And just me personally, any event that I have done, we've always made sure that we limit the number of people, we stay six feet apart, and we try to accommodate those guidelines as best as possible. Do you think but that do, it would be yes. helpful to... Oh, go ahead. Yes, go ahead, Representative. No, I was just going to say, I just I appreciate the message I am seeing at the convention this week, one of hope and and of the American dream. We saw Ambassador Nikki Haley and Senator Tim Scott give remarkable speeches in South Carolina has, has created some of the greatest leaders that our country has seen in a really long time. And I admire everything that they're doing also to bring that message of hope and the American dream and the American spirit to the American people. Uh, that was going to be my next question is, what is it that yeah. you would like to hear from the president, um, you know, also with respect to the coronavirus? Because it has right. been pointed out that, uh, for instance, his economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, talked about this pandemic in the past tense. And you use the word long hauler to describe your recovery, yep. which refers to the fact that it is a tough it is a tough it road is. to recovery, as as, mm -hmm. as you can personally attest to. Um, do you think that in the effort to be optimistic, it may in fact be sending a bit of a mixed message about how serious the virus really is? No, I don't think so at all. I think that we need to offer hope to the American people. I think that this election really is not about anyone particularly running for office. It's not about my Democratic opponent. It's not about Nancy Mace running for Congress. It really should be about the American people and about our future. If you had asked me just a few years ago, I would have never said this, but I do believe it's the election of our lifetime. And as a single working mom, I believe that my kids and my country are worth fighting for. Free COVID-19, we had one of the greatest economies in generations. I know in my hometown of Charleston, South Carolina, we had an unemployment rate of 1.86%. If you wanted a job, you had a job. And so these are things that we have to work on together both as Republicans and Democrats, we have to be united and show that front. That's why I'm working really hard to show that I've been bipartisan throughout my tenure as a state lawmaker, because I believe in that message of hope. And I do believe that there are certain economic policies that can provide immediate relief to families and to businesses. Our country, at least South Carolina's first congressional district, our backbone of our economy are small businesses. And there are things that Congress can do right now to provide relief to students, to businesses, and the families everywhere, but because we're so divided and so divisive in this country, literally burning down cities and pulling people out of cars, beating them unconscious, we're not focused, we're distracted, and we've got to come back together and be one country, the United States of America. And that's what I'm really seeing in the speeches being delivered this week. It's giving all of us hope. Nancy Mace, Representative, I'm glad to have the chance to talk to you. I'm glad you're doing well. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Elaine. Appreciate it. 
Coming up after the break, Republicans are hoping voters remember how the economy was doing before the pandemic, ahead of Election Day. When we come back, a look at how consumers are feeling about the economy now. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. So, I've got a question for you. What if you could watch all the CCO news you want and see all your favorite CCOers anytime, anywhere? Well, you can. Go ahead and grab your phone. Come on, I know it's close by. And go to WCCO.com or get the app and poof, there we are, right next to all those other networks you stream. Bonus time, it's free. You heard right, zip not a zilch, for free. CBSN Minnesota, built by CBS News, powered locally by WCCO. Wherever you are, wherever you go, breaking Bay Area news live. This is CBSN Bay Area. I'm Michelle Griego. CBSN Bay Area. In your hand, on demand, and absolutely free. Highly updated top local stories and weather where you live. Available everywhere. Powered by KPIX 5 News. CBSN Bay Area. Always on, always free at KPIX.com. We spoke to black officers all around the country about the challenges that they face. When you're not in uniform, are you ever concerned for your safety? Out of uniform, I'm, I'm just another guy. I'm a black man first. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. We're taking a look at voter enthusiasm for Vice President Mike Pence as he gears up to speak on day three of the Republican convention. CBS News Director of Elections and Surveys Anthony Salvanto has the details. Hey, Elaine. So Vice President Pence is speaking tonight. Let's take a look at how Republicans feel about having him on the ticket. The short answer is good. In fact, enthusiastic. Most are. Now, almost all of them like it, but in particular, like we you want to look at the groups within the Republican Party who are especially enthusiastic about having Vice President Pence. That is the very conservative, three quarters of whom are enthusiastic, even more so than just the somewhat conservative, and in particular, white evangelicals, even more so than all. You will recall back in 2016 that one of the reasons strategists thought he was put on the ticket was to shore up that Republican base, among whom white evangelicals have been such staunch supporters of the president. So that is clearly still working. In fact, you ask more, more broad-based questions like, are your culture and way of life safer since Donald Trump took office? and 71% of Republicans say, yes, it is. So that's one key thing to look at. The other part, when we talk about looking back, and I'm sure the vice president will talk about the president's accomplishments as he sees them. Since the president took office, Republicans feel the borders are more secure, the U.S. safer from terrorism, and in one of those key points and promises the president made, especially through the upper Midwest, the Rust Belt, Republicans feel that manufacturing jobs have been returning. So putting all that together, I want to take you back again one second to the electoral map, where the president is in tight races both across the Sun Belt and in that upper Midwest. When we talk about the Republican base, shoring that up is at least one step towards moving some of these Sun Belt states into his column, North Carolina, for one, which he probably needs to win, Georgia, which he won comfortably last time, which he almost certainly needs to win, maybe in Arizona. And then beyond that, and the question for this convention, can the Republican Party expand beyond that base? Well, that comes in the upper Midwest, where he would have to flip a few more of those states, too. And finally, Elaine, let me show you this, because it's important to note for down-ballot races, congressional, uh, congressional candidates, senatorial candidates, not all of whom who are in tough races will be hearing from at the convention. But what is it that Republican voters a senator or congressional candidate who does what Donald Trump wants or who is independent 
of Donald Trump, by and large, 69% say that they want somebody who will do what Donald Trump wants, underscoring not just how important that base is, but how it has very much become Donald Trump's Republican Party. Elaine. All right, Anthony Salvanto, thank you. Republicans are promoting President Trump's pre-pandemic economic track record as one of the strongest indicators of his success. During the national convention this week, speakers have repeatedly pointed to the nation's steady economy before the coronavirus hit. They argue Mr. Trump is the man best equipped to get it back on track. However, the latest CBS News Battleground Tracker poll shows Democratic voters are far less optimistic about the state of the economy, while 67% of Republicans say the economy's condition is good, only 35 percent of voters overall feel the same way. For more on this, let's bring in Axios Markets editor Dion Raboen. Dion, thank you very much for being with us. How are we seeing those concerns reflected in consumer confidence? Yeah, uh, in a word, consumer confidence is bad. It's down. Uh, it's near the lowest it's been in more than six years. Uh, in terms of numerous reports, you've got the conference board's report that just came out a couple days ago. You've got the University of Michigan report that came out a couple weeks ago, and both show consumer confidence plumbing lows. Uh, even as the stock market has taken off and taken flight, even as the housing market has taken off and taken flight, uh, you're seeing consumer confidence stay low. And, and again, it's at the lowest levels it's been in about six years, since long before President Trump came to the White House. Well, you mentioned this positive outlook by Wall Street. Why this disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street? Yeah, that is the big question right now. Stocks have been booming. Uh, since March 23rd, when the Fed stepped in with its QE Infinity program, um, stocks are up more than 50%. The NASDAQ has reached a number of new all-time highs. It's up about 50% from where it was a year ago. So Wall Street is content to just ride that wave, to buy the dip, uh, and to, you know, play the game as it goes. Whereas households are seeing, um, you know, you're seeing record job losses. You are seeing business closures at a rate that's the highest we've seen since the Great Recession. Um, all these things that affect so-called Main Street are looking really bad, even as the stock market continues to take off and reach these new all-time highs on the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Well, last night we heard uh, White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow characterize what, in his view, is the improving economy. Uh, let's go ahead and listen to a little bit of what he said. Right now, our economic health is coming back with emergency spending and tax cuts. Americans are going back to work. There's a housing boom. There's an auto boom, a manufacturing boom, a consumer spending boom. Uh, Dion, what's your assessment of those statements? You know, it's like a lot of things the Trump campaign and Trump himself says. They're all true, technically, but without context. So we are absolutely in a housing boom. Objectively, 2020 has been a great year for the housing market if you take out those lockdown months of, of May and June. Um, and if you look at the, the auto sector absolutely booming. Uh, manufacturing is coming back if you exclude jobs in terms of sentiment surveys. But if you step back and you look at the big picture in terms of where are we um, this right now in the month of August or where were we in July versus where we were in January, we're still down. The economy is still significantly in worse shape than it was at the beginning of the year and there, where it was in February and really where it was last year. Uh, GDP this year for the U.S. is not expected to grow to what it was in 2019, as in it's going to be negative this year. And economists expect GDP to be negative next year and potentially even in 2022, as in below where we were in 2019. So this economy is clearly it's moving backwards, but we are growing from that hole, that massive hole that the coronavirus pandemic put us in in March, April and May. Well, nationwide unemployment is around 10 percent. What are you expecting, Dion, from this week's unemployment numbers? 
That's a great question because on the one side, you've got an economy that is slowing. Job gains have been slowing. Job losses have been accelerating. You're seeing more layoffs than you had um, in the prior months. In May and June, you really just saw um, workers going back to work in huge numbers. That has dissipated and really could be washing out. And you could potentially see a negative print, though that's unlikely just because of the massive number of people who lost their jobs from March through May. Uh, those, a lot of those people are coming back to work. But what we're also seeing is a number of new companies having to lay people off that didn't necessarily have to lay people off before. It's a kind of new wave and what I call the second jobs apocalypse that's happening right now. It's a lot of white collar workers. A lot of these businesses and companies that weren't directly impacted by the coronavirus pandemic didn't have to shut down. They're now seeing that their business models don't work. They're not able to make sales and generate revenue at the pace they would need to stay in business. A lot of them are shedding staff and a lot of them are just shutting their doors. So it's going to be very interesting whether we can maintain forward momentum for August because a lot of the real time data indicators that the New York Federal Reserve tracks, that a lot of the banks uh, on Wall Street track have been showing consistent move in reverse or a stall out into neutral over the past month or so. Hmm. Finally, Dion, the Congressional Budget Office projects the federal budget deficit could hit a whopping $3.7 trillion this year. What are the potential consequences of another tax cut like the president wants or if Congress approves more funding? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And we are really learning uh, through trial and error and by doing about whether or not all these things that uh, conservative Republicans and folks who cautioned about the budget and the national debt and the national deficit, uh, we're going to see if they were right. And we're also going to get a chance to see if this modern monetary theory, MMT, has any merit. Because if Democrats or Republicans, whoever's in charge in January 2021, wants to keep this economy from falling back into another hole, we're going to have to spend more. Uh, this $3.7 trillion is probably going to grow. It's probably going to be closer to $4 trillion uh, by the end of this year. We're approaching the end of the fiscal year, but Congress still has more spending to do. Uh, Wall Street is expecting another $1 to $1.5 trillion of spending to come from Congress after Labor Day. Uh, and and it really, it's necessary spending because the economy just is not moving because the coronavirus has not been contained. So... Again, whoever's in office in January is going to have to authorize more spending because we're going to need some stimulus to get this economy picked back up. That's probably going to come from tax cuts, additional spending, new programs, things like that. And we're going to see these budget numbers balloon. Uh, the U.S. debt to GDP is at the highest it's ever been, the worst it's ever been. And that number is poised to get worse, not better. And look, um, the Federal Reserve economists that I talked to both on the right and on the left have said this is no time to be worried about the deficit. Uh, S Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin said we're in a war with this virus and we've got to beat it. And that means spending. And so this debt hole that the U.S. is in is only going to get bigger. And we've got to hope that interest rates don't spike the way, you know, the deficit hawks have warned for years. We've got to hope that the country doesn't, quote unquote, go bankrupt or, you know, have to turn to any sorts of other forms of funding that people still want to buy U.S. debt. Right now they do. The debt markets are working great. The Fed is keeping interest rates low and there's no reason for panic. But we'll see. We're going to find out just how far we can push uh, the bounds of fiscal policy and spending and debt finance spending here in the next year or so. Just so much uncertainty, but truly we are in an emergency situation. Dion Rabowen, Dion, thanks very much for sharing your insight with us. Thanks so much for having me. The Republican National Convention is now in full swing. We'll speak with the senior advisor to the Trump campaign about what to expect for the rest of the week. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. Donald Trump will never turn his back on those who serve and protect us at home and abroad. You know, it's been a heartbreaking time for the women and men in our law enforcement community. 
in this time of great testing for them. Let's let them know, here and now, all across this country, we will always stand with those who stand on the thin blue line of law enforcement in America. a day of raw emotion as this city and the country mourned a man whose death has inspired a movement. Do you believe there is systemic racism in law enforcement? So, I've got a question for you. What if you could watch all the CCO news you want and see all your favorite CCOers anytime, anywhere? Well, you can. Go ahead and grab your phone. Come on, I know it's close by. And go to WCCO.com or get the app and poof, there we are, right next to all those other networks you stream. Bonus time, it's free. You heard right, zip not a zilch, free. CBSN Minnesota, built by CBS News, powered locally by WCCO. Wherever you are, wherever you go, breaking Bay Area news, live. This is CBSN Bay Area. I'm Michelle Griego. CBSN Bay Area. In your hand, on demand, and absolutely free. Highly updated top local stories and weather where you live. Available everywhere. Powered by KPIX 5 News. CBSN Bay Area. Always on, always free at KPIX.com. We spoke to black officers all around the country about the challenges that they face. When you're not in uniform, are you ever concerned for your safety? Out of uniform, I'm, I'm just another guy. I'm a black man first. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. The National Basketball Association is postponing its three playoff games tonight after the Milwaukee Bucks decided to boycott in protest over the shooting of Jacob Blake. The 29-year-old is now paralyzed after police shot him Sunday in Kenosha, Wisconsin. That's according to the family's attorney. While there were prayers at the RNC last night for Blake, President Trump has not directly mentioned him. He has said he will send in the National Guard to Kenosha. Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers authorized the presence of the state's National Guard yesterday. At least two people were killed in the city last night after the demonstrations turned violent. Steve Cortez joins me now. He is a Trump campaign senior advisor. Welcome, Steve. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we know the president has received a briefing about Jacob Blake's shooting. Does he plan on reaching out to the family? Um, he already did reach out to the family. I don't believe they have yet connected, but he already did. Uh, Mrs. Blake, oh. uh, the mother spoke about that uh, on the air herself, so that she missed his call, unfortunately. But yes, he is trying to connect with the family. I wonder um, what his message might be uh, specifically about the incident itself. I mean, we heard him, as we mentioned, talk about the fact that, uh, you know, to have National Guard uh, troops there. But what about the shooting itself? What is the message there from the president? Well, the president won't have, in my at least has not so far, and in my estimation will not anytime quickly have a message about the shooting itself because the investigation is unfolding. And of course, it's not the place of the president to insert himself into that uh, investigation, which is being conducted, I hope, very properly by local law enforcement. Uh, but what is his his absolute interest in uh, Wisconsin right now and in Kenosha and the situation there is protecting public safety. And that's why he said this situation was spiraling out of control in Kenosha. He said that he wanted to send the National Guard. Thankfully, the governor has agreed to that request. And so law and order will be established because no matter what happened between uh, the police uh, and, you know, the videos to me, as somebody who's not in law enforcement, the videos to me are troubling. Uh, but no matter what happened, uh, the, there is no acceptable amount of violence as a response. Uh, we cannot have our anarchy in the streets. We cannot have violence in the streets of any town in America, uh, particularly in the heartland in a place like Kenosha. 
Uh, um, I also want to ask you about the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, last night, we heard First Lady Melania Trump uh, address the crisis head on. She expressed her sympathy for the American families uh, who have been so profoundly affected by the virus. I wonder, is that, Steve, something that we'll be hearing from, uh, from the president directly? You know, regarding his acceptance speech, of course, we're not going to reveal yet uh, the text of that speech. But I will tell you that the president, he ha as he has in the past, will continue to, of course, express uh, his solidarity with the American people who have suffered, like people all over the world have, uh, from the Wuhan virus. And, you know, look, I think this is the important point. There's been a lot of economic suffering, a lot of health suffering in this country and all over the world. Uh, none of this is the fault of Donald Trump. None of it is the fault of the Democrats. The only people who are at fault are the Chinese Communist Party, who knowingly deceived the world. They infected the globe and crashed the international economy. They knew they had human to human transmission, but they chose to deceive us. Uh, and they chose to not be transparent and invite in international medical authorities when this, when this entire crisis could have likely been contained. We can't rewind the clock, unfortunately, and change their dreadful behavior. But what we can do is manage the situation from here forward, both from a health and economic perspective. And thankfully, on both of those fronts, and things are getting demonstrably better yeah. in this country. And I, I wonder um, what the message is to um, those families that are disproportionately affected um, you know, by this virus. We know the African-American community. We know uh, the Hispanic community disproportionately affected by this. What's the message to them? Uh, look, the, the message to all Americans, irrespective of their of their color or ethnic background, uh, is that the federal government, President Trump and the federal administration uh, have acted swiftly and strongly to provide the kind of backup that is necessary for the virus to the states and localities. And what I mean by that specifically is excess capacity, which thankfully was never needed, but was there if it was needed, if local healthcare systems had become overwhelmed. Again, thankfully that never happened, but the federal government stepped in in a significant way. And then also providing the equipment that is necessary, things like ventilators. Uh, thankfully, again, no one was ever uh, for want of a ventilator in the United States. I think also what's important to point out here, uh, and this in no way diminishes the very real suffering of American citizens from this China virus, but the corporate media in this country is trying very hard to push a narrative that the United States is somehow uniquely suffering or that the United States is doing singularly poorly in relation to handling the virus. And that's just not the case. If we look at the statistics in, uh, in, in real terms, the per capita death rate, for example, the United States is doing far better than many peer industrial nations. We're, we're doing far better than the UK or Belgium, Sweden, Italy, Spain. Um, we're doing about the same as France. So the idea, this, this false narrative which is being pushed, uh, that the US is somehow underperforming uh, is just not the reality. Nonetheless, we know that the suffering was real. We also know that the trends are getting demonstrably better, thank goodness. Um, the, the positivity rates, the hospitalization rates, all of them are trending down dramatically right now. Uh, so we're headed in the right direction in terms of the virus and in a related trend in terms of the economy. I know our time is running short. I do want to ask you, at least a 1,000 guests are expected for the president's acceptance speech tomorrow. Uh, what can you tell us about the campaign's plans to ensure safety amid the COVID-19 pandemic and compliance with, uh, with local regulations and safety precautions? Right. Well, first of all, it's, of course, outside. I will also tell you the South Lawn of the White House is quite massive. Uh, so you can fit a lot of people there with social distancing. Uh, we're going to be safe. We're going to have an incredible celebration of America, uh, but we're going to be doing it outside and we're going to be doing it uh, in, in consistently with safety protocols. All right, Steve Cortez. Thank you very much, Steve, for joining us. Thank you. That does it for Red and Blue today. At 7 p.m. Eastern, we'll have a look at the rest of the day's headlines. And at 8 p.m., we'll look ahead to tonight's RNC speakers and bring them to you live with analysis when they begin. And when tonight's speeches come to an end, we'll be here to break it all down. We'll be right back. You're streaming CBSN. So, I've got a question for you. What if you could watch all the CCO news you want and see all your favorite CCOers anytime, anywhere? Well, you can. Go ahead and grab your phone. Come on, I know it's close by. And go to WCCO.com or get the app and poof, 
there we are, right next to all those other networks you stream. Bonus time, it's free. You heard right, zip not a zilch, for re. CBSN Minnesota, built by CBS News, powered locally by WCCO. Wherever you are, wherever you go, breaking Bay Area news, live. This is CBSN Bay Area, I'm Michelle Griego. CBSN Bay Area, in your hand, on demand, and absolutely free. Highly updated top local stories and weather where you live. Available everywhere. Powered by KPIX5 News. CBSN Bay Area. Always on, always free at KPIX.com. We spoke to black officers all around the country about the challenges that they face. When you're not in uniform, are you ever concerned for your safety? Out of uniform, I'm, I'm just another guy. I'm a black man first. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7, anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. everyone, I'm Elaine Quijano. It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. Night three of the Republican National Convention is set to begin later tonight. As President Trump and his party continue to make their case for re-election, they are also facing a series of crises impacting the nation. Hurricane Laura is about to hit the Gulf Coast. It's expected to make landfall as a Category 4 storm. At least 20 million people are in the path of a life-threatening storm surge and high winds. We'll have a forecast in just a few minutes. Meanwhile, the fight for racial justice has moved to Wisconsin, where demonstrations turned violent after police shot Jacob Blake, who is black. A curfew is in effect in the city of Kenosha for the fourth night in a row. And President Trump says he is sending federal law enforcement to the city. This all comes as the nation fights to contain the coronavirus pandemic. More than 179,000 Americans have died. Some 1,200 of those were in the last day alone. More than 5.8 million people in the U.S. have been infected. We will see if and how these issues are further addressed in nights three and four of the Republican National Convention. For more on what we can expect, here's CBS News White House correspondent Paula Reed. With the president focused These mainly great, on the Republican people, National doctors, Convention this week, nurses. he has shown a noticeable lack of public interest in the preparations for the hurricane barreling toward the Gulf Coast. FEMA's Storm Operations Center in Washington is up and running, but they've briefed the president only once, yesterday. And besides this tweet urging residents to listen to local officials, Mr. Trump has not spoken publicly about the storm since Sunday. Unfortunately, we have some very, very uh, powerful natural disasters. It's a stark contrast to previous hurricanes where the president made a point of being briefed multiple times on camera, supported by charts showing the storm's path, including one he famously modified with a Sharpie. You followed the rules, you obeyed the laws. President Trump stoked new controversy last night, hosting this naturalization ceremony inside the White House as part of the convention, a political display that clashed with his record of anti-immigration rhetoric and policies. All the rules, norms, values that have made this country great, Donald Trump will destroy them. The ceremony, orchestrated by acting DHS Secretary Chad Wolf, was widely condemned as a possible violation of the Hatch Act, prohibiting federal employees from engaging in political activity. White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows dismissed the criticism. Nobody outside of the Beltway really cares. Melania Trump also broke with tradition, giving her speech last night in the White House Rose Garden, where she addressed the deaths from COVID-19 a topic largely ignored during the convention. My deepest sympathy goes out to everyone who has lost a loved one. 
Following Vice President Pence's headline turn tonight, tomorrow President Trump will give his acceptance speech here at the White House in front of a group of over a thousand people. His address will be followed by a fireworks display over the National Mall. Let's bring in CBS News political contributors Joel Payne and Terry Sullivan. Joel is a Democratic strategist, and Terry is a Republican strategist and former 2016 campaign manager for Marco Rubio. Welcome to you both. Uh, Terry, I want to start with you. What do you make of what Paula said was a lack of public interest from the president on hurricane preparations? Do you think he and the party need to address this during tonight's programming? Well, I mean, look. So much of what is done in hurricane preparation is done at the local and state level in preparation for these disasters. I actually, in a previous lifetime, worked as a spokesperson for the South Carolina Emergency Preparedness Division, so I know firsthand there's not a lot that, that uh, a president can do at this point other than getting FEMA ready for, uh, for staging and things like that, and I'm sure that FEMA is. But whether the president's speaking about it or not uh, isn't really a, a real issue as, well, as far as how to prepare for the hurricane. So you don't think they need to address it in the programming tonight or tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, it needs to be addressed, but it's, it, functionally speaking, it, it does no benefit for the people that are in harm's way if the president is talking about it at the convention or his administration is talking about it. Um, last night, several of the speakers uh, seemed to refer to the coronavirus pandemic in the past tense, and I want to play some of what the president's economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, had to say. Let's listen to that. Then came a once in 100 year pandemic. It was awful. Health and economic impacts were tragic. Hardship and heartbreak were everywhere. But presidential leadership came swiftly and effectively with an extraordinary rescue for health and safety to successfully fight the COVID virus. Terry, what's the Republican messaging on the pandemic? You know, look, there, there are two crises going on here. One, there is clearly the, the, the pandemic itself, the loss of life, the tragedy. Uh, that is undeniable. But another component to that is, is the, the blow to the, the American public's economy, to the, the personal welfare, financial welfare of Americans. And I think that's why you're having someone like Larry Kudlow. He's not a doctor. He's not an epidemiologist. That's not his area of expertise. It's the economy. And he's trying to talk about how to improve the economy. That's that's his area of expertise. If you had someone from, uh, from Secretary Azar or something like that talking the same way, I think it'd be a bit more concerning. But he's focused on the economy as he should be, as that's his job in the administration. Well, Joel, the Biden campaign is calling the Republican convention an alternative reality. And in a statement said, quote, the American people can't afford for Donald Trump to bury his head in the sand any longer. How would you evaluate the campaign's response so far? Well, I think the reason why the Biden campaign is saying that is because as you're watching this convention, it's hard not to, you know, miss the fact that these things that, th that are being said are really detached from reality. I mean, the first lady gave a very capable, fine speech last night, but a lot of the things she was saying just doesn't match up with the administration's record and, frankly, her previous comments. She talked about bringing the country together. She also believes in the president's birtherism lie. Um, you know, you talked about her Be Best initiative. The president is one of the biggest bullies in, in, you know, the last 50 years of American politics and so on and so forth. I mean, there was a speaker last night who had previously made comments where she said her biracial son should be profiled by police. So there's this cognitive dissonance between what the Republicans are trying to project and what people like myself and what others who are unaffiliated are hearing from this convention. And I think that's what the campaign, the Biden campaign, is focusing on. Well, Joel, some of uh, the speakers last night called Joe Biden a career politician. They claimed that he's used his various positions in government to benefit his family. Um, is that a narrative that you think is taking or has taken hold? And what do you think the campaign should do to respond to that? I mean, uh, I, I might be out of step with uh, some of my Democratic compatriots here, but it might be a narrative that's taken hold, and that might not be a bad thing for Joe Biden. I think right now we're seeing the value of a career politician, somebody who knows how to, you know, use the levers of government, who understands the power of the office of the presidency, someone who cares. You know, Terry, I, I, I take Terry's point before with him saying that there's not a lot a president can do functionally, but there is a lot the pre a president can do in terms of being a leader. 
and in terms of being somebody who can demonstrate how government is responding. So it is important not just to be, you know, kind of uh, sleeves rolled up doing the work, but also signaling that the work is being done. And I think that's what this president has missed, and that's what someone like Joe Biden could bring to the White House. Well, Terry, we saw President Trump issue a pardon and hold a naturalization ceremony during the convention last night. We saw the First Lady as well delivering a speech from the Rose Garden, and the President will deliver a speech from the White House tomorrow. This, of course, uh, goes against the norms set by his predecessors. What's the larger strategy here by the President? Well, I'm sure all of America is completely shocked that President Trump isn't following the political norms uh, that have been set. I mean, look, that's, that's why he was elected. He was elected to do things in an unconventional, different way and shake things up. And he often upsets people while doing it. And you can make a compelling argument on why he shouldn't. But at the same time, there, there are no voters out there that are being persuaded by whether where he gave his speech from. That if they are offended, they weren't going to vote for him in the first place. And if they're not offended and they support it and they think it's his right, they were probably already voting for him. So, I mean, this is an issue that everyone gets wrapped around the axle on. Uh, and you bring in these constitutional lawyers about the Hatch Act and everything else. And at the end of the day, every president used from, from Barack Obama to Donald Trump to George W. Bush to Bill Clinton, uses Air Force One to hold rallies uh, and get off a plane and, and do political rallies right in front of. That is absolutely no different than doing it in the South Lawn. So I, I think that this has much to do about nothing. Um, and there are real issues that I mean, we're facing a financial crisis, a global pandemic, uh, you know, s significant racial tension in our country. You know, the, the geographic location following the Hatch Act uh, isn't something that voters really care about. Uh, Terry, the naturalization ceremony at the White House during the convention, why have that during the convention, and how does that square with the actual policies implemented by the president? Yeah, look, uh, I'm not sure that that was a great political idea. I'm not sure what the messaging was uh, there. Um, you know, uh, you know, I don't know is the short answer. Um, it's not something I would have advised to do. I don't think it carries the message not, that they're trying Terry? to. Well, because because look, they've got they've got a real challenge here. They need to drive up Joe Biden's negatives, and that's by by talking about Joe Biden on the issues and his record as a career politician. And they need to uh, drive up Donald Trump's positives a little bit. Maybe that's what they're trying to do, but it seems to be leading with your chin on the immigration issue. Uh, so I, I really think that what he needs to do on this is to start talking about Joe Biden, Joe Biden's record, Senator Harris's record, I mean, and, and, and starting to prosecute the case on why Joe Biden means higher taxes, more government regulations, less rights uh, for average Americans. You know, these are the kind of things that are going to win the campaign for, for Donald Trump, not uh, gimmicky theatrics from, a, you know, a naturalization ceremony. Hmm. Um, I want to ask about the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Joel, uh, Joe Biden posted a video saying that he spoke with the Blake family and told them, quote, justice must and will be done. He also condemned, quote, needless violence in response to the shooting. Take us through how the campaign is responding. Well, I think what the Biden campaign is doing is what they've done when we've been met with these moments before. I mean, they, they acted very similarly around the George Floyd um, incident. Um, I, I think it's important to remind people that there is not a natural constituency there between people who are upset about police violence and Biden voters, right? I mean, there there is a, a gulf to be bridged there. Um, and I think the campaign is working to do that and to build that trust. Um, we know that there have been um, some past statements by the former vice president, and there have been past actions by uh, the, the vice presidential nominee, Kamala Harris, that have, have been dealt with. But I think they're dealing with those things head on. Um, and I think that they like their contrast to what's going on at the Republican convention this week, where you barely get a mention, and you have someone like Daniel Cameron, who is the Kentucky attorney general, who has time to take cheap shots at Joe Biden, but doesn't have time to prosecute the killers of Breonna Taylor. And so I do think that that contrast does work for the Biden campaign, politically, but also morally. Um, Joel, I want to ask you, though, I mean, do those past records that you alluded to by both Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in any way undermine, you think, their ability to kind of speak out on these very issues? I don't, um, because I don't think anyone who is on the street who's screaming for 
racial and social justice, has any illusions that there are any kind of, um, you know, kind of perfect saints um, walking up and down the halls of Congress. I think that they understand that uh, this country's come a long way, particularly people who've been in government for a long time. And I think Joe Biden has been very, um, you know, straightforward about the fact that he has some regrets about some of those previous votes. But that's leadership, right? Acknowledging that, apologizing, saying that he didn't get it right in the past, but they'll get it right in the future. And again, I think that contrast between Biden's version of leadership versus what we see from the Republican Party, which is really nothing. I mean, the president is sending troops to Wisconsin to really inflame a situation that doesn't need to be inflamed. And I think that's the contrast in leadership that the Biden campaign will take every day of the week. Yeah, but Terry, I do think. What do you I can, think? Uh, go ahead, Terry. Yeah. I was going to say, if I can interject, look, I think this is a, a bit of a missed opportunity for, for uh, Joe Biden. This is a, a sister soldier moment opportunity where, look, there, no one is questioning the fact that what happened was an awful tragedy and people need to be dealt with and there needs to be punishment, uh, severe punishment for that. But at the same time, the rioting, the burning, the, the beatings, the violence that is going on in Kenosha, Wisconsin right now, it is, it is malpractice, political malpractice to just to not address that issue, to only address the, the horrific shooting of a man in his back seven times address that, but then not address the fact that all this violence and protesting is going on. Something needs to be done about that. And Joe Biden has an opportunity to speak to that uniquely, and, and, and he hasn't. And, and so I think that's a real missed opportunity for him. And I think it's disappointing. Well, I, I do understand, though, um, Terry, I think he also condemned what he called, quote, needless violence in the wake of the shooting. But, you know, Terry, I want to ask you about what you think the messaging should be from the president on this and the Trump campaign, given what we have seen unfold there. Yeah, this was I mean, a shooting look, in I, front of his children, in front of uh, Jacob Blake's children yeah. that happened. I, I, look, it, it's a horrific event. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, I think... Again, it is important to look at how President Trump has positioned himself as a law and order president who's going to keep people safe from, from you know, rioters in the streets. What's going on in, in, in Wisconsin right now is not peaceful protests. There are plenty of peaceful protests going on around the country, and those should be supported. And, and that's what makes America great, is that people have the ability to go out and, and, and share their voice. People don't have the right to burn down businesses and to set fires. And so I think that, that Democrats are really missing a, a main, a large chunk of middle America here, of, of every race that is concerned about safety and stability. And, and I think that's, that's uh, what Trump's trying to play to right here. All right. We're going to continue to, um, to have discussions about this. Jill Payne and Terry Sullivan, thank you very much. Thank you. A quick programming note for you. We will have full coverage ahead of tonight's Republican National Convention. Our pre-show begins at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on CBSN. Hurricane Laura is now a record-breaking Category 4 storm. It's expected to make landfall along the Gulf Coast within hours. Omar Villafranca and Mireya Villarreal are in Louisiana and Texas, where nearly 30 million people are bracing for catastrophic impact. More than 30 million people are in the path of the giant storm. Along the Texas and Louisiana Gulf Coast, many are still preparing for Laura's punch while others opt to get out of the way. Lake Charles Mayor Nick Hunter says people who refuse to evacuate are in great danger. But I can guarantee you there's going to be a large portion of the city that's going to see some pretty significant storm surge. So if you are here, you're going to have to hunker down. The storm surge is expected to be as high as 20 feet, with flooding as far as 40 miles inland. FEMA Administrator Pete Gaynor told CBS News the surge will be unsurvivable in Cameron Parish, just south of Lake Charles. Laura is expected to make landfall overnight, but already floodwaters are making roads and parking lots impassable in Lafouche Parish to the east. The Category 4 storm is following the track of Hurricane Rita, which barreled into the Gulf Coast 15 years ago, causing $12 billion in damage. Omar Villafranca, CBS News, Lake Charles, Louisiana. I'm Mireya Villarreal near Beaumont, Texas, where families are rushing to get out of town before Hurricane Laura makes landfall. 
Lanisha Daniels, with her husband and four kids, will board a bus to evacuate, but have no idea where they'll end up. The way it's looking, it don't look like there's something we can survive, and I'd rather, you know, be safe than sorry. Some evacuees are being housed in hotels because of coronavirus concerns. Shelters in Texas and Louisiana are filling up fast and doing everything they can to keep people safe from the storm and the virus. Everybody comes in, we're spraying hands, we're taking temperatures, and we're keeping people social distancing, and we're doing every precaution that we can do because of the pandemic. Back in Port Arthur, crews are securing the levee system to help hold back the storm surge that officials warn could be unsurvivable. We urge everybody who may be in harm's way to take these few last hours to get out of harm's way. For more on this, I want to bring in CBS News meteorologist and climate specialist Jeff Berardelli. Hi there, Jeff. So how bad will the storm be for the Texas, Louisiana area, and when is it expected to make landfall? It's going to make landfall late tonight and early tomorrow morning, probably somewhere between, you know, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning or so. And this is likely to be the strongest storm to ever hit Louisiana, at least in terms of winds, maybe even in terms of pressure. That's how strong this is going to be. So this is certainly one for the record books. And this word unsurvivable, you heard them in both of the stories that we just ran for you. This is coming directly from the National Hurricane Center. Right there, National Hurricane Center says that the storm surge is going to be unsurvivable. And that's because we're going to see a storm surge 15 to 20 feet and wind at landfall of 150 miles an hour. Now, you might have been there, if you're watching from that area, uh, around the time that Hurricane Rita hit. So that is the storm of record, at least in the present day, in that area. Well, this is going to be a lot worse than Rita. Rita had winds of 115 miles an hour in 2005 and a storm surge of 15 feet. The difference between 115 mile an hour wind and let's say 150 mile an hour wind is the difference between crashing into a car and crashing into a Mack truck. That's how strong this storm is. So there's the storm making its way towards landfall right now. The more circular it is, the more classic it is, the stronger it is. This has become a monster storm. You would never want a storm of this magnitude bearing down on the shore. And unfortunately, we're having to deal with that right now. Winds as of right now, 145. Northwest at 15 miles an hour is where it is moving. It's about 130 miles from the coast. You can see the radar reflection, some of the outer bands beginning to move on shore, but the worst of it is coming late this evening and then overnight tonight. You can see all the warnings and the watches out. Here's the official forecast track from the National Hurricane Center, keeping it a four, strengthening it to 150 miles an hour at landfall. A strengthening hurricane always produces more damage than a weakening hurricane. So unfortunately, this storm is extraordinarily formidable. It'll stay a hurricane a good portion of tomorrow, then begin to weaken as it moves northward into the Mississippi Valley, producing a lot of rain in its path. It's likely to produce anywhere from a foot to possibly more. And Elaine, you can see the spin on this storm. Watch how it keeps its concentric circle right there as it makes its way on shore. 1 a.m., 2 a.m., here's landfall, 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. That's when the worst winds are going to be. The worst storm surge will be from the center of the storm eastward towards Cameron, Louisiana. Again, this is going to be a wall of water, and it's going to be extraordinarily dangerous. Watch these wind gusts as the storm begins to move on shore lane. 122 miles an hour in Cameron, 92 in Port Arthur. Push it forward, 126 miles an hour in Cameron, 116 in Lake Charles. And the storm surge is also extremely formidable. In fact, it is the worst out of all of the hazards that we're dealing with right now. The winds are strong, but the storm surge is really the most dangerous. Anywhere in the red, that's 15 to 20 feet of storm surge, but look how far inland it goes. 30 miles inland from the coast, maybe even as far as 40 miles. You can see right there some of these nooks and crannies, these bayous. So again, this is one of the most dangerous storms that we have seen in modern history, unfortunately. And if you've been told to evacuate, you still have a little bit more time to do so. Please do so. Be smart. Be safe. It's better to be safe than sorry. You know, Jeff, it is so chilling to hear you describe the power and intensity of this storm. What exactly is contributing to that intensity? Well, you know, you know, during any hurricane season, we tend to see hurricanes that are very strong, especially over the recent few years, uh, because water temperatures are above normal. We also are in a favorable phase for hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean. But to be honest with you, a lot of this stems to climate change. 
we have warmed the background of the oceans by at least one to two degrees Fahrenheit in the Atlantic. And every time you do that, you increase the intensity of hurricanes. And it's not just a little. These are strong increases. And by the way, 85% of damage from hurricanes happens from Cat 4s, Cat 3s, and Cat 5s. So major hurricanes, Cat 3s, Cat 4s, and Cat 5s. Um, the, and as you increase the wind intensity, Elaine, and you, it's going to be hard to believe this, but when you go from a storm of 75 mile an hour winds to a storm of 150 mile an hour winds like this one, you don't just double or triple or quadruple the amount of damage. The amount of damage is 256 times worse. That's how much extra potential damage there is from wind damage. Here's, by the way, a comparison between Rita, which was a Cat 3, and this storm, which is a Cat 4. It's not even a comparison anymore. That's how strong this system is. And you can see the whole Atlantic is just way above normal. It's boiling. This is high octane fuel for these systems. All right, just a chilling picture you paint there, Jeff. Jeff Berardelli for us. Jeff, thank you. You're welcome. Coming up after the break, two people are dead after a third night of protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin. What we know about the teenage suspect. Plus, the CDC reverses course and changes its testing criteria for the coronavirus. Why health experts are speaking out against the new guidelines. This is CBSN, CBS News, always on. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah. The more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You were donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. A 17-year-old male was arrested Wednesday for fatally shooting two protesters and injuring a third in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The city has been rife with social unrest after local police shot Jacob Blake, a 29-year-old black man, seven times on Sunday. Mola Lenghi is in Kenosha with the latest. The shootings erupted just before midnight. The shooter, alleged to be 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse. It allegedly began when he shot one person in the head at this boarded up business, then fired on protesters in the middle of the street as they tried to subdue him. Hey, he just shot them. The gunman is then seen walking past multiple law enforcement vehicles with his hands raised, assault rifle in tow, leaving the scene without being stopped. Today, Rittenhouse was taken into custody in his hometown of Antioch, Illinois, just 15 miles from Kenosha, and is being held on first degree intentional homicide charges. The two people are dead. This is not a police action. 
This is not the action, I believe, of those who set out to do protests. Earlier in the day, the suspected shooter says he was there to guard the community. So you guys are full on ready to defend the property? Yes, we are. Hey. The governor is deploying more than 500 National Guard members, and the Department of Justice is sending federal marshals to assist in the aftermath of the police-involved shooting of Jacob Blake. He remains in the hospital, paralyzed. Blake's mother, Julia Jackson. It makes me sick to my stomach. And um, I feel like I'm in a bad dream. The players say they are going to boycott. Tonight, to all three NBA, NBA playoff games are on hold after the Milwaukee Bucks boycotted their game just before tip-off. This, after Los Angeles Clippers head coach Doc Rivers was noticeably frustrated last night. We've been hung, we've been shot, and all you do is keep hearing a fear. It's, it's amazing to me why we keep loving this country and this country does not love us back. The NBA has announced all three playoff games that were going to be played on Wednesday will be postponed and rescheduled. The league released a statement after the Milwaukee Bucks players did not take the court for Game 5 of their first-round series against the Orlando Magic, which was supposed to tip off at 4 p.m. Eastern. Shortly after the Bucks boycotted the game, the Houston Rockets and Oklahoma City Thunder also decided not to play, joined by the Los Angeles Lakers and the Portland Trailblazers. The protest comes in response to the shooting of a black man named Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, over the weekend. Bill Ryder joins me now. Bill is an NBA columnist and analyst for CBS Sports HQ. Uh, Bill, thanks very much for being with us. So what is going to happen next here, and what will it take for the NBA to be back on the court again? Well, Lane, it's certainly unclear whether or not the players will decide to return to the court for the rest of this postseason. That will presumably be decided tonight when the remaining players, whose teams are still in the bubble in Orlando, will have a meeting to discuss next steps. There are various reports that there are some players who believe it's time to walk away from the game for this season, for the postseason to come to an end, and other players who'd like to see the season through. So it's very much an open question what happens next, but the players plan to get together in the next few hours and try to come to some kind of a decision. How important is it for the league to stand with its players right now? I, I think it's, it's critically important, and certainly it is beyond unprecedented in what we've seen, including for the NBA, the fact that both the commissioner's office and the teams involved, those organizations, did not know that the Milwaukee Bucks planned to walk off the court today but Adam Silver, the commissioner, and the people around him have been pretty, I think, forward-thinking about supporting players going all the way back to Donald Sterling, a owner of the Los Angeles Clippers who was kicked out of the league several years ago. Look, this is a difficult situation. Obviously, the NBA is a business, and for the playoffs not to happen is a very major problem from a business perspective. But everyone I've talked to around the association, including some sources in the commissioner's office, believe that Adam Silver, because they view it as the morally right thing to do and just because long-term they have to be in unison with the players, will support them as they try to figure out the players what they want to do next. That's really interesting to hear about the deliberations behind the scenes there. Uh, well, LeBron James has condemned the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. The NBA superstar said in a post-game news conference Monday night that black people in America are, quote, scared. How much of a role is LeBron expected to play in the future of this season? Yeah, I, I think his role is going to be remarkably important for, for a few reasons. Uh, the first is... Long before our politics became a part of every walk of life in this country, including sports and the divisiveness in this country, back when, when really people felt, I mean, like, like it was not appropriate to mix sports with politics, LeBron James went a different direction, going all the way back to Trayvon Martin, the young man, unarmed black man, who was killed in Florida many, many years ago by putting his name, Trayvon Martin's name, on LeBron James' shoes during games. That was pretty unprecedented. So for that reason, because he's been at the forefront of that, and because LeBron James in the NBA is the most important player and always sets the tone, what his voice says in this meeting tonight, what his view is, is going to carry a remarkable amount of weight in deciding whether or not the players move forward with this postseason.
really is a sign of how much things have changed uh, in this moment. Well, the boycott of Wednesday's game is exactly four years to the day since Colin Kaepernick sat during the national anthem to call attention to the issues of racial inequality and police brutality. Do you believe sports today can play a bigger role in these issues than it did back in 2016? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think they will. You know, for those folks, and usually I think people's politics impact where they come down on this, but whether you believe that sports should play a critical role in these conversations of politics and social justice and violence against unarmed black men in this country at the hands of police, or you don't, this is the reality that is here to stay. It's a great point. Four years ago today, Colin Kaepernick did something that was not just divisive, but unusual and uncomfortable for athletes, for athletes who agree with Colin Kaepernick that level of uncertainty is gone, certainly for athletes in the NBA. We've seen Major League Baseball, a Major League Baseball game canceled tonight. This is the new normal. Politics and sports are indivisible now. And whatever your view, whatever your sport, whatever your view as an athlete, you are going to begin using your platform to speak about how you think this country should move forward. What we're seeing in the NBA bubble is, um, is how things are, are going to be, not just for the NBA, but I think for professional athletes moving forward. All right, Bill Ryder for us. Bill, thank you. It's really good to see you, by the way. Thanks. New coronavirus testing guidelines from the CDC have sparked concern among health experts, including Dr. Anthony Fauci. This comes as COVID-19 cases in the U.S. top 5.8 million. Manuel Bohorkas is in Miami with the details. The new CDC guidance suggests some who have had exposure to the virus but have no symptoms do not necessarily need a test. A stark departure from its previous stance that testing is recommended for all close contacts. That's alarmed some scientists. Were you taken aback by that change? Yeah, I was certainly surprised to read it. There was no explanation of it. I am concerned and I'd, I'd like to know why the change was made. A Health and Human Services official today denied pressure from the White House forced the change. But CBS News has learned the White House Coronavirus Task Force was behind it. Late today, California's Governor Gavin Newsom said the state will simply ignore it. I don't agree with the new CDC guidance, period, full stop. More than 26,000 cases have been confirmed at colleges and universities nationwide. And as some K-12 through schools reopen, the American Academy of Pediatrics reported a rise in childhood cases of 21 percent in a recent two-week period. Nationwide cases, hospitalizations and deaths are down, but there's a long way to go. We're still generating 30, 40,000 new cases per day. Uh, hundreds of people are still dying every day. Uh, that's a very high level. It's much worse than when we opened up at the end of May. In local matters, Republicans are on the defensive in the battleground state of Georgia. They're looking to defend two Senate seats in November. David Perdue has been in the U.S. Senate since 2015 and has become one of President Trump's biggest allies. Meanwhile, Kelly Loeffler took control of the state's second seat late last year to finish Senator Johnny Isaacson's term following his resignation. Both are facing tough re-election bids as Democrats ramp up their efforts to turn the state blue and gain the majority in the chamber. For more on this, I'm joined by Greg Bluestein. He's a political reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Hi there, Greg. Welcome. Talk to us a little about why the Ossoff-Purdue race is so competitive. Yeah, I mean, John Ossoff gained national attention back in 2017 for a, a nationally watched special election congressional bid for basically north, a district spanning North Atlanta suburbs. And he came within four points of flipping the district, but raised an astonishing amount of money, about $30 million dollars. Uh, and really catapulted himself into the national scene. He's the he's challenging David Perdue, a former Fortune 500 chief executive who is a close ally with President Trump, as you mentioned. Um, so it's a battle between a veteran businessman and a kind of younger um, upstart Democrat who is bringing uh, a, you know a fresh perspective on politics. Um, and you've seen the dynamics really grow closer and closer as the election day nears. And then today we have news that an outside group is spending more than $7 million to boost John Ossoff's campaign through the months of September and into the fall. Um, a big, big uh, sort of vote of confidence from, from this Washington-based group uh, for John Ossoff. Yeah, I mean, how much of a boost could that be potentially for him? 
Well, for him, it's also sort of catch up um, because Republican allied groups have reserved about uh, 16 million or so, depending on what track you've seen, you, you, you watch. Um, but $16 million or so of, of ads at least for David Perdue's campaign. And you can't turn on a TV here in Georgia without seeing an ad for either John Ossoff or David Perdue, it seems. And it's only going to get <laughs> worse um, as November <laughs> nears. Um, but this is important cover for, for John Ossoff um, on the TV front. Um, and he's been trying to, you know, uh, have virtual town hall meetings and virtual press conferences with with reporters and with voters uh, throughout the district. He recently said he'd he'd uh, go up against David Perdue in at least five debates around the state between now and November. Um, so he is he is trying to press and, and pressure David Perdue. Um, most of the uh, prognosticators still think it leans Republican. This race is you know likely to go Republican or lean Republican, but certainly polls show a very very tight race. Well, uh, tell us more about this special election for Georgia's second Senate seat. In a race with multiple contenders, who are the front runners and what are candidates doing to stand out in the crowded field? Yeah, we've got 21 different contenders in that November special election, which means it's almost a certainty that there's going to be a January runoff between the two top finishers. Um, Kelly Leffler, the, the incumbent, um, was tapped to the seat by Governor Brian Kemp way back in December, and she's going to spend um, at least $20 million dollars boosting her campaign. So there's even more ads for Georgians to watch. Um, and her most fierce Republican challenger is Congressman Doug Collins, a four-term representative from, from up in the North Georgia mountains, very conservative territory, who's portraying himself as Donald Trump's chief defender against impeachment and one of his most loyal backers in Congress. Um, so they are battling for, they're, they're both kind of pushing each other to the party's right flank. But there's multiple Democrats running too. The party establishment wants Reverend Raphael Warnock, um, the, the pastor of Atlanta's famous Ebenezer Baptist Church. But poll numbers show that he's struggling to separate himself from Matt Lieberman, the son of former U.S. Senator and vice presidential nominee uh, Joe Lieberman. And so there's a little bit of concern from na national Democrats and Democrats down here in Georgia uh, why he hasn't separated himself from, from Matt Lieberman, even though he has the endorsements, he's got the the campaign staff, and he's got the, the money in, in this race. Most more Within the last two weeks, he has launched two separate TV ads. So look for him at least to start gaining some traction, at least if he doesn't, then you know there's, there's some more uh, endemic problems within his campaign. Interesting. We'll be watching that contest closely. Well, a CBS News poll from earlier this month shows Joe Biden and President Trump essentially tied among voters in Georgia at 46 and 45 percent, respectively. How much could the race for president be a driving force in these down ballot races? Uh, it'll, it'll be the, the, the beginning and end to these down ballot races. Um, and, and that's the thing. Joe Biden is competing here in Georgia in a way that Democrats haven't in, in at least the last decade. Um, he's already up on air here in Georgia. Um, he forced Donald Trump to defend the state. Way back in June, Donald Trump had to start running radio ads in Georgia. That's unheard of um, for a presidential contest here, where Republicans have held Georgia in every presidential election since 96. Um, so that just shows you how close the dynamics are here. Um, uh, Joe Biden's campaign just hired about half a dozen veteran operatives to lead the efforts here in the state. Um, it's still just like the Senate races. Prognosticators still say they expect it to lean to the right, lean to to Republicans. Um, but with things this close, and with um, you know the conventions and the debates and and all that could change over the next few few weeks, um, it, it, it's a these are all races to watch. And so goes the presidential race. Um, you know, so goes the down ballot races. Right. Always fascinating political dynamics in your state. Greg Bluestein for us. Greg, great to see you again. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Coming up after the break with the election just over two months away, there's a renewed push to stop the spread of false information. We'll take a look at how one organization is taking matters into its own hands. You're streaming CBSN.
the biggest names in politics. Whoa, that's news. Do you think that the president has the authority to send in active duty troops? Face the questions you want answered. Did the CDC let the American people down? Tell me about the decision. When was it made? Who made it? What is the next area that you are concerned about? What does that mean for the risk of reinfection here in the United States? You bring up a very good point, Margaret. Margaret, that's a great question. Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan on CBS. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original <laughs> reporting. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. There is a growing effort to stop misinformation ahead of the November election. The Senate Intelligence Committee report on Russian interference in 2016 stated no single group of Americans was targeted more than African Americans. Jerika Duncan shows us how one organization is fighting back. What is happening with our own video on this? How's it performing? Where do we actually post it? Each morning, Andre Banks and Ashley Bryant to, sign into what they call the War Room to discuss the latest popular posts that are spreading false information. You all call this a war. Yeah. Yep. When you look at what happened in 2016, this is one of the biggest campaigns to misinform American voters in history. You know, when you have that level of strategy on the other side, you want to meet that with a level of strategy on this side. It's important that black people, Latinx people are able to make their voices heard this year. They're co-directors of Win Black Palante. Palante means to go forward in Spanish. They work with more than 200 people across 15 states, mostly swing states, to monitor memes, messages, and images across the most popular social media platforms. As the demographics of this country change, it's critical that we are able to have a conversation across race. We're able to have democracy where all kinds of people can show up, and we can come together to make the big decisions that we need um, to move the country forward. A Senate Intelligence Committee report found that more than 66 percent of information spread online by Russian operatives during the 2016 election contained a term related to race. One fake account called Blacktivist had 11.2 million engagements with Facebook users. These groups are impersonating black folks, pretending to be black activists, and they're using the issues that matter most to us to lure them in, have them thinking that it's a sense of community, and then they ultimately say, we're not going to vote. Let's all band together and abstain from voting. Do you think this was the difference between Hillary Clinton losing and Donald Trump winning the presidential election in 2016? I think it definitely contributed to it. I think, you know, misinformation and disinformation campaigns writ large and obviously, you know, black and Latinx voters are key uh, voting blocks within the Democratic Party. You all say this is the modern day poll tax mm. for African American and Latinx voters. The weaponization of digital media is really a large form of voter suppression, voter depression. These are attacks on our communities to misinform us, to disinform. To counter posts that are verifiably false, when Black Palante has created GIFs, memes, and posts that are true and factual, their library has more than 400 million views. What's the most recent misinformation you found that you've had to counter? Yeah, we've been tracking very closely a range of misinformation about Senator Kamala Harris and since her nomination on the Democratic ticket. You know, part of misinformation is not just outright lies, but really confusing and muddying the waters. In this case, we've seen a lot of the kind of birtherism that we saw around Obama. Would you say a lot of the misinformation you're trying to counter impacts voters that are likely to vote Democrat? Yeah, I mean, you know, the if you look at the last elections, you know, black and Latinx voters are disproportionately have voted for Democrats. But if misinformation can happen to any community, yep. then anybody can be the target of it. If it can be weaponized against black people, it can be weaponized against women. It can be weaponized against older Americans. And so this is something that we should all feel um, a part of trying to stop and trying to change. When Black Palante says it gets its funding from individual donors across the country. Look, they said a lot of this comes down to doing your own research and also listening to the candidates. Jerika Duncan, CBS News, New York. 
August is Breastfeeding Awareness Month, and this final week shines a spotlight on disparities black women face. The CDC says fewer black mothers breastfeed compared to white mothers, and COVID-19 has likely widened that gap. Elise Preston takes a look. These moments are precious for Brittany Stinney and her three-month-old son, Kevin. When I look down and see my, my little son nursing and even through the pain and the discomfort or whatever it is I'm feeling and the struggles, like it's, it's a beautiful journey. But according to the CDC, it's a journey only 69% of black moms and their babies experience compared to 85% of white mothers and babies. Lack of exposure is a main factor with generations of black women not breastfeeding since slavery times. Black mothers were expected to give up nursing their own child so that they could nurse the children of the white families. So it already is really creating a traumatic experience between the idea of what breastfeeding is. A recent study finds black babies are nine times more likely to be given formula in hospitals than white babies. A lot of times the providers will assume that you're going to not breastfeed. And so they don't even provide the same levels of education and support. The issue is now compounded with the pandemic disproportionately affecting black communities. Many new moms are unable to get in-person lactation help and some hospitals are separating moms suspected of having COVID-19 from their newborns. You have got to give these mothers their first hour with their child. Stinney credits her breastfeeding success to her family and friends and says Kevin is thriving. <laughs> he's not like a chunky baby, but he's, he's a healthy boy. She hopes he'll continue to nurse for several more months. Elise Preston, CBS News, New York. Wednesday marked 100 years since women were guaranteed the right to vote. New York celebrated the occasion with the unveiling of a new statue, the first in Central Park to show real women. It's also the first there to depict an African-American. Nancy Chen explains how these historic women are breaking the bronze ceiling. Seven years in the making and long overdue, Famed suffragists Sojourner Truth, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony now have a home in Central Park, memorialized in the Women's Rights Pioneers Monument. Meredith Bergman is the sculptor. They've been missing, as if women had not done anything worthy of creating a memorial. Among the attendees at Wednesday's unveiling, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. This is the first of many statues of pioneering and Colleen Jenkins, Stanton's great-great-granddaughter. She's vice president of the nonprofit group Monumental Women, pushing to break this barrier in Central Park. The bronze dome over Central Park, just like the glass ceiling over many other venues, shattered today. Did you hear it? <laughs> this is one of the most visited urban parks in the U.S. It's home to about two dozen statues of historical figures and sculptures depicting fictional characters. But until now, not one has honored a woman in her work. While men, including William Shakespeare and Robert Burns, have had their place, the only female representation has been storybook characters like Alice in Wonderland, Mother Goose, and Juliet with her Romeo. Art historian Michelle Bogart says public art helps tell a story about society's priorities. It's not going to be simply an affirmation of women's power. It's going to be an inspiration for women and men and kids to learn. Weighing several tons, the statue stands 14 feet tall, a vision of the past reaching toward the future. Nancy Chen, CBS News, New York. After coming under fire for problems during Maryland's June primary, election officials from across the state are now trying to figure out how they can avoid similar challenges in November. Mike Helgren with our Baltimore station WJZ has the story. Who would have thought 2020's general election would have been like this? We knew it was going to be crazy, but not this crazy. Election officials from every county in Maryland and Baltimore City came together to talk about the challenges they're facing for the upcoming presidential election. It's like a global pandemic, vote by mail elections, election judge vacancies on a never before seen scale. Among them, Linda Lamone, the longtime Maryland elections administrator. The fact that we had to completely change the way we conduct elections in Maryland was just um, an un 
unreal challenges. Lamone came um, under fire after the primary for long lines and some voters not getting mail-in ballots on time. Some lawmakers demanded she resign and the governor expressed his outrage last month. It was an unmitigated disaster. Uh, there were rampant problems. For the big election in November, Maryland State Board of Elections plans for fewer but larger polling places for in-person voting and will triple the number of drop boxes for mail-in ballots. For those voters who do not trust the Postal Service, there are still concerns about finding enough poll workers during the pandemic. Everybody understands that this election is causing some adjustments and we're making those as we need to. The head of a government commission that helps local elections officials said some across the country have been threatened. Ignorant, ri ridiculous uh, folks who are calling in with death threats. He urged those in charge of Maryland's elections to rise to the challenge ahead. The world is watching us and they wanna know how the United States, the beacon of democracy is gonna handle this election. This week, the State Board of Elections started mailing out millions of mail-in ballot applications. The actual ballots will start going out late next month. Reporting downtown, Mike Helgren, WJZ. We are going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with the rest of the day's news. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on. Biggest names in politics. Whoa, that's news. Do you think that the president has the authority to send in active duty troops? Face the questions you want answered. Did the CDC let the American people down? Tell me about the decision. When was it made? Who made it? What is the next area that you are concerned about? What does that mean for the risk of reinfection here in the United States? You bring up a very good point, Margaret. Margaret, that's a great question. Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan on CBS. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Multiple to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. In the UK, face coverings will now have to be worn in secondary schools in some parts of the country after the government reversed its guidance. Elaine Dunkley with our media partners at the BBC has the details. It will soon be back to school for children across England, and face coverings could be an essential part of their kit. New guidance issued by the government will leave it up to head teachers to decide on whether it's necessary for staff and students to wear face coverings in communal areas such as corridors. However, face coverings will be compulsory in areas where there is a local lockdown. The government says the guidance doesn't include primary schools because the risk of transmission is low, but does apply to secondary schools, colleges and universities. I think what we've got is clarity that if you're in an area which is higher risk, higher transmission rates, then there is an expectation that young people around school will be wearing those face coverings. But equally, there's the flexibility in other areas for you as a leader, working with your staff, working with your governors, working with the community to do what's right in your context. The Department for Education had initially been reluctant for children to wear face coverings in schools because of concern that it could make communication difficult between teachers and students but says it's revised its guidance following scientific advice from the World Health Organization, which recommends that children over the age of 12 should wear a face covering when social distancing is difficult. It should be mandatory, not just in local lockdown areas, but in all areas for, for schools um, within communal areas, within the corridors, um, to enforce, to be supported to enforce uh, face masks being worn for children over the age of 12. And, and I think that will be a clear policy that every school could follow, rather than being told it's up to each individual head teacher to make their own policy, uh, and, and schools and parents not knowing where they are. Schools in Scotland will advise pupils to wear face coverings in corridors and shared areas from next week, and Northern Ireland has issued similar guidance. In Wales, the issue is under review. Elaine Dunkley, BBC News. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be covering in our next hour. 
Hurricane Laura strengthens into a powerful Category 4 storm as it looms off the U.S. Gulf Coast. We're tracking the storm. Plus, protests turn deadly in Kenosha, Wisconsin, as demonstrators gathered in the streets again following the police shooting of a black man. We'll have the latest on the unrest. And it's night three of the Republican National Convention. Vice President Mike Pence is set to headline the program as Republicans continue to make their case for President Trump's re-election. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on. George Floyd's death has inspired a movement. We are witnessing it right now. I think there's a level of bias in every individual. Is bias training enough? It's a start. We have to talk to people, listen. What do you think history teaches us about this moment we're in? This is a time for us not to rest. Why is it important, do you guys think, to come out? If we just stayed home, nothing would change. What do you hope no one comes from this? This is what's coming from it, and the change is here. We spoke to black officers all around the country about the challenges that they face. When you're not in uniform, are you ever concerned for your safety? Out of uniform, I'm, I'm just another guy. I'm a black man first. See what's new under the sun this Sunday morning with Jane Pauley. the biggest names in politics. Whoa, that's news. Do you think that the president has the authority to send in active duty troops? Face the questions you want answered. Did the CDC let the American people down? Tell me about the decision. When was it made? Who made it? What is the next area that you are concerned about? What does that mean for the risk of reinfection here in the United States? You bring up a very good point, Margaret. Margaret, that's a great question. Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan on CBS. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original reporting. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. I'm Elaine Quijano. It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. Tonight, Vice President Mike Pence will officially accept his renomination as he highlights the Republican theme tonight, America as a Land of Heroes, at the Republican National Convention. Pence will address the nation from Fort McHenry in Baltimore. Second Lady Karen Pence will also speak. They'll be joined by Republican Senators Marsha Blackburn and Joni Ernst and Counselor to the President Kellyanne Conway. Conway is departing the White House at the end of next week to spend more time with her family. Last night, the party focused on a positive view of the country. First Lady Melania Trump spoke from the White House Rose Garden. She said her husband will always tell you where he stands and wants nothing more for the country than to prosper. She also expressed condolences to families impacted by the coronavirus, a message largely absent from previous speakers. I want to acknowledge the fact that since March, our lives have changed drastically. The invisible enemy, COVID-19, swept across our beautiful country and impacted all of us. My deepest sympathy goes out to everyone who has lost a loved one. And my prayers are with those who are ill or suffering. The night was short on specifics of tackling issues impacting Americans right now, including racial unrest, climate change, and the pandemic itself. CBS News senior political analyst and 60 Minutes correspondent John Dickerson joins me now from Washington with more. Hi, John. Good evening to you. What differences did you notice between days one and two of the convention, and what do you expect to carry over into this third night? 
Uh, well, good evening, Elaine. Uh, it's good to be with you. Well, the first night was, you know, basically the differences in every night have been the first hour has been uh, red meat, raw and wriggling, and then the second hour has been a little bit more crafted. And the first night you saw Nikki Haley and uh, Senator uh, Tim, Tim Scott speak more broadly, not so much about um, those red meat issues, although they were plenty critical of Joe Biden. Um, and that slightly softer tone, of course, was, was echoed by the first lady. Um, she gave pretty, and those three speeches, let's group them all together, are pretty traditional campaign speeches. You know, they've got a little criticism in them, but they're, they've got some hope and they've got some broader talk about uh, Republican themes. Um, the challenge for the Republican convention when Donald Trump is the nominee, though, is he is so indelible as a candidate and as a human being that anything that might try to soften or change his um, stature in the public mind um, is short-lived because he is such a personality that he will reassert himself quickly thereafter and, and basically become the centerpiece of his campaign pretty quickly, no matter what they say in the speeches. Right. Yeah. He has such a command of his spotlight that he has there. Um, well, we rarely ever hear from First Lady Melania Trump. She did deliver that message of empathy about the coronavirus and racial injustice. And I wonder, John, what were your thoughts on her speech? And do you expect to see more of her on the campaign trail? She hasn't been much of a campaigner before. She stayed pretty much out of the limelight. So I'm not guessing that we'll see a great deal more of her. Um, she, there is some appeal to Republican voters, but I, I don't. I just don't think they're going to have her out there a lot. In part because also campaigning is not really um, what it once was. She sounded some of those notes on the coronavirus uh, clearly, and and um, and talked about racial unrest in America. But again, what was notable is that she said them in part because of the paucity of remarks from the president himself. And so it's a bit of a low bar. Um, the tradition with American presidents is that you would have a president who would speak regularly um, to the pain of the nearly 180,000 uh, Americans who have died and their families. And that hasn't happened. And so by contrast, her speech is notable. Um, but it's not a great contrast if the president is faring so poorly on his handling of COVID-19. And polls show uh, that 60 percent of the country thinks he's or disapproves of the way he's handling it. Uh, and his lack of empathy, saying at one point the death count is what it is, uh, is part of the reason his numbers are so bad on that issue. Well, you touched on this a moment ago, John, but have you sensed much of an effort from the party to attempt to soften the president's sharper edges or strike a more conciliatory tone? And if so, who precisely are those kinds of messages aimed at? Well, that's part of the puzzle of this convention. Who are they trying to hit? We know what the base where the base is. They love the president. They they see nothing wrong with him. Then there are those voters who have the president has been shedding for almost since he's been elected. And those are suburban voters, older voters, and some people who voted against Hillary Clinton in 2016, but not exactly for Donald Trump. Some of those voters can take a second look at Donald Trump during the, the convention. And if they see these softer messages, if they see somebody like uh, Ambassador Nikki Haley testifying to him or at least even just appearing at the convention, they might say, oh, well, you know, he's, he's not so bad and give him a second look. In terms of switching over voters who are totally gone, um, that's probably unlikely to happen. You, if you're going to do that, you have to really pound home the message, and they haven't done that as much on those kind of what we might call softer themes. And so, because that's just very, very hard to do. And I think the, the real strategy from the Trump team is basically to, try, to drive up his base that doesn't need to hear so many more softer messages. He just wants to turn out more of them than he did in 2016. And there's some evidence that there are a lot of voters out there who are in the group that he did well with that didn't vote in 2016, and he's trying to get more of them out to the polls. So if that's the case, John, uh, the president has said a lot about the protests turning violent, and he's talked about uh, protecting statues. He's talked less about the root causes of some of those demonstrations. Um, do you think that we will likely hear more, then, of this law and order theme moving forward, rather than, um, as the First Lady talked about, reflections on this moment of racial reckoning that we're in right now? He might touch on those themes a little, again, to, to tell those Republican voters who might be on the, the fence, you know, that he does 
at least acknowledge these sets of issues. Uh, but he's not going to give a full-throated explication of the American uh, racial landscape. It's not really in his uh, uh, set of attributes, qualities, or interests. Um, so it is more likely, based on past performance and everything we've seen at the campaign, is that he will continue to paint a picture of, of American carnage, sort of American carnage, too, if you'll remember that phrase from his, from his inauguration. And that is what America would look like if Joe Biden were to be president. And he will point to uh, Wisconsin and Oregon and Seattle and say this is what the entire country will look like. Um, and that's to do two things. One, increase his sort of hardcore base and the number of people who fall into that camp. And then also frighten some suburban voters, basically, this is coming your way, um, sort of frighten them into his camp. Uh, the challenge, of course, with that message is that every time you do that, you act as a turnout mechanism for African Americans who hear him talk about the danger to the suburbs and recognize that as an implicit or, in some cases, explicit um, uh, racial appeal. And, uh, and that will turn them out for Joe Biden. Interesting. I want to ask you about Vice President Mike Pence, who is speaking tonight. How does the role that Mike Pence has carved out for himself compare to that of his recent predecessors? And has he made his future ambitions known? Uh, he hasn't made his future ambitions known. It's rare that a vice president doesn't think about the presidency. Um, Dick Cheney was probably the last one who really didn't have strong presidential ambitions that he uh, mulled over while he was a vice president. He thought about it beforehand and, and decided he didn't want to do it. So, um, you know, Mike Pence has been extremely loyal to the president. And if there's one attribute the president um, really holds in higher regard than anything else, it's loyalty. And, and Mike Pence, who, it's funny, during the 2016 convention when he was picked, so many Republicans told me, oh, it's wonderful. Mike Pence will kind of soften uh, Donald Trump and, and kind of bring him into the fold and, 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 and sort of prepare him to um, put on the jacket of the presidency. And one of the signature um, elements of the Trump presidency, of course, is that he has refashioned the job to him. The job has not refashioned Donald Trump. Nevertheless, Mike Pence has found his place. Um, traditionally, vice presidents attack the opposition, but we are in a stage now where both parties spend all their time attacking the opposition for all of their convention. It used to be kind of the vice president's job and everything else was sunshine and rainbows. And now it's just uh, everybody has a, a shot at the other team. And so he will talk uh, about the accomplishments of the administration. And then I think he has one thing he can say nobody else can, which is as the head of the coronavirus task force, he can testify to the president's response. The problem or challenge for him is that if there's too much happy talk, it is in fact the happy talk that it is a part of why the country disapproves of the job the president has done, because he has constantly said things were going to be better than they actually turned out to be. And so that's a, that's a, uh, a tightrope for him uh, to walk. But he's got an incredible uh, setting there at Fort McHenry, which is where Francis Scott Key mm -hmm. uh, got the inspiration for uh, the Star Spangled Banner. Right, and we look forward to his remarks tonight. John Dickerson, John will also be listening for more broadly, as you put it, quote, red meat, raw, and wriggling. <laughs> John, always great to have your insight. Thank you so much, John. Thanks, Elaine. Coming up after the break, a baseless conspiracy theory called QAnon is seeping into American politics, what big tech companies are doing to monitor its reach online. Stay with us, you're streaming Red and Blue. So, I've got a question for you. What if you could watch all the CCO news you want and see all your favorite CCOers anytime, anywhere? Well, you can. Go ahead and grab your phone. Come on, I know it's close by. And go to WCCO.com or get the app and poof, there we are, right next to all those other networks you stream. Bonus time, it's free. You heard right, zip not a zilch, free. CBSN Minnesota, built by CBS News, powered locally by WCCO. Wherever you are, wherever you go, breaking Bay Area news live. This is CBSN Bay Area. I'm Michelle Griego. CBSN Bay Area. In your hand, on demand, and absolutely free. Highly updated top local stories and weather where you live. Available everywhere. Powered by KPIX 5 News. CBSN Bay Area. Always on, always free at KPIX.com. 
We spoke to black officers all around the country about the challenges that they face. When you're not in uniform, are you ever concerned for your safety? Out of uniform, I'm, I'm just another guy. I'm a black man first. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7, anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. Two lawmakers from opposite sides of the aisle have introduced a resolution to condemn the baseless conspiracy QAnon. The fringe theory is gaining notoriety in national politics. Democratic Congressman Tom Malinowski and Republican Congressman Denver Riggleman call QAnon a danger in their legislation, adding that it has no place in Washington. Yesterday, the RNC sidelined a video from a speaker after the Daily Beast reported she encouraged her Twitter followers to read an anti-Semitic QAnon conspiracy theory. The FBI has labeled QAnon as a potential domestic terror threat. As some lawmakers begin to speak out against it, focus is also on social media companies and the role they play in giving these messages a platform. Let's bring in CNET senior producer Dan Patterson, who has reported extensively on QAnon. Dan, thanks very much for being with us. QAnon did not originate on mainstream social media, but it's found a home there. How is the conspiracy theory spreading across platforms? You are absolutely correct, Elaine. QAnon originated on the 4chan message board, uh, and then it hopped to 8chan. These are both obscure message boards that pride themselves on being uh, a little offensive at times. They are absolutely obscure. What happened after was not obscure. 8chan uh, and uh, 4chan kind of amplified the movement of QAnon into mainstream social media sites like YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Discord, uh, particularly on YouTube, 8chan uh, or uh, QAnon found a home uh, because they were able to create media that backed up uh, uh, or was created in support of uh, a lot of the, as you said, baseless conspiracies that the group believes. And because QAnon is not uh, one organization that you can just uh, cancel or remove, uh, it is an idea, and it is an idea that is constantly evolving. It has become incredibly difficult for internet platforms to kind of find and, uh, if not totally get rid of, uh, at least moderate. So QAnon has pro proven to be a particularly large challenge uh, for these massive internet platforms. And so how exactly are social media companies trying to deal with QAnon? Uh, well, for a long time, they did uh, little, if nothing. Um, but recently, as in this summer, uh, last month, Facebook banned 790 fa uh, QAnon groups. Twitter took very similar action, and YouTube is starting to tamp down on uh, similar accounts. Uh, Discord started to take action uh, about a year, 18 months or so ago. Uh, but I tell you, Elaine, I, I talk with these internet platforms on a daily basis, and a number of their spokespeople uh, empathize with uh, the challenges that uh, QAnon presents, but they absolutely will not talk on record, and they uh, won't provide insights beyond what they publish on their own site's blog. So it's, it's hard to really get a sense of the scale or the actions that are actually being taken without the filter of PR telling you, hey, this is what we published on the Facebook newsroom blog. As a reporter, this has been really frustrating because I, I want to get a sense of not just the size of these uh, of these groups and these conspiracies, but the actual activities of engineers, developers, programmers inside uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube, these organizations that are heavily driven by algorithms, and these algorithms really favor engagement, which is what QAnon is particularly good at doing. So again, uh, QAnon spreads across the social web because they're good at exploiting algorithms, but the social platforms have been really opaque in talking about the processes under which, uh, by which they're trying to stamp down or tamp down some of this activity. So, Dan, if that is the case, is it even clear how these companies manage policing QAnon while also being mindful of censoring free speech? Is that even clear right now, if and how they're trying to strike that balance? 
Well, that is a very delicate balance. And of course, these internet platforms are not, there is no First Amendment issue happening here. But I, I will share a metaphor with you that uh, when I was last in San Francisco with a Facebook, uh, a fairly high level uh, former Facebooker, uh, they used this metaphor. It was pretty common, in fact, across the tech industry last fall. Uh, he said to me, look, think of Facebook as a bar. You can come into Facebook and you can get drunk. You can even be kind of rowdy and offensive. But the second you break a bottle and start to threaten another patron, I have the right to kick you out. Deplatforming you or removing you from my bar is the same as me saying this is a private establishment. It's not a First Amendment. It's not a free speech issue. It's me saying I don't like you threatening people or using violent terms inside my bar. Now, of course, that metaphor isn't perfect, uh, but it's a pretty good way to think of these internet platforms, or it's a good way to think of how these internet platforms think of themselves. However, there is this unspoken um, issue, which is QAnon drives a lot of traffic, as does a lot of these uh, internet conspiracies. And uh, I, I think that a lot of the internet platforms are really challenged right now. They don't want to be regulated. They don't want to censor, actually censor, uh, free speech. Uh, they do want to be a place where people can come and discuss ideas, however controversial those ideas might be. But it's really hard when you have a group that is exploiting algorithms and threatening people. All right. It's a story I know you'll continue to follow. Dan Patterson for us. Dan, thank you very much. Good to see you, Elaine. Coming up after the break, we're just moments away from the third night of the Republican National Convention. Vice President Mike Pence is the featured speaker. We'll take a look at some of the nation's pressing issues we have not heard much about so far this week. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. Donald Trump will never turn his back on those who serve and protect us at home and abroad. You know, it's been a heartbreaking time for the women and men in our law enforcement community. And in this time of great testing for them, let's let them know here and now, all across this country, we will always stand with those who stand on the thin blue line of law enforcement in America. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah. The more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad.
The third night of the Republican National Convention is set to begin in just a few minutes. Tonight, Vice President Mike Pence is delivering the keynote address from Fort McHenry in Baltimore. Other speakers include Second Lady Karen Pence, House Press Secretary, White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany, and Senior White House Advisor Kellyanne Conway. She announced over the weekend she is leaving the role at the end of the month to spend time with her family. For more on tonight, let's bring in CBS News White House correspondent Ben Tracy and CBSN political reporter Caitlin Huey Burns. Hello, Caitlin. Hello, Ben. Welcome to you both. Ben, let me start with you. What can we expect to hear from Kellyanne Conway in this farewell speech? She's someone who has been one of the president's most visible advisors and defenders. She has. And I don't think you're, that you're going to hear kind of the average Kellyanne Conway tonight, the one who likes to pick fights with the media out on the driveway at the White House. We are told tonight that she's going to give a very heartfelt talk, that she's going to talk about her time with the president, the president that she has come to know, the man behind the scenes, to try to continue this effort of humanizing the president a bit. Uh, Kellyanne Conway has also been somebody that during this administration has been very focused on the issue of opioids. Um, so you can expect to hear her cover that topic as well. Uh, the reason she is leaving the White House is for family reasons, she says, uh, and mainly that is because uh, the, the Conway's young teenage daughter has become very vocal on social media lately about her parents' politics. Um, so Kellyanne Conway is trying to take herself out of the spotlight a little bit and tend to those family dynamics. But before she does that, she has this very big platform tonight during the Republicans' convention. And we should note that it is unusual for a current White House aid, uh, and she is one of the president's top aides, to be participating in a convention like this. But this, we've already seen, is a convention that is shattering all sorts of norms, and she will continue that tonight. Right. I know the White House has said she's appearing in her personal capacity there. Um, all right, Caitlin, Vice President Mike Pence, as we said, has the keynote slot and is expected to address the growing violence following the recent police shooting of Jacob Blake. How will he address the rising racial tensions? That's right. Well, Pence is going to be speaking at Fort McHenry, where I believe Ben is, um, of course, the inspiration for the Star Spangled Banner. And we're expecting the vice president to take an aggressive kind of attack dog role of the vice presidency against Joe Biden. But other than that, the campaign is not releasing many details about whether they will address all of the big news of the day. Um, remember, we're in the middle of a pandemic and a recession. Today, uh, there is a response uh, to the racial tension and uh, in, in protests in Wisconsin as a result of a police shooting of a black man, uh, to which the NBA is responding in uh, a real powerful way tonight. Not to mention you have a hurricane barreling towards the Gulf Coast. So all of these things are happening um, at a time where the vice president is expected to speak tonight and the third night of the Republican National Convention, and a convention that has largely ignored a lot of these big events, especially um, racial injustice and especially uh, the pandemic. They have been far from mind. In fact, Republicans have been trying to message about kind of the past before all of this happened um, and not really addressing the issues at hand that are coming into really stark views tonight. Yeah, you know, Ben, on that point, so we are now at nearly 180,000 people dead in the United States from the coronavirus. Do we expect Vice President Pence, who is head of the Coronavirus Task Force, to address this more fully? Uh, we do. We expect him to mention coronavirus in his speech, but I'm told that he is not devoting the bulk of his speech to the coronavirus, despite the fact that he is the head of that task force, and that he's going to speak about it in more optimistic tones in terms of touting the accomplishments of the Trump administration when it comes to coronavirus. So don't expect the vice president to get up here and dwell on the number of people that are dead or their number of infections. He wants to focus on how they have responded to it, and they believe they have a good story to tell on that front. But as Caitlin mentioned, a lot of tonight for the vice president here is going to be about symbolism. The reason they're doing this here at Fort McHenry, the site of some major battles during the War of 1812 and the place that inspired the Star Spangled Banner, is because the Trump campaign is trying to tie itself to being the defenders of American heritage. And what better place to do that than the place where the bombs were bursting in air and the flag proved through the night that it was still there? Hmm. All right. 
Well, Caitlin, um, you know, you were, we saw you in Wilmington, Delaware, covering the Democratic National Convention. How would you compare what we've seen so far from the Republican Convention uh, and the Democratic Convention last week? Well, if you're feeling a bit of whiplash after watching last week and watching this week, uh, you're probably not alone, and that's by design. We often see um, a tale of two conventions come out of these two conventions when you have two parties competing against one another. What has been striking to me, though, however, is that both parties have taken a pretty um, grim and, and somber tone, but in very different ways. Last week, we saw the Democrats intensely focused on the pandemic and what they see as pandemics within the pandemic, as it relates to racial injustice, social inequality, and an economy that they say hasn't been working for everyone. That was on full display last week. Uh, with Republicans, you have uh, Republicans portraying a country that is in a state of social unrest unrest, but they have been focusing mostly on the protests that they say are in Democratic-run cities. And they are trying to paint a picture of an America that is uh, very, um, that, that could be uh, very um, in a state of, of, of chaos, they say, under a Biden presidency. But it does raise questions about um, who is in charge here, right? Uh, Republicans last time around uh, had a very similar type of tone, but Trump was running as an insurgent candidate against um, what he was calling a third term of the Obama presidency. Now it's very different. He is in charge, and I think a lot of voters will be asking, what's next? What are you going to do about these things you described? Especially since in 2016, he said that he alone can fix it and that he would be the law and order candidate who would restore law and order. Uh, ben, as we wait for the official start here of night three, we just showed a picture of the White House, which, by the way, is lit in the colors of purple and gold. Uh, as I understand it, uh, the two colors most closely associated with the suffrage movement. Um, I wonder, though, Ben, we saw on night two the trappings of the office of the presidency brought into the Republican convention in a way that we have not seen in conventions before. Have you detected at all from White House officials or campaign officials any sense that they feel they may have overstepped with respect to the staging of the convention. No, they are not giving an inch on that. They basically say that all of this conversation about what's known as the Hatch Act, and for people out there that don't know what that is, that is a federal law that basically says you're not supposed to be campaigning on federal property, uh, which the White House certainly is. We should note the president is not, and the, vice, and the vice president, for that matter, are not actually subject to the Hatch Act. This is federal property here, so obviously uh, the vice president gets a pass on that as well. But it is shattering a norm. But when pressed on that several times today, uh, Mark Meadows, the chief of staff at the White House basically said nobody outside of the Beltway cares about that. Um, I, I think there are some people that might argue with that because it is a law. Um, but to see the, the campaign really used almost every inch of the White House, we have not seen the Oval Office yet, but uh, they have gotten into a lot of rooms of the White House during this and to have a naturalization ceremony in the cross hall, uh, to have the president meeting with hostages in other rooms of the White House um, and the first lady in the Rose Garden. It's been pretty striking and you do kind of wonder going forward, will this become more normalized? Will the sitting president be able to to use the White House and all of that stands for uh, effectively like this during a campaign. Very much an open question right now. All right, Ben Tracy and Caitlin Huey Burns, thank you both very much. And let's go ahead and listen in now to the Republican National Committee's mostly virtual convention. Long before the shots fired at Concord were men and women of remarkable character and fortitude. An extraordinary spirit fueled the dreams they held. That spirit lived on to win liberty in the revolution. It emboldened the underground railroads. It strengthened the brave souls at Normandy. It endured with those who gallantly fought the spread of communism. And on 9-11, that same spirit was found in the men and women storming the gates of death to save precious lives. The spirit of heroism thrives in the presence of tyranny, disaster. It is stronger than any virus. Yet there are those who condemn our heroes, seek to erase history and deconstruct the American ideal 
remake America into something it was never intended to be. But the spirit of heroism stands in the breach. It lives in the heart, it breathes in the soul, and is woven into the courageous fabric of Americans like you. It preserves liberty, it strengthens families, it empowers the extraordinary. The spirit of heroism inspires us to act when others are in need, to do the right thing. Join us tonight. Dream heroic dreams. Celebrate America, land of the free, home of the brave. From Washington, D.C., welcome to the 2020 Republican National Convention. Tonight, celebrating America as the land of heroes. God, we come before you this evening and pray for your divine protection over our brothers and sisters in the path of storms along our Gulf Coast. You are our rock and our shelter in the midst of the storms of life. You are the God who commands the winds and the waves, and we pray that you will provide refuge to our people. O oh Lord, you have granted us certain natural rights such as the right to speak freely, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, as well as religious freedom, the right to assemble, and the right to self-defense. Only in America have these God-given rights so flourished and been categorized as belonging to the people, embodying the very essence of our government. Father, we pray that this outlook and mindset, this form of government continues, as has been our history, especially now when to our horror it is being challenged. And so we pray that God gives strength and health to our president, who has splendidly demonstrated daily his determination to defend and maintain the God-given rights of our citizens as enshrined in our Constitution and in our Declaration, eloquently passed down through our Judeo-Christian tradition. President Trump has stood up fearlessly against those who are corrupting the term social justice so as to deny Americans their birthright and these divine gifts. May God protect him. May God bless all those in government and among our citizens who seek to honor, defend, and preserve our heritage. This land was founded in an epic and providential moment. Like the revelation at Sinai, it was the moment when the vision of God rendezvoused with the soaring and noble plans of appointed men. Yet, every so often, apace various generations, we are compelled to resurrect and give rebirth to our providential beginning to renew our present days with the exuberance of those founding days. Perhaps that is what is meant when we say, make America great again. We pledge to vigilantly protect and tend the garden so as to imbibe its blessed fruits. May God continue to make America great and may we continue to be his people, one nation, under God, and let us say, Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. I'm Governor Christine Ohm of South Dakota. I'm here tonight 
because I believe America is an exceptional nation founded on three principles, equality, freedom, and opportunity. But today, our founding principles are under attack. This year, the choice for Americans is between a man who values these ideals and all that can be built because of them, and a man who isn't guided by these ideals and coincidentally has built nothing. Remember, America's battle for independence and fight for self-governance was something that had never been done before. Men of great intellect and wisdom, like James Madison, the father of our Constitution, hoped our constitutional republic would last for ages, mitigate the problems that would naturally arise from political factions, and prevent tyranny. Madison also authored much of the Bill of Rights because he understood the natural tendency of government to increasingly encroach on the people's consent, and thus, our freedom. He urged his colleagues to adopt these amendments to enshrine in our Constitution the ideals laid out in the Declaration of Independence, that all power comes from the people, that the government is created and ought to be exercised for the benefit of the people. Our Constitution guarantees the right to speak, to assemble, and to worship, the right to arm ourselves as a counterbalance to a standing army, and the right to a fair and equitable criminal justice system. We must fight to protect these foundational rights from government interference and indifference. America is unique in the world. Government's power at all levels is limited to the confines of our Constitution, which protects our God-given liberties and civil rights. We are not and will not be the subjects of an elite class of so-called experts. We, the people, are the government. Now, at times, our country has struggled to live up to our founding principles. Another great American, Abraham Lincoln, knew that struggle better than anybody. When he was just 28 years old, Honest Abe saw wild and furious passions worse than savage mobs, he said, taking the place of reason and judgment. He was alarmed by the increasing disregard for the rule of law throughout the country. He was concerned for the people that had seen their property destroyed, their families attacked, and their lives threatened or even taken away. These good people were becoming tired of and disgusted with a government that offered them no protection. Sound familiar? It took 244 years to build this great nation, flaws and all. But we stand to lose it in a tiny fraction of that time if we continue down the path taken by the Democrats and their radical supporters. From Seattle and Portland to Washington and New York, Democrat-run cities across this country are being overrun by violent mobs. The violence is rampant. There's looting, chaos, destruction, and murder. People that can afford to flee have fled, but the people that can't, good, hard-working Americans are left to fend for themselves. The Republican Party's commitment to individual rights and self-government is as necessary today as it was in 1860 when we won our first presidential election. Our party respects individuals based on who they are. We don't divide people based on their beliefs or their roots. We don't shun people who think for themselves. We respect everyone equally under the Constitution, and we treat them as Martin Luther King Jr. wished, according to the content of their character, not the color of their skin. In just four years, President Trump has lifted people of all races and backgrounds out of poverty. He shrunk government. He put money back into the pockets of hardworking, ordinary Americans. He has advanced religious liberty. He protected the Second Amendment. You can look back 50 years, you won't find anyone that has surpassed President Trump's success on these four issues alone. History chooses its heroes for the time in which they live. At our founding, Madison was one of the chosen. When the nation's very existence was challenged, it was Lincoln's turn. Thanks to these men, America is a land of hope. Their examples have been repeated in countless ways by simple Americans following their conscience. But there is another American hero to be recognized, and that is the common American. This is who President Trump is fighting for, 
He is fighting for you. I'm Scott Dane. I represent loggers and truckers in Minnesota, but I also represent a way of life. Logging has been a part of the great American story from the beginning. In fact, if you go to the Capitol Rotunda and look up, you can see loggers on one of the panels, New England settlers carving out a new world from the wilderness. But logging is the most dangerous job in the country, but we embrace that risk because we know America was built by strong people building things together. America needs us to keep building and we can't wait to be a part of it. But the last time Joe Biden was in the White House, Minnesota lost nearly half of its mills, thousands of jobs, and experienced nearly a decade of decline. It was a similar story in other parts of the country. The administration just didn't seem to care. In 47 years in Washington, Joe Biden hasn't done anything for the timber industry. When plants closed in Duluth, Sartell, Cook, and Bemidji, they were just numbers on a paper to the Obama-Biden administration. To me, they were people and jobs and families. Under Obama-Biden, radical environmentalists were allowed to kill the forest. Wildfire after wildfire shows the consequences. Managed forests, the kind my people work in, are healthy forests. Under President Trump, we've seen a new recognition of the value of forest management in reducing wildfires and we've seen new support for our way of life, where a strong back and a strong work ethic can build a strong middle class. We want to build families where we were raised and stand by communities that stood by us. We want that way of life available for the next generation, and we want our force there too. President Trump, thank you for helping us do just that. I'm U.S. Senator Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee. America is a nation of heroes. In times of difficulty, we're reminded that they're all around us. They're in the line with us at the grocery store, in the pew with us at church. They're the regular Americans who step up to volunteer and serve when we need them most. They've stood at the forefront throughout this pandemic. The emergency room nurses who go back shift after shift, the medical researchers developing a vaccine and therapies to combat what the Chinese Communist regime unleashed on the world. Cookville's Double Springs Church of Christ members lifting our country up in prayer and providing for those impacted by tragedy. But tonight, I want to talk to you about another kind of hero, the kind Democrats don't recognize because they don't fit into their narrative. I'm talking about the heroes of our law enforcement and armed services. Leftists try to turn them into villains. They want to cancel them. But I'm here to tell you these heroes can't be canceled. Tennessee is full of them. After all, we're the volunteer state. My dad served in the Army in World War II. When he came home, he put on another uniform and for 30 years volunteered to help our underfunded sheriff's department. I'm reminded of him whenever I see compassion and selflessness in others. When I see law enforcement officers put their lives on the line every single day to keep our community safe, in spite of the hatred thrown at them. When I see the heroes who volunteer to serve our country putting their lives on the line for our freedom, 
Many of these heroes call Tennessee home, and we could not be more proud of the brave men and women of the 101st Airborne Division at Fort Campbell. The common thread between them is a deep-seated desire to serve a cause larger than themselves. They don't believe their country owes them anything. They believe they owe their country and their fellow man. As hard as Democrats try, they can't cancel our heroes. They can't contest their bravery. And they can't dismiss the powerful sense of service that lives deep in their souls. So, they tried to defund them, our military, our police, even ICE, to take away their tools to keep us safe. Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and their radical allies try to destroy these heroes because if there are no heroes to inspire us, government can control us. They close our churches, but keep the liquor stores and abortion clinics open. They say we can't gather in community groups, but encourage protests, riots, and looting in the streets. If the Democrats had their way, they would keep you locked in your house until you become dependent on the government for everything. That sounds a lot like communist China to me. Maybe that's why Joe Biden is so soft on them. Why Nancy Pelosi says that China would prefer Joe Biden. Yep, I bet they would. But President Trump has stood up for our heroes every day. He stood by our law enforcement, our military, and the freedoms we hold dear. He's made good on his promise to put America first. And I hope you will stand with me as we send him back for four more years with a clear message to the Democrats. You will never cancel our heroes. Hi, I'm Congressman Dan Crenshaw. Eight years ago in the fields of Helmand Province, Afghanistan, a close friend and teammate laid down cover fire against Taliban insurgents so that I could walk, blind and bloodied, to the medevac helicopter and survive. But he didn't. Dave Worson was killed two months later. He died a hero to this great country. Here's the truth about America. We are a country of heroes. I believe that, so should you. We are a people with a common set of ideals conceived in liberty. People that have sacrificed time and again for our freedom and the freedom of others. That's something no other country ever, anywhere, can claim. Since 9-11, I've seen America's heroes up close. Some of them saved my life. Some of them saved many others' lives. Many of them never made it home. These heroes acted as if the whole struggle depended on them alone, as if any weakness on their part would be a reflection of the whole nation. That's called duty. And America has a long history of it. Our enemies fear us because Americans fight for good, and we know it. It gives us strength. When our heroes are trusted and equipped, then freedom prevails. The defeat of ISIS was the result of America believing in our heroes, our president having their backs and rebuilding our military so we'd have what we needed to finish the mission. The cowering of the Iranian regime and the restoration of the deterrence once lost is the result of America believing in her own might again. But America's heroism isn't relegated to the battlefield. Every single day we see them, if you just know where to look. It's the nurse who volunteers for back-to-back -back shifts caring for COVID patients because she feels that's her duty. It's the parent who will relearn algebra because there's no way they're letting their kid fall behind while schools are closed. And it's the cop that gets spit on one day and will save a child's life the next. America is the country where the young military wife with two young children answers the unexpected knock at the door looks the man in uniform in the eye, and even as her whole world comes crashing down, she stands up straight, she holds back tears, and takes care of her family, because she must. This is what heroism looks like. It's who we are, nation of heroes, 
We need you now more than ever. We need to remind ourselves what heroism really is. Heroism is self-sacrifice. It's not moralizing and lecturing over others when they disagree. Heroism is grace, not perpetual outrage. Heroism is rebuilding our communities, not destroying them. Heroism is renewing faith in the symbols that unite us, not tearing them down. You see, America is a fabric. It's woven from the threads of history's best stories, best attributes, and greatest ideas. The American spirit reflects the oldest and most important virtues, self-sacrifice, courage, tolerance, love of country, grace, and passion for human achievement. We can decide right now that American greatness will not be rejected nor squandered. As the American founding was grounded in individual liberty, so will be our future. But if we are to rediscover our strength, then it must be an endeavor undertaken by each and every one of us. We must become the heroes that we so admire. America was built by them, and our future will be protected by them. It will be protected by you. So God bless America. Good evening. I'm retired Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg. In 1967, at the age of 22, I volunteered to serve my country in Vietnam. From the jungles of Vietnam to the deserts of Iraq, I have gone where my nation asked. I have borne witness to soldiers' last moments on earth, their lives spent in hope and promise of a better future for all Americans. I was in the Pentagon on September 11, 2001. I lost friends there that day. In the years that followed, I watched my daughter, son, and son-in-law deploy to Afghanistan. I have looked into the eyes of my grandchildren as they said goodbye to their fathers and hugged them one last time. I lived service. I understand sacrifice. I know leadership. Over the past three and a half years, I have witnessed every major foreign policy and national security decision by the president. I have been in the room where it happened. I saw only one agenda and one guiding question when tough calls had to be made. Is this decision right for America? When President Donald Trump took office, decades of failed foreign policy had crippled us. He faced wars without end in sight, creation of failed states like Libya and Syria, a past that allowed a terrorist caliphate to grow, and leadership in Washington that allowed our military to atrophy while we spent trillions of dollars abroad instead of investing at home. President Trump has reversed the decline of our military and restructured our national security strategy. With historic investment and vision, our military is now better equipped, better resourced, and better manned than any military in the world. President Trump demolished the terrorist ISIS caliphate in the Middle East and eliminated its leader, al-Baghdadi, one of the world's most brutal terrorists. President Trump took decisive action against Iranian terrorist mastermind, Qasem Soleimani, a man responsible for deaths of hundreds of American servicemen in Iraq. When our NATO allies failed to meet their commitments as we upheld ours, President Trump demanded parity. NATO members have now increased their contributions over $100 billion this year, and NATO's Secretary General credits President Donald J. Trump. President Trump challenged and continues to challenge an ever increasingly provocative and militant China. But make no mistake, President Trump is no hawk. He wisely wields the sword when required, but believes in seeking peace instead of perpetual conflict. Just over a week ago, our president brokered a peace agreement between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, the first in the Middle East in over 25 years. And this week, Afghan negotiators, with help from American officials, 
will start peace negotiations between the Taliban and the Afghan government to end America's longest war. Ask yourself, has this president kept his promises to keep us out of needless conflicts and to pursue ending wars without end? Has he defended your interests in renegotiating trade deals that previously hurt Americans in our national security? Has he fulfilled his commander in chief role by decisively going after our nation's enemies? You and I know the answer is yes. The choice is clear. This is the most important election of our lifetime. The next four years will decide the course of our country for decades to come. I am asking you to stand up and be counted so we never have to look back and recall what it was once like in America when men and women were free, our families were secure, and we had a president who served the people. God bless America. Thank you and good night. Good evening. My name is Tara Myers. Tonight, I am here as a wife and mother to share how education freedom has personally impacted my family, especially the life of my son, Samuel. Before Samuel was even born, I was told his life wouldn't be worth living. When early tests revealed he had Down syndrome, our doctor encouraged me to terminate the pregnancy. He said, if you do not, you will be burdening your life, your family, and your community. I knew my baby was a human being created by God, and that made him worthy of life. I am thankful that President Trump values the life of the unborn. When we went to register Samuel for kindergarten, we were told to just put him where he would be comfortable. Don't stress him out by trying to teach him. When we pushed for him to attend his neighborhood school with his sisters, we were told, just go home and let us do what we do. When I inquired about functional learning, I was told, this is all you get, like it or not. Well, I did not like it. One size did not fit all. So I helped fight to pass legislation in Ohio for a special needs scholarship so that all students could choose the right program for their needs. I worked to start a new functional learning program at our local private school. Finally, Samuel had an appropriate place to learn. Last December, Samuel was invited to the White House to meet our president and share his thoughts on education freedom. He said, school choice helped my dreams come true. My school taught me the way I learn best. I was able to fit in. I made many friends. I became a part of my community. My teachers helped me become the best I can be. President Trump shook my hand and said, wonderful job, mom. Your son is amazing. Unlike the doctor who told me to end Samuel's life before it even began, President Trump did not dismiss my son. He showed Samuel he valued him and was proud of what he accomplished. President Trump gave Samuel an equal seat at the table. Tonight, I would like to extend my thanks to President Trump and his administration for their work towards making every student's dream of a meaningful education a reality and for fighting to ensure every child in America has an equal seat at the table of education freedom and an equal opportunity in life. Thank you, and may God bless America. It all started at a tea party. 
13 years before the American Civil War. Civil unrest and division separated countrymen into two opposing camps. One determined to keep African American people enslaved, the other determined to see all people free. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott felt the call to fight for that freedom when they were selected as delegates for an anti-slavery convention. But upon arrival, were told they could not speak or vote at the male-dominated event. On July 9, 1848, Mott, Stanton, and three other women met for tea. By the end of the day, they'd formed a coalition with the sole purpose of gaining the right for women to vote, so they in turn would be free to fight for the freedoms of others. Women across America united and formed activist groups working tirelessly to win the vote for American women. The unconquerable Susan B. Anthony became one of the most visible leaders of women's suffrage when, in 1872, she registered and voted for every Republican on the ballot. As punishment for her actions, she was arrested for illegal voting. At the request of Susan B. Anthony, Senator A.A. A. Sargent introduced the 19th Amendment in 1878. The Susan B. Anthony Amendment was submitted and defeated four times, but women continued to fight. Sojourner Truth and many other black suffragettes defied segregation, fighting for all women's voices to be heard and allowed to vote. For the two years prior to ratification, the silent sentinels quietly picketed the White House. Finally, when Republicans regained control of Congress. On August 26, 1920, the Equal Suffrage Amendment was signed into law. Women's suffrage movement took 72 years and would change the lives of women forever. The victory was achieved peacefully through the valiant efforts of women patriots and the democratic process. 100 years later, in a bold declaration of rights for women, President Trump granted a full pardon to Susan B. Anthony on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment's ratification. Women's suffrage was born from a desire to fight for the freedom of others. Now, we, the great patriots of America, will band together once again, and with one unified voice, we will vote for freedom. I'm Kaylee McEnany. You may know me as a supporter of President Trump, but tonight I'm here to share with you how he supported me, both as a new mom and as an American with a pre-existing condition. When I was 21 years old, I got a call that changed my life. It was my doctor informing me that I had tested positive for the BRCA2 genetic mutation, a mutation that put my chances of breast cancer at 84%. It was the same mutation that my mom had, compelling her to get a preventative double mastectomy, removing her breast tissue, but protecting her from a disease that has taken far too many of our mothers, our sisters, our friends. In my family, eight women alone were diagnosed with breast cancer, several in their young 20s. I now faced the same prospect. For nearly a decade, I was routinely at Moffitt Cancer Center, getting MRIs, ultrasounds, and necessary surveillance. During these visits, I crossed paths with brave women battling cancer and fighting through chemotherapy. They were a testament to American strength. They are American heroes. On May 1st, 2018, I followed in my mother's footsteps, choosing to get a preventative mastectomy. I was scared. The night before, I fought back tears as I prepared to lose a piece of myself forever. But the next day, with my mom, dad, husband, and Jesus Christ by my side, I underwent a mastectomy, almost eliminating my chance of breast cancer, a decision I now celebrate. Breast reconstruction has advanced remarkably. While it is an individual's decision, my doctor and I chose a course of surgery that left me virtually unchanged. 
but more important than physical results. I developed a strength and a confidence that I carry with me. During one of my most difficult times, I expected to have the support of my family, but I had more support than I knew. As I came out of anesthesia, one of the first calls I received was from Ivanka Trump. As I recovered, my phone rang again. It was President Trump calling to check on me. I was blown away. Here was the leader of the free world caring about my circumstance. At the time, I had only met President Trump on a few occasions. But now I know him well, and I can tell you that this president stands by Americans with pre-existing conditions. In fact, President Trump called me this morning, I spoke with him several times today, and he told me how proud he was of me for sharing this story. The same way President Trump has supported me, he supports you. I see it every day. I've heard him say the hardest part of his job is writing to loved ones of fallen soldiers. I've seen him offer heartfelt outreach to grieving parents who lost their children to crime in the streets. And I've watched him fight for Americans who lost their jobs. President Trump fights for the American people because he cares about stories like these. I have a nine-month-old daughter. She's a beautiful, sweet little girl. And I choose to work for this president for her. When I look into my baby's eyes, I see a new life, a miracle for which I have a solemn responsibility to protect. That means protecting America's future, a future President Trump will fight for, where our neighborhoods are protected, where life is sacred, where God is cherished, not taken out of our schools, removed from our pledge, and erased from our history. I want my daughter to grow up in President Donald J. Trump's America. Choosing to have a preventative mastectomy was the hardest decision I ever had to make. But supporting President Trump, who will protect my daughter and our children's future, was the easiest. Good evening. I'm Karen Pence. My husband is Vice President Mike Pence. 100 years ago today, the 19th Amendment was adopted into the United States Constitution, guaranteeing women the right to vote. Because of heroes like Susan B. Anthony and Lucy Stone, women today, like our daughters, Audrey and Charlotte, and future generations will have their voices heard and their votes count. The women's suffrage movement was the gateway that led to women having the opportunities to achieve monumental milestones and accomplish significant achievements in both civic and governmental roles. This evening, we look at heroes in our land. As second lady of the United States for the past three and a half years, I have had the honor of meeting many heroes across this great country. The Pences are a military family. Our son Michael serves in the United States Marines and our son-in-law Henry serves in the U.S. Navy. And one of my key initiatives is to elevate and encourage military spouses. These men and women, like our daughter Charlotte and our daughter-in-law Sarah, are the home front heroes. I have been privileged to hear so many stories of selfless support, volunteer spirit, and great contributions to the armed forces and our communities. You know, military spouses may experience frequent moves and job changes, periods of being a single parent while their loved one is deployed, all while exhibiting pride, strength, and determination 
and being a part of something bigger than themselves. To all of the military spouses, thank you. President Trump and Vice President Pence have been supporting our United States Armed Forces, including our military families, on a significant scale. While traveling throughout our nation to educate military spouses about policy solutions that President Trump has promoted involving real, tangible progress in military spouse employment, I have been inspired to meet heroes like Lisa Bradley and Cameron Cruz. These military spouses decided to start their own business, R. Riveter, named after the Rosie the Riveter campaign used to recruit women workers during World War II. R. Riveter makes beautiful handbags designed and manufactured exclusively by military spouses. And many of those spouses live all over the country. They prepare and send their section of the bags to the company located in North Carolina where the final product is assembled. Military spouse hero Jalan Hall Johnson in Billings, Montana is a culinary artist who had dreamed of starting her own restaurant. Working with the Small Business Administration's Development Center, Jalan started her restaurant, The Sassy Biscuit and she just opened a second restaurant in Dover, New Hampshire. And as the second lady, I've also been able to bring awareness to a form of therapy for our heroic veterans suffering from PTSD. Art therapy, facilitated by a professional art therapist, is especially effective with post-traumatic stress disorder. Master Gunnery Sergeant Chris Stowe, a Marine veteran I met in Tampa who deployed for combat in Iraq and Afghanistan, said nothing had helped him deal with the trauma from his service in the Marines until he finally agreed to meet with the art therapist at Walter Reed Medical Center. Chris credits art therapy with saving his marriage and his life. And Chris went on to establish a glass blowing workshop to help other vets. Many of our veteran heroes struggle as they transition back into civilian life, and sometimes the stress is too difficult to manage alone. A few weeks ago, I had the honor of speaking with some amazing Americans who answer the veteran's crisis line. One in particular, Sydney Morgan, especially impacted me. A veteran herself, Sydney said it is the highest honor of her life until they physically walk into a clinic to receive help they deserve and she can pass their hand to someone ready to help. In these difficult times, we've all seen so many examples of everyday Americans reaching out a hand to those in need, those who in humility have considered others more important than themselves. We've seen healthcare workers, teachers, first responders, mental health providers, law enforcement officers, grocery and delivery workers, and farmers, and so many others, heroes all. 100 years ago, women secured the right to vote. So let's vote, America. Let's honor our heroes. Let's reelect President Trump and Vice President Pence for four more years. God bless our heroes and God bless the United States of America. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Good evening, I'm Kellyanne Conway. 100 years ago, courageous warriors helped women secure the right to vote. This has been a century worth celebrating, but also a reminder that our democracy is young and fragile. A woman in a leadership role can still seem novel. Not so for President Trump. 
For decades, he has elevated women to senior positions in business and in government. He confides in and consults us, respects our opinions, and insists that we are on equal footing with the men. President Trump helped me shatter a barrier in the world of politics by empowering me to manage his campaign to its successful conclusion. With the help of millions of Americans, our team defied the critics, the naysayers, the conventional wisdom, and we won. For many of us, women's empowerment is not a slogan. It comes not from strangers on social media or sanitized language in a corporate handbook. It comes from the everyday heroes who nurture us, who shape us, and who believe in us. I was raised in a household of all women. They were self-reliant and resilient. Their lives were not easy, but they never complained. Money was tight, but we had an abundance of what mattered most, family, faith, and freedom. I learned that in America, limited means does not make for limited dreams. The promise of America belongs to us all. This is a land of inventors and innovators, of entrepreneurs and educators, of pioneers and parents, each contributing to the success and the future of a great nation and her people. These everyday heroes have a champion in President Trump, the teacher who took extra time to help students adjust to months of virtual learning, the nurse who finished a 12-hour COVID shift and then took a brief break only to change her mask, gown, and gloves to do it all over again. The small business owner striving to reopen after the lockdown was lifted and then again after her store was vandalized and looted. The single mom with two kids, two jobs, two commutes, who 10 years after that empty promise finally has health insurance. President Trump and Vice President Pence have lifted Americans, provided them with dignity, opportunity, and results. I have seen firsthand many times the president comforting and encouraging a child who has lost a parent, a parent who has lost a child, a worker who lost his job, an adolescent who lost her way to drugs. Don't lose hope, he has told them, assuring them that they are not alone and that they matter. There always will be people who have far more than us. Our responsibility is to focus on those who have far less than us. President Trump has done precisely that in taking unprecedented action to combat this nation's drug crisis. He told me, this is so important, Kellyanne. So many lives have been ruined by addiction and will never even know it because people are ashamed to reach out for help and they're not even sure who to turn to in their toughest hour. Rather than look the other way, President Trump stared directly at this drug crisis next door and through landmark bipartisan legislation has helped secure historic investments in surveillance, interdiction, education, prevention, treatment, and recovery. We have a long way to go, but the political inertia that costs lives and the silence and the stigma that prevents people in need from coming forward is melting away. This is the man I know and the president we need for four more years. He picks the toughest fights and tackles the most complex problems. He has stood by me and he will stand up for you. In honor of the women who empowered me and for the future of the children we all cherish, thank you and God bless you always. Good evening. I'm Sister Dee Dee Byrne, 
and I belong to the community of the little workers of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary. Last 4th of July, I was honored to be one of the President's guests at his Salute to America celebration. I must confess that I recently prayed while in chapel, begging God to allow me to be a voice and instrument for human life. And now here I am, speaking at the Republican National Convention. I guess you better be careful for what you pray for. My journey to religious life was not a traditional route, if there is such a thing. In 1978, as a medical stu school student at Georgetown University, I joined the Army to help pay for my tuition and ended up devoting 29 years to the military, serving as a doctor and a surgeon in places like Afghanistan and Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. After much prayer and contemplation, I entered my religious order in 2002, working to serve the poor and the sick in Haiti, Sudan, Kenya, Iraq, and in Washington, D.C. Humility is at the foundation of our order, which makes it very difficult to talk about myself. But I can speak about my experience working for those fleeing war-torn and impoverished countries all around the world. Those refugees all share a common experience. They have been all marginalized, viewed as insignificant, powerless, and voiceless. And while we tend to think of the marginalized as living beyond our borders, the truth is the largest marginalized group in the world can be found here in the United States. They are the unborn. As Christians, we first met Jesus as a stirring embryo in the womb of an unwed mother and saw him born nine months later in the poverty of the cave. It's no coincidence that Jesus stood up for what was just and was un ultimately crucified because what he said wasn't politically correct or fashionable. As followers of Christ, we are called to stand up for life against the politically correct or fashionable of today. We must fight against a legislative agenda that supports and even celebrates destroying life in the womb. Keep in mind the laws we create define how we see our humanity. And we must ask ourselves, what are we saying when we go into a womb and snuff out an innocent, powerless, voiceless life? As a physician, I can say without hesitation, life begins at conception. While what I have to say may be difficult for some to hear, I am saying it because I'm not just pro-life, I'm pro-eternal life, and I want all of us to end up in heaven together someday. Which brings me to why I'm here today. Donald Trump is the most pro-life president that this nation has ever had, defending life at all stages. His belief in the sanctity of life transcends politics. President Trump will stand up against Biden-Harris, who are the most anti-life presidential ticket ever, even supporting the horrors of late-term abortion and infanticide. Because of his courage and conviction, President Trump has earned the support of America's pro-life community. Moreover, he has a nationwide of religious standing behind him. You'll find us here with our weapon of choice, the rosary. So thank you, Mr. President. We are all praying for you. I'm Lou Holtz. Many of you might know me as Coach Holt, or maybe that football guy. It is a pleasure, a blessing, and an honor for me to explain why I believe that President Trump is a consistent winner, an outstanding leader, and deserves to be reelected as our president. First, I want you to know that I grew up in a one-bedroom house in West Virginia. I may have been poor, but the lessons my parents taught me were priceless. They taught me that life is about making choices. Wherever you are, good or bad, don't blame anyone else. Go get an education, get to work. You can overcome any obstacles. And always remember that in this great country of ours, anyone can amount to something special. I lived by those principles of hard work and responsibility my whole life living out the American story, and it works. But there are people today, like politicians, professors,
protesters, and of course, President Trump's naysayers in the media who like to blame others for problems. They don't have pride in our country. And because they no longer ask, what can I do for my country? Only what the country should be doing for them. They don't have pride in themselves. That's wrong. When I was an officer in the Army, I served with so many great Americans who embraced their responsibility to our country. I'm so proud of their sacrifices and the opportunity it has provided for so many millions. America remains a land of opportunity, no matter what the other side says or believes. You know, there's a statue of me at Notre Dame. I guess they needed a place for the pigeons to land. But if you look closely, you will see these three words there, trust, commitment, and love. All my life, I've made my choices based on these three words. I use these three rules to make choices about everything. My beloved wife of 59 years, athletes I coached, and of course, politicians, even President Trump. I ask myself three things. One, can I trust them? When a leader tells you something, you gotta be able to count on it. That's President Trump. He says what he means, he means what he says. And he's done what he said he would do at every single turn. One of the important reasons he has my trust is because nobody has been a stronger advocate for the unborn than President Trump. The Biden-Harris ticket is the most radically pro-abortion campaign in history. They and other politicians are Catholics in name only and abandon innocent lives. President Trump protects those lives. I trust President Trump. The second question I ask is, are they committed to doing their very best? President Trump always finds a way to get something done. If you want to do something bad enough, you will find a way. If not, you'll find an excuse. And excuses are a lot easier to find than solutions. President Trump finds solutions. President Trump is committed. And the third question I ask, is do they love people? Do they care about others? To me, this is very clear. President Trump has demonstrated through his prison reform, advocating for school choice and welfare reform, that he wants Americans from all walks of life to have the opportunity to succeed and live the American dream. President Trump loves our country and our great people. Trust, commitment, and love. In President Trump, we have a president we can trust, who works hard at making America greater, and who genuinely cares about people. If I apply this test to Joe Biden, I can't say yes to any of these three questions. I used to ask our athletes at Notre Dame, if you did not show up, who would miss you and why? Can you imagine what would happen to us if President Trump had not shown up in 2016 to run for president, I'm so glad he showed up. Thank you for showing up, Mr. President. I encourage everyone who loves this country, who loves America, to show up in November for President Trump. Thank you. Hi. I'm Michael McHale, but my friends call me Mick. I'm a 30-year active duty member of law enforcement in the state of Florida. I am also the president of the National Association of Police Organizations, NAPO. Our organization recently endorsed Donald Trump for re-election as president of the United States. Our endorsement recognized his strong support for the men and women on the front lines, particularly during these challenging times. We value his support of aggressive federal prosecution of those who attack our police officers. His signing of the Law Enforcement Mental Health and Wellness Act and his support for permanently authorizing funds to support 9-11 first responders and their families. 
Law enforcement officers across the nation take an oath to run towards danger when everyone else is running away. They do so willingly to protect our families and communities. I'm proud that the overwhelming majority of American police officers are the best of the best and put their lives on the line without hesitation. And good officers need to know their elected leaders and the department brass have their backs. Unfortunately, chaos results when failed officials in cities like Portland, Minneapolis, Chicago, and New York make the conscious decision not to support law enforcement. Shootings, murders, looting, and rioting occur unabated. The violence and bloodshed we are seeing in these and other cities isn't happening by chance. It's the direct result of refusing to allow law enforcement to protect our communities. Joe Biden has turned his candidacy over to the far left anti-law enforcement radicals. And as a senator, Kamala Harris pushed to further restrict police, cut their training, and make our American communities and streets even more dangerous than they already are. Conversely, President Trump supports the creation of a national standard for training on de-escalation and communication to give officers more tools to resolve conflict without violence. The differences between Trump, Pence, and Biden-Harris are crystal clear. Your choices are the most pro-law enforcement president we've ever had or the most radical anti-police ticket in history. We invite those who value the safety of their family and loved ones to join the hundreds of thousands of members of the National Association of Police Organizations and support the re-election of President Donald J. Trump. Thank you, and God bless America. Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, and I am honored to represent New York's 21st Congressional District, the cradle of the American Revolution. It's where almost 250 years ago, brave patriots fought in the battles of Saratoga to turn the tide of the Revolutionary War. It's where 40 years ago in Lake Placid, a team of amateur hockey players out-hustled, out-skated, and defeated the Soviet Union, stunning the world and giving us the unforgettable miracle on ice. And today, it's home to Fort Drum and the historic 10th Mountain Division, the most deployed unit in the U.S. Army Army since 9-11, where I saw firsthand President Trump graciously thank and honor our men and women in uniform and sign the largest pay raise for our troops in a decade. Since our nation's founding, generation after generation of everyday Americans served and sacrificed to preserve and strengthen the American dream, the vision of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and the idea that if you work hard and dream big, you can achieve anything you imagine. I believe in the American dream because I've lived it. Like millions of Americans, I grew up in a small business family where I learned the values of hard work and determination. I was the first person in my immediate family to graduate from college, ran for Congress to serve upstate New York, and am proudly the youngest Republican woman elected to Congress in history. I am honored to support President Trump for re-election because I know that he is the only candidate who will stand up for hardworking families and protect the American dream for future generations. Since his first day in office, President Trump has fought tirelessly to deliver results for all Americans, despite the Democrats' baseless and illegal impeachment sham and the media's endless obsession with it. I was proud to lead the effort standing up for the Constitution, President Trump, and most importantly, the American people.
This attack was not just on the president. It was an attack on you, your voice and your vote. But the American people were not swayed by these partisan attacks. Our support for President Trump is stronger than ever before. We know what's at stake in this historic election. Americans from all walks of life are unified in support of our president. It's why more Republican women than ever are running for office this year. We understand that this election is a choice between the far-left democratic socialist agenda versus protecting and preserving the American dream. President Trump is working to safely reopen our Main Street economy. He understands that the engine of our country is fueled by the ingenuity and determination of American workers, entrepreneurs, and small businesses. Joe Biden wants to keep them locked up in the basement and crush them with $4 trillion in new taxes. We face a critical choice. Joe Biden's far-left failed policies of the past 47 years, or President Trump, who will stand up for the American people and the Constitution. I believe in the wisdom and spirit of the American people to elect the only candidate who is capable of protecting the American dream, President Donald J. Trump. Thank you to the North Country for the opportunity to serve as your voice supporting his reelection. God bless the United States of America, the greatest country on earth. Good evening, I'm Madison Cawthorn, and I'm running to represent North Carolina's 11th Congressional District. This is a time of great adversity for our country. And I know something about adversity. At 18 years old, I was in a horrific car accident that's left me paralyzed from the waist down. Instantly, my hopes and dreams were seemingly destroyed. I was given a 1% chance of surviving. But thanks to the power of prayer, a very loving community and many skilled doctors, I made it. It took me over a year to recover. My first public outing in a wheelchair was to a professional baseball game. You know, before my accident, I was six foot three. I stood out in a crowd. But as I wheeled through the stadium, I felt invisible. At 20, I thought about giving up. However, I knew I could still make a difference. You know, my accident has given me new eyes to see and new ears to hear. God protected my mind and my ability to speak. So I say to people who feel forgotten, ignored and invisible, I see you. I hear you. At 20, I made a choice. In 2020, our country has a choice. We can give up on the American idea or we can work together to make our imperfect union more perfect. I choose to fight for the future, to seize the high ground and retake the shining city on a hill. While the radical left wants to dismantle, defund and destroy, Republicans under President Trump's leadership want to rebuild, restore and renew. I just turned 25. When I'm elected this November, I'll be the youngest member of Congress in over 200 years. And if you don't think young people can change the world, then you just don't know American history. George Washington was 21 when he received his first military commission. Abe Lincoln, 22 when he first ran for office. And my personal favorite, James Madison, was just 25 years old when he signed the Declaration of Independence. In times of peril, Young people have stepped up and saved this country, abroad and at home. We held the line, scaled the cliffs, crossed oceans, liberated camps, and cracked codes. Yet today, political forces want to usher in the digital dark ages, a time of information without wisdom and tribalism without truth. National leaders on the left have normalized emotion-based voting and a radicalized identity politics that rejects Martin Luther King's dream. MLK's dream is our dream. For all Americans to be judged solely on their character. Millions of people risk their lives every year to come here because they believe in the dream of MLK and the American dream. Join us as we, the party of freedom, double down on ensuring the American dream for all people. We are committed to building a new town square. It welcomes all ideas and all people. 
Here we will have freedom of speech, not freedom from speech, to liberals. I say let's have a conversation. Be a true liberal. Listen to other ideas and let the best ones prevail. And to conservatives, I say let's define what we support and win the argument in areas like health care and on the environment. In this new town square, you don't have to apologize for your beliefs or cower to a mob. You can kneel before God but stand for our flag. The American idea my ancestors fought for during the Revolutionary War is just as exciting and revolutionary today as it was 250 years ago. I say to Americans who love our country, young and old, be a radical for freedom. Be a radical for liberty. And be a radical for our republic, for which I stand, one nation under God, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and may God bless America. I'm Jack Brewer, a former three-time NFL team captain, college professor, coach, husband, son, and father. I'm also a lifelong Democrat, but I support Donald Trump. Let me be clear, I didn't come here for the popularity or the praise, the likes or the retweets. I'm here as a servant to God, a servant to the people of our nation, and a servant to our president. I grew up in Grapevine, Texas a town that my great-grandfather was the first black man to settle as a sharecropper in 1896. My early high school experience included fighting with skinheads and being in witness in an attempted murder trial after my friend shot a skinhead in self-defense. I remember my dad's bravery when he personally stood up against a KKK rally in my town. In my house, my father taught me to back down from no one. I know what racism looks like. I've seen it firsthand. In America, it has no resemblance to President Trump. And I'm fed up with the way he's portrayed in the media, who refuse to acknowledge what he's actually done for the black community. It's confusing the minds of our innocent children. Before I left to come deliver this message, my energetic eight-year-old son Jackson stopped me and said, Dad, can you please just tell everyone that all lives need to matter? and that God loves everyone. In that moment, I realized that my eight-year-old had figured out what so many adults have seemed to forget. We are not as divided as our politics suggest. At some point, for the sake of our children, the policies must take priority over the personalities. So because you have an issue with President Trump's tone, you're going to allow Biden and Harris to, to deny our underserved black and brown children school choice? Are we so offended by the president's campaign slogan, Make America Great Again, that we're going to ignore that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have collectively been responsible for locking up countless black men for nonviolent crimes? Are you going to allow the media to lie to you? by falsely claiming that he said there were very fine white supremacists in Charlottesville? He didn't say that. It's a lie. And ignore the so-called Black Lives Matter organization that openly, on their website, calls for the destruction of the nuclear family. My fellow Americans, our families need each other. We need black fathers in the homes with their wives and children. The future of our communities depend on it. I'm blessed to be able to run inner city youth programs and to also teach in prisons across America. The inmates in my federal prison program literally receive days off their sentence just for attending my class. And that's thanks to President Donald Trump and his first step back. President Trump cared about these Americans and their families, even when so many others had left them behind and had written them off. I'm forever grateful for President Trump for that. He endures relentless attacks, and so do many of us, like myself, who support him. But my mom always told me, when the Lord starts blessing, the devil starts messing. This convention marks a time to celebrate our history. Republicans, 
are the party that freed the slaves and the party that put the first black men and women in Congress. It's the party of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, and now Tim Scott and Donald Trump. Our president has made incredible strides to end mass incarceration and give unprecedented opportunities for black in America to rise. America, let this election be a call for all God's people who are called by his name to humble ourselves and pray together and to seek his face and to turn from our wicked ways. Then he will hear us from heaven and he will forgive our sins and he will heal our land. Amen and God bless America. Greetings. My name is Chen Guangcheng. Standing up to tyranny is not easy, I know. When I spoke out against China's one-child policy and other injustices, I was prosecuted, beaten, sent to prison, and put under house arrest by the Chinese Communist Party the CCP. In April 2005, 2012, I escaped and was given shelter in the American Embassy in Beijing. I'm forever grateful to the American people for welcoming me and my family to the United States where we are now free. The CCP is an enemy of humanity. It is terrorizing its own people, and it is threatening the well-being of the world. In China, expressing beliefs or ideas not approved by the CCP Religion, democracy, human rights can lead to prison. The nation lives under mass surveillance and censorship. The U.S. must use its values of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law to gather a coalition of other democracies to stop CCP's aggression. President Trump had led on this, and we need the other countries to join him in this fight, a fight for our future. Standing up to fight unfairness isn't easy, I know. So does President Trump, but he has shown the courage to win that fight. We need to support, vote, and fight for President Trump for the sake of the world. Thank you. I'm Congressman Lee Zeldin. Tonight, as we celebrate America as a land of heroes, I'm here at a VFW post of heroes in West Hampton Beach, New York. I've seen amazing Americans in action, raised in a law enforcement family, deployed to Iraq as an 82nd Airborne Paratrooper, and serving today in the Army Reserve. My generation of post 9-11 veterans has huge shoes to fill following our greatest generation that fought tyranny and saved the world. All over our country, everyday heroes serve and sacrifice for the greater good. Farmers, truckers, craftsmen, these heroes keep America running, and President Trump fights for them every day. 
This year, we've especially relied on one particular group of heroes, frontline medical workers. My twin daughters, Michaela and Ariana, were born over 14 weeks early. They weighed just a pound and a half. At two weeks, Michaela went into septic shock, had a stroke, and underwent brain surgery, leaving a third of the left side of her brain a hole. Her doctors didn't believe Michaela would survive, fearing dire permanent consequences even if she did. Through the miracles of modern medicine, power of prayer, and her will to live, my daughters are now starting high school and doing great with no long-term effects from those frightful months in the NICU. So when I learned my county's PPE stockpile was depleted, I immediately thought of those healthcare workers who saved my baby girls. Jerry Kushner and I were on the phone late into that Saturday night. The very next day, President Trump announced he was sending us 200,000 N95 masks. He actually delivered almost 400,000. That number quickly grew to 1.2 million, masks, gowns, and more. The president sent thousands of ventilators to New York. He deployed the USS Comfort and converted the Javits Center to a field hospital. His administration authorized our lab testing requests at blinding speed. During a once in a century pandemic, an unforeseeable crisis sent to us from a faraway land, the president's effort for New York was phenomenal. For our nation to emerge even stronger, more prosperous, freer, and more secure than ever, to make our country greater than ever before, we must reelect President Trump. We are the land of the free because of the brave. And we are the land of opportunity because we have a president who wants to empower the best of who we are to be the best of what we can be. There's never been a nation greater than ours, never a people more resilient than ours, and never a future for America more promising than ours right now. Keeping America great is up to us, and losing is not an option. proud, very proud to have President Trump in office here. He's the best we've ever had. He's done the most for any, any president ever has done. He's always there trying to take care of veterans, giving veterans what they need. The turnaround times have increased since Trump has taken over. Take, you had to fight 15 years for benefits, but once he came into office, you had like 90 days, you turned your paperwork in, at least you had some kind of answer. I waited months for a signature on a piece of paper to get a prosthetic leg fixed, and now it's a lot better turnaround. But before, it was five-year waiting process to appeal. So I mean, how long do we have to wait for benefits? I waited 20 years to file. Rapidly was approved for medical, and then right, turned right around and got disability. I was thinking it was gonna be a several years worth of waiting to hear. He's accomplished a lot in three and a half years. And it, it helps the American people, and he has done a lot for veterans, for the middle class. I chose to serve my country. If I could do it, I would do it all over again, especially for this president. I mean, he's the kind of president you'd run through a brick wall if he asked you to. Went through many presidents, but this one, I can say, is the best president we've ever had and ever will have, I believe. Hello everyone, and thank you for inviting me into your home this evening. It's truly a privilege. My name is Joni Ernst. I was raised on a small family farm here in Iowa, where I learned the importance of faith, hard work, and service. I worked my way through college, then dedicated my life to serving my country as a local official, a battalion commander in the military, and as a U.S. Senator. Service. It's more than a word to me. It's a mission, a way of life. It's what brought me to Cedar Rapids, Iowa in 2008 when I was in the National Guard. We saw historic floods that swept through the communities. We lent a helping hand to our fellow Iowans who were literally underwater. We thought we had seen the worst. 
But 12 years later, these same communities have faced an even more devastating disaster, the recent derecho storm. If you don't live in Iowa, you may not have heard much about it at first. While reporters here in the state were in the trenches covering the equivalent of a Category 2 hurricane, most of the national media looked the other way. To them, Iowa is still just flyover country. Houses, farms were destroyed. About one-third of our crops here were damaged. In some cases, these storms wiped out a lifetime of work. And yet Iowa farmers didn't hesitate to grab their chainsaws and check on their neighbors. Our farmers live every day with that sense of service, the stewards of the land, the ones who feed and fuel the world. President Trump quickly signed an emergency declaration for Iowa to provide relief. And of course, when President Trump came to Cedar Rapids, the national media finally did too. For years, I've worked closely with the president for farmers in Iowa and across the country. We scrapped Obama and Biden's punishing waters of the United States rule, which would have regulated about 97% of land in Iowa, in some cases, even puddles. It would have been a nightmare for farmers. The president delivered on major trade deals with Japan and the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement. And he implemented the sale of E15 fuel year round. That means more choices for you at the pump and more jobs for farmers in the heartland. This is something the Obama Biden administration failed to do in eight years. In fact, I can't recall an administration more hostile to farmers than Obama Biden, unless you count the Biden Harris ticket. The Democratic Party of Joe Biden is pushing this so-called Green New Deal. If given power, they would essentially ban animal agriculture and eliminate gas-powered cars. It would destroy the agriculture industry, not just here in Iowa, but throughout the country. When the pandemic hit, President Trump heard us in our call for assistance for our farmers. Knowing we have an ally in the White House is important. Folks, this election is a choice between two very different paths. Freedom, prosperity, and economic growth under a Trump-Pence administration. Or the Biden-Harris path, paved by liberal coastal elites and radical environmentalists. An America where farmers are punished, jobs are destroyed, and taxes crush the middle class. That is our choice and it's a clear one. Thank you, and God bless. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Burgess Owens. Shackled in the belly of a slave ship, an eight-year-old boy named Silas Burgess came to America to be sold on an auction block. By the grace of God and the courage of slaves who believed in freedom, Silas escaped through the Underground Railroad and settled in the great state of Texas he went on to become a successful entrepreneur. He built his community's first church, first elementary school, and purchased 102 acres of farmland, which he paid off in two years. I'm here today, a candidate for Congress, because of my great-great-grandfather, Silas Burgess. I was raised in the South during the days of Jim Crow and the KKK. Even through the challenges of segregation, we were taught that anything is possible in America. When I was 22 years old, I thought all my dreams had come true when I was drafted by the New York Jets. Ten years later, with a Pro Bowl nod and a Super Bowl championship under my belt, I left the NFL to start a business. I thought I could never fail, but years later I did, and I lost everything. As I moved my family of six into a one-bedroom basement apartment in Brooklyn, New York, I had a choice to make, to feel sorry for myself or get to work. I worked as a chimney sweep during the day and a security guard at night. It was humbling to be recognized cleaning a chimney by someone who once cheered me as an NFL fan. But those hard days would pay off, and eventually I started a career, rewarding career, in the corporate world. We live in a country where we're encouraged to dream big, where second chances are at the core of our American DNA. We don't hear that same message from Nancy Pelosi's Congress, career politicians, elitists, and even a former bartender 
want us to believe it's impossible. They want us to believe that what I did, what my great-great-grandfather did, is impossible for ordinary Americans. As patriots, we know better. This November, we stand at a crossroad. Mobs torched our cities while popular members of Congress promote the same socialism that my father fought against in World War II. We have a Democratic candidate for president who says that I'm not black if I don't vote for him. Now more than ever, we need leaders who stand by their principles and won't compromise their values for political opportunities. Now more than ever, we need leaders who will stand up to the lawlessness supported by the radical left. This November, we have an opportunity to reject the mob mentality and once again be the America that my great-great-grandfather believed in. During the Trump administration, business ownership among blacks, Hispanics, and females have reached all-time highs. Those same groups enjoyed record low unemployment and unprecedented prosperity. And we're just getting started. I'm running for Congress because we don't need more career politicians. We need a few more chimney sweeps. We need more leaders like President Trump who understand the freedoms that make up the fabric of America. My fellow Americans, specifically my Democrat and independent friends, it is now time for us to unite and put aside partisan barriers Help us win back the House, keep the Senate, and give our president four more years, and I promise you, we will make you proud. Thank you, and God bless the United States of America. Standing guard over Baltimore Harbor is the remains of an earthen star, a relic of time past. It recalls a time when the spirit of liberty stirred in men of renown who stood in the gap against the most powerful force in the world. 27 hours, a thousand men, low on ammunition, firing scrap metal. The battle raged, insurmountable odds. A darkness fell upon this new nation. In the midst of the fight, the heroes of Fort McHenry were unmoved. The light of dawn overcame the darkness. The gallant flag hoisted above Fort McHenry, torn and battered, stood, victoriously observing a dejected enemy slowly retreating into the rising sun, inspiring the anthem of our nation. The spirit of liberty, not to be denied, the earthen star, Fort McHenry, a reminder of those brave patriots who, having done all, stood and prevailed. It is why we stand today, honoring past, present, and future generations of freedom-loving Americans when we hear the anthem and raise the Star-Spangled Banner. Good evening, America. I'm Laura Trump. Daughter of Bob and Linda Unaska, sister to Kyle, mother to Luke and Carolina, and the daughter-in-law of our 45th president, Donald J. Trump. But tonight, I come to you simply as an American. My life began like many in our country. I grew up in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. My parents were small business owners and worked hard to make sure that my brother and I had everything we needed, but not everything we wanted. My parents raised me to believe that in America, I could achieve anything with hard work and determination, that the opportunities available to me were limited only by the size of my ambition, that I should dream big, and I did. Those very dreams are what led me to New York City. I'd heard the adage, if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere, and I intended to do just that. Never in a million years did I think that I would be on this stage tonight and I certainly never thought that I'd end up with the last name Trump. My seventh grade English teacher, Mrs. B, used to tell us, believe none of what you hear, half of what you read, and only what you're there to witness firsthand. The meaning of those words never fully weighed on me until I met my husband and the Trump family. Any preconceived notion I had of this family disappeared immediately. They were warm and caring. They were hard workers and they were down to earth. They reminded me of my own family. They made me feel like I was home. 
Walking the halls of the Trump Organization, I saw the same family environment. I also saw the countless women executives who thrived there year after year. Gender didn't matter. What mattered was the ability to get the job done. I learned this directly when, in 2016, my father-in-law asked me to help him win my cherished home state and my daughter's namesake, North Carolina. Though I had no political experience, he believed in me. He knew I was capable, even if I didn't. So it didn't surprise me when President Donald Trump appointed so many women to senior level positions in his administration. Secretary of the United Nations, Secretary of the Air Force, the first female CIA director, the first black female director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, and countless ambassadors, just to name a few. Under President Trump's leadership, women's unemployment hit the lowest level since World War II. 4.3 million new jobs have been created for women. In 2019 alone, women took over 70 percent of all new jobs. Female small business ownership remains at an all-time high, and 600,000 women have been lifted out of poverty, all since President Trump took office. He didn't do these things to gain a vote or check a box. He did them because they're the right things to do. 100 years ago today, the 19th Amendment was ratified, granting the right to vote to every American woman. And since that day, incredible strides have been made by women in America. From Amelia Earhart to Rosa Parks and Sally Ride, women shaped our history and are part of what has made our country the most exceptional nation in the world. I often think back to my 24-year-old self, driving alone in my car from North Carolina to New York City. And I think about what I tell myself now as we head towards the most critical election in modern history. This is not just a choice between Republican and Democrat or left and right. This is an election that will decide if we keep America, America, or if we head down an uncharted, frightening path towards socialism. Abraham Lincoln once famously said, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. While those words were spoken over 150 years ago, never have they been more relevant. Will we choose the right path and maintain the unique freedoms and boundless opportunities that make this country the greatest in the history of the world? Will we remain the beacon of hope for those around the world fighting oppression, communism, and tyranny? The choice is ours. I know the promise of America because I've lived it, not just as a member of the Trump family, but as a woman who knows what it's like to work in blue collar jobs, to serve customers for tips, and to aspire to rise. When I look at my son Luke and my daughter Carolina, I wonder, what sort of country will I be leaving for them, for our future generations? In recent months, we've seen weak, spineless politicians seek control of our great American cities to violent mobs. Defund the police is the rallying cry for the new radical Democrat Party. Joe Biden will not do what it takes to maintain order, to keep our children safe in our neighborhoods and in their schools, to restore our American way of life. We cannot dare to dream our biggest dreams for ourselves or for our children while consumed by worry about the safety of our families. President Trump is the law and order president, from our borders to our backyards. President Trump will keep America safe. President Trump will keep America prosperous. President Trump will keep America, America. If you're watching tonight and wrestling with your vote on November 3rd, I implore you, Tune out the distorted news and biased commentary and hear it straight from someone who knows. I wasn't born a Trump. I'm from the South. I was raised a Carolina girl. I went to public schools and worked my way through a state university. Mrs. B from my seventh grade English class was right. What I learned about our president is different than what you might have heard. I learned that he's a good man, that he loves his family, that he didn't need this job, that no one on earth works harder for the American people, that he's willing to fight for his beliefs and for the people and the country that he loves. He is a person of conviction. He is a fighter and will never stop fighting for America. 
he will uphold our values. He will preserve our families. And he will build upon the great American edict that our union will never be perfect until opportunity is equal for all, including and especially for women. Our 40th president, Ronald Reagan, said it best, the dreams of people may differ, but everybody wants their dreams to come true. And America above all places gives us the freedom to do that. It's up to us to keep this country a place where no dream is out of reach for our children and generations beyond. To my father-in-law, thank you for believing in me. Thank you for bravely leading this country and thank you for continuing to fight every day for America. May God bless and protect the Gulf states in the path of the hurricane. May God bless our troops and may God continue to bless this incredible country. Good evening. My name is Sam V. Heal. There is a hole in my heart since my beloved Jackie was taken from me. This is her story. There were two things that Jackie loved to do every day. One was to go to the gym and tweet out Bible verses and prayers to her friends. On November 19th, the tweet stopped. That day started out like any other day. She left for the gym early in the morning. I heard the garage door open. Seconds later, I heard the car horn. I went outside to see if she had forgotten something. What I saw was a Jeep blocking her car in the driveway. I noticed the bullet hole in Jackie's window. I saw someone jumping into the Jeep and speeding away. Jackie had just been shot and killed in cold blood. We think this was a carjacking gone wrong, very wrong. Every time I open the garage door or stand in the driveway, I hear that horn. I see her slumped in the seat. Where, when I go to bed at night, that sound and image hunt me. That's my life sentence. It's a sentence being served by too many families left behind by senseless killings. Albuquerque, where I live, is one of the most violent cities in the country. Fewer than 50% of homicides are solved. It is a sad irony that Jackie immigrated to the U.S. for a better life than her native Colombia, only to be gunned down in her own driveway. For eight months, there were no arrests, no leads in connection with Jackie's murder. The Albuquerque police were overwhelmed. They needed help. Help arrived when President Trump launched Operation Legend in July of this year. Almost immediately, the FBI took over Jackie's case. In a matter of days, they arrested four people. The fifth suspect killer was arrested in Texas on unrelated charges. He is an illegal immigrant with a long criminal record. He had been deported in September and had come back in October to terrorize our community. I am extremely grateful to President Trump and the FBI for their efforts to deliver justice for Jackie and all the other innocent victims of violent crime. I am honored to support the president because he is supporting us. I know he will never stop fighting for justice, for law and order, for peace, security in, in our communities. Greetings, my fellow Americans. I am Clarence Henderson. There have been movements that have changed the course of history. Among the most extraordinary was the Civil Rights Movement. Sixty years ago, segregation was legal and enforced. The simple act of sitting at a lunch counter could lead to physical harm, jail time, or worse. I know from personal experience, walking into Woolworth department store on February 2nd, 1960, I knew it was unlike any day I'd experienced before. My friends had been denied service the day before because of the color of their skin. We knew it wasn't right. But when we went back the next day, I didn't know whether I was going to come out in a vertical or prone position, in handcuffs or on a stretcher, or even in a body bag. 
By sitting down to order a cup of coffee, we challenged injustice. We knew it was necessary, but we didn't know what would happen. We faced down the KKK. We were cursed at and called all kinds of names. They threatened to kill us, and some of us were arrested. But it was worth it. Our actions inspired similar protests throughout the South against racial injustice. And in the end, segregation was abolished, and our country moved a step closer to true equality for all. That's what actual peaceful protests can accomplish. America isn't perfect. We're always improving. But the great thing about this country is that it's not where you come from, it's where you're going. I was born on what some would call the wrong side of the tracks. I don't even have a birth certificate. I never attended an integrated school and am the only one out of my immediate family who graduated from college, an HBCU. I'm a military veteran and a civil rights activist. And you know what else? I'm a Republican and I support Donald Trump. If that sounds strange, you don't know your history. It was the Republican Party that passed the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery. It was a Republican Party that passed the 14th Amendment, giving black men citizenship. It was the Republican Party that passed the 15th Amendment, giving black men the right to vote. Freedom of thought is a powerful thing. There are Americans, voters all over the country, who media is trying to convince to conform to the same old Democratic talking points. You know what that'll get you? The same old results. Joe Biden had the audacity to say, if you don't vote for him, you ain't black. Well, to that, I say, if you do vote for Biden, you don't know history. Donald Trump is not a politician. He's a leader. Politicians are a dime a dozen. Leaders are priceless. The record funding Trump gave HBCUs is priceless, too. So are the record number of jobs he created for the black community and the investment he drove into our neighborhoods with tax incentives and opportunity zones. And so are the lives he restored by passing criminal justice reform, where 91 percent of the inmates released are black. These achievements demonstrate that Donald Trump truly cares about black lives. His policies show his heart. He has done more for black Americans in four years than Joe Biden has done in 50. Donald Trump is offering real and lasting change, an unprecedented opportunity to, to rise, a country that embraces the spirit of the civil rights movement of the 60s, a place where people are judged by the content of their character, their talents and abilities, not by the color of their skin. This is the America I was fighting for 60 years ago. This is the America Donald Trump is fighting for today. Let's all join in this fight for re-electing President Trump on November 3rd. Thank you. During the presidential primary debates four years ago, one outsider stood alone and said in public what most Americans thought in private. It was 14 years after the start of the war in Afghanistan and 12 years after the invasion of Iraq, where thousands of American troops had died and trillions in taxpayer dollars had been spent. And yet no candidate could bring themselves to admit that something had gone badly wrong with American foreign policy. That the American voter, the American soldier, and the American taxpayer had all been let down, except for one, Donald Trump. He called America's endless wars what they were, a disaster. The media was shocked because Donald Trump was running as a Republican. And yet he said out loud what we all knew, that American foreign policy was failing to make Americans safer. After the end of the Cold War, Democrats and Republicans in Washington bought into the illusion that the whole world would start to resemble America. And so they started to pursue unlimited globalization. 
They welcomed China into the World Trade Organization. They engaged in nation building in Afghanistan and tried to export democracy to Iraq. They signed a nuclear deal with Iran and a global climate agreement in Paris. But they didn't ground any of it in the interests of the average American. So for decades, while Washington politicians built a global system, American wages stagnated. Our great cities and industries were hollowed out. Entire communities were devastated. And our manufacturing plants were shipped off to China. That's what happened when Washington stopped being the capital of the United States and started being the capital of the world. As U.S. ambassador to Germany, I had a front row seat to Donald Trump's America First foreign policy. I wish every American could see how President Trump negotiates on their behalf. I've watched President Trump charm the chancellor of Germany while insisting that Germany pay its NATO obligations. I was proud to witness President Trump say to foreign leaders, I don't blame you for wanting America to pay for your security. I actually respect you for out negotiating the presidents before me. But it stops with me. I won't let the American taxpayer be taken advantage of. Donald Trump's administration has always made clear that our priority is the American people's security. That's the job of all leaders to put their people first. And we've seen how this strategy has succeeded. In four short years, Donald Trump has led even some Washington Democrats to agree on the Chinese threat, on trade deals that benefit America first, on alliances that share responsibility. In four years, Donald Trump didn't start any new wars. He brought troops home. He rebuilt the military and signed peace deals that make Americans safer. The Washington elites want you to think this kind of foreign policy is immoral. And so they call it nationalist. That tells you all you need to know. The DC crowd thinks when they call Donald Trump a nationalist, they're insulting him. As if the American president isn't supposed to base foreign policy on America's national interests. A return to the Biden way of thinking means America gives the radical terrorist regime in Tehran a plain load of cash in the middle of the night. Well, you see, President Trump also sent an aircraft in the middle of the night to deal with Iran. But that plane was on a different mission, an airstrike to take out the head of Iran's terror machine who plotted the deaths of Americans. But we also must be clear that when those who seek freedom take tremendous personal risk in places like Hong Kong, Tehran, or Minsk, there is no doubt who President Trump's administration supports. We will always stand with the people who fight for their God-given freedoms. Don't be fooled. The Washington establishment is trying to sell you on their candidate. Joe Biden was first elected to the Senate in 1972, 48 years ago. Well, it's actually the typical Washington story. Just this year, 22 Democrats ran for president. They rejected all of the outsiders and nominated the ultimate Washington insider, someone they had to pull out of retirement. Every time Joe Biden offers a new idea, you should ask yourself, why didn't he try that over the last 48 years? Today, the Democrats blame a global pandemic that started in China on President Trump, and they still blame Russia for Hillary Clinton's loss in 2016. As acting director of national intelligence, I saw the Democrats' entire case for Russian collusion. And what I saw made me sick to my stomach. The Obama-Biden administration secretly launched a surveillance operation on the Trump campaign and silenced the many brave intelligence officials who spoke up against it. They presented bogus information as facts. They lied to judges. Then they classified anything that undermined their case. And after Donald Trump won the election, 
when they should have continued the American tradition of helping the president-elect transition into the White House, they tried instead to undercut him even more. Former Vice President Joe Biden asked intelligence officials to uncover the hidden information on President Trump's incoming national security advisor three weeks before the inauguration. That's the Democrats. Between surveillance, classifications, leaks, and puppet candidates, they never want the American people to know who's actually calling the shots. But with Donald Trump, you always know exactly who is in charge. Because the answer is you. You're in charge. Not lobbyists, not special interests, not warmongers or China sympathizers or globalization fanatics. With Donald Trump and Mike Pence in the White House, the boss is the American people. President Trump rightly calls his foreign policy America first. America first does not advance the interests of one group of Americans at the expense of another. It has no bias about red or blue, educated or not educated, urban or rural. America first is simply the belief that politicians should focus on the equality and dignity of every American and that this duty is fulfilled by promoting the safety and wealth of the American people above all else. That's America first. That's the Trump doctrine. And that, my friends, is four more years. By dawn's early light, millions of Americans give thanks for this land, our liberties, and those who defend it. That same pride inspired the words of our national anthem, penned here as the smoke of battle lifted over two centuries ago. When those American soldiers bravely fought and died repelling the British onslaught, they did so not only for our people, which that flag represented, but for our principles, for which the flag stood, our God-given freedoms, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, equality under the law, government by the people. These are the threads that bind us together as Americans, for we are not a nation born of blood, but of belief. And even though that old flag has sometimes been battered and beaten, faded and forgotten, fired upon and set ablaze, there are heroes throughout our history who have picked up those tattered strands, mended them, and raised our flag anew. Just as the soldiers at Fort McHenry fought in defense of the beliefs that bind us today, there are new leaders who have devoted their life to do the same. Greetings across the amber waves of grain. This is Mike Pence. Across Indiana highways and homes, his voice warmly welcomed Hoosiers each morning. Mike Pence filled the radio waves with conservative commentary, guarding our American ideals. But much like the man who inspired him, Mike didn't grow up a Republican. As President Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. His grandfather was a hardworking Irish immigrant who drove a bus to provide for his family. His father served our nation bravely in the Korean War and earned a bronze star. Mike was the third of six children raised here in Columbus, Indiana, with a cornfield in his backyard. The foundation of America is freedom, and the foundation of freedom is faith. It was in this small Indiana town his foundation of faith in Jesus Christ was laid, and from that conviction sprung his love of people and service to others. It was at a church service where Mike met the love of his life, Karen. They married and have three children, Michael, Charlotte, and Audrey. I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican, in that order. Mike became the president of a free market think tank, the host of a statewide conservative radio show, and then a congressman. In Washington, Mike quickly became known as a foremost defender of freedom. He led conservatives in the fight to protect our time-honored values of family, faith, life, 
liberty, and limited government. Our nation's strength begins at home because strong families make a strong America. Mike earned the trust of the people of his state and became the 50th governor of Indiana. He delivered the largest state tax cut in Indiana history, expanded school choice, led the country in manufacturing, and helped more Hoosiers get to work than ever before. But he wasn't through. ABC News has learned that Donald Trump will choose Indiana Governor Mike Pence to be his running mate. I would like to introduce a man who I truly believe will be the next vice president of the United States, Governor Mike Pence. As our vice president, Mike Pence has held tightly to those threads of freedom woven through our history. Leading with those principles alongside President Trump, our nation experienced prosperity like never before. He is solid as a rock. He's been a fantastic vice president. And now, in these uncertain days, we are equipped to overcome. In times of trouble, some call to retreat from those ideals. But Americans throughout history have lifted them in triumph, hope, and resilience. Mike Pence knows those stars and stripes do not merely represent who we are, but more importantly, what we can be. As the sun rises again on America, we lift our eyes to those lofty truths to guide our country and every one of us to greater heights. In this land of the free and home of the brave. Vice President Mike Pence. Please welcome the Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence, accompanied by the second lady, Mrs. Karen Pence. Good evening, America. It's an honor to speak to you tonight from the hallowed, from the hallowed grounds of Fort McHenry, the site of the very battle that inspired the words of our national anthem. Those words have inspired this land of heroes in every generation since. It was on this site 206 years ago when our young republic heroically withstood a ferocious naval bombardment from the most powerful empire on earth. They came to crush our revolution, to divide our nation, and to end the American experiment. The heroes who held this fort took their stand for life, liberty, freedom, and the American flag. And those ideals have defined our nation. But they were hardly ever mentioned at last week's Democratic National Convention. Instead, Democrats spent four days attacking America. Joe Biden said that we were living through a season of darkness. But as President Trump said, where Joe Biden sees American darkness, we see American greatness. In these challenging times, our country needs a president who believes in America, 
who believes in the boundless capacity of the American people to meet any challenge, defeat any foe, and defend the freedoms we hold dear. America needs four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House. Before I go further, allow me to say a word to the families and communities in the path of Hurricane Laura. Our prayers are with you tonight, and our administration is working closely with authorities in the states that will be impacted. FEMA has mobilized resources and supplies for those in harm's way. This is a serious storm, and we urge all those in the affected areas to heed state and local authorities. Stay safe and know that we'll be with you every step of the way to support, rescue, respond, and recover in the days and weeks ahead. That's what Americans do. Four years ago, I answered the call to join this ticket because I knew that Donald Trump had the leadership and the vision to make America great again. And for the last four years, I've watched this president endure unrelenting attacks, but get up every day and fight to keep the promises that he made to the American people. So with gratitude for the confidence President Donald Trump has placed in me, the support of our Republican Party, and the grace of God, I humbly accept your nomination to run and serve as Vice President of the United States. Serving the American people in this office has been a journey I never expected. It's a journey that would not have been possible without the support of my family, beginning with my wonderful wife, Karen. She's a lifelong school teacher, an incredible mother to our three children. And she is one outstanding second lady of the United States. I'm so proud of you. And we couldn't be more proud of our three children. Marine Corps Captain Michael J. Pence and his wife, Sarah. Our daughter, Charlotte Pence Bond, an author, and the wife to Lieutenant Henry Bond, who is currently deployed and serving our nation in the United States Navy. And our youngest, a recent law school grad, our daughter Audrey and her fiance, who, like so many other Americans, had to delay their wedding this summer. But we can't wait for Dan to be a part of our family. In addition to my wife and kids, the person who shaped my life the most is also with us tonight, my mom, Nancy. She is the daughter of an Irish immigrant, 87 years young. And mom follows politics very closely. And the truth be told, sometimes I think I'm actually her second favorite candidate on the Trump-Pence <laughs> ticket. Thank you, Mom. I love you. Over the past four years, I've had the privilege to work closely with our president. I've seen him when the cameras are off. Americans see President Trump in lots of different ways. But there's no doubt how President Trump sees America. He sees America for what it is. 
a nation that has done more good in this world than any other, a nation that deserves far more gratitude than grievance. And if you want a president who falls silent when our heritage is demeaned or insulted, he's not your man. Now, we came by very different routes to this partnership. And some people think we're a little bit different. But you know, I've learned a few things watching him. Watching him deal with all that we've been through over the past four years. He does things in his own way, on his own terms. Not much gets past him. And when he has an opinion, he's liable to share it. He certainly kept things interesting. But more importantly, President Donald Trump has kept his word to the American people. In a city known for talkers, President Trump is a doer. And few presidents have brought more independence, energy, or determination to that office. Four years ago, we inherited a military hollowed out by devastating budget cuts, an economy struggling to break out of the slowest recovery since the Great Depression. ISIS controlled a land mass twice the size of Pennsylvania, and we witnessed a steady assault on our most cherished values, freedom of religion and the right to life. That's when President Donald Trump stepped in. And from day one, he kept his word. We rebuilt our military. This president signed the largest increase in our national defense since the days of Ronald Reagan and created the first new branch of our armed forces in 70 years, the United States Space Force. And with that renewed energy, we also returned American astronauts to space on an American rocket for the first time in nearly 10 years. And after years of scandal that robbed our veterans of the care that you earned in the uniform of the United States, President Trump kept his word again. We reformed the VA. And Veterans Choice is now available for every veteran in America. Our armed forces and our veterans fill this land of heroes. And many join us tonight in this historic fort. Tonight, we have among us four recipients of the Medal of Honor. Six recipients of the Purple Heart. A Gold Star Mother of a gallant Navy Seal. And Wounded Warriors from Soldier Strong, a group that serves our injured veterans every day. We are honored by your presence, and we thank you for your service. With heroes just like these, we defend this nation every day. And under this Commander-in-Chief, we've taken the fight to radical Islamic terrorists on our terms on their soil. Last year, American Armed Forces took the last inch of ISIS territory, crushed their caliphate, and took down their leader without one American casualty. And I was there when President Trump gave the order to take out the world's most dangerous terrorist, Iran's top general will never harm another American because Qasem Soleimani is gone. <laughs> the 
My fellow Americans, you deserve to know. Joe Biden criticized President Trump following those decisions, decisions to rid the world of two terrorist leaders. But it's not surprising, because history records that Joe Biden even opposed the operation that took down Osama bin Laden. It's no wonder that the Secretary of Defense under the Obama-Biden administration once said that Joe Biden has been, and I quote, wrong on nearly every major foreign policy and national security issue over the past four decades. So we've stood up to our enemies, and we've stood with our allies. Like when President Trump kept his word and moved the American embassy to Jerusalem, the capital of the state of Israel setting the stage for the first Arab country to recognize Israel in 26 years. Closer to home, we appointed more than 200 conservative judges to our federal courts. We supported the right to life and all the God-given liberties enshrined in our Constitution, including the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. And when it came to the economy, President Trump kept his word, and then some. We passed the largest tax cut and reform in American history. We rolled back more federal red tape than any administration ever had. We unleashed American energy and fought for free and fair trade. And in our first three years, businesses large and small created more than 7 million good-paying jobs, including 500,000 manufacturing jobs all across America. Our country became a net exporter of energy for the first time in 70 years. Unemployment rates for African Americans and Hispanic Americans hit the lowest level ever recorded. And on this 100th anniversary of the woman's right to vote, I'm proud to report that under President Donald Trump, we achieved the lowest unemployment rate for women in 65 years. and more Americans working than ever before. In our first three years, we built the greatest economy in the world. We made America great again. And then the coronavirus struck from China. Before the first case of the coronavirus spread within the United States, the President took unprecedented action and suspended all travel from China, the second largest economy in the world. Now, that action saved untold American lives. And I can tell you firsthand, it bought us invaluable time to launch the greatest national mobilization since World War II. President Trump marshaled the full resources of our federal government from the outset. He directed us to forge a seamless partnership with governors across America in both political parties. We partnered with private industry to reinvent testing and produce supplies that, that were distributed to hospitals around the land. Today, we're conducting more than 800,000 tests a day, and we have coordinated the delivery of billions of pieces of personal protective equipment for our amazing doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers. We saw to the manufacture of 100,000 ventilators in 100 days. And no one who required a ventilator was ever denied a ventilator in the United States. We built hospitals, surged military medical personnel, and enacted an economic rescue package that saved 50 million American jobs. And as we speak, we're developing a growing number of treatments known as therapeutics, including convalescent plasma that are saving lives all across America. Now, last week, Joe Biden said that no miracle is coming. Well, what Joe doesn't seem to understand 
is that America is a nation of miracles. And I'm proud to report that we're on track to have the world's first safe, effective coronavirus vaccine by the end of this year. After all the sacrifice in this year like no other, all the hardship, we're finding our way forward again. But tonight, our hearts are with all the families who've lost loved ones and have family members still struggling with serious illness. In this country, we mourn with those who mourn. We grieve with those who grieve. And this night, I know that millions of Americans will pause and pray for God's comfort for each of you. You know, our country doesn't get through such a time unless its people find strength within. The response of doctors, nurses, first responders, farmers, factory workers, truckers, and everyday Americans who put the health and safety of their neighbors first has been nothing short of heroic. <laughs> Veronica Sayez put on her scrubs every day. Day in and day out, went to work in one of New York City's busiest hospitals. She stayed on the job, put in the long hours until it was done, and then got back in her neighborhood and help neighbors and friends struggling. Her brother William is a New York City firefighter. And they're both emblematic of heroes all across this country. They're with us tonight. And I say to them and to all of you, you have earned the admiration of the American people, and we will always be grateful for your service and care. Thanks to the courage and compassion of the American people, we're slowing the spread. We're protecting the vulnerable. And we're saving lives. And we're opening up America again. Because of the strong foundation that President Trump poured in our first three years, we've already gained back 9.3 million jobs in the last three months alone. And we're not just opening up America again. We're opening up America's schools. And I'm proud to report that my wife, Karen, that school teacher I've been married to, will be returning to her classroom next week. And so to all of our heroic teachers and faculty and staff, Thank you for being there for our kids. We're going to stay with you every step of the way. In the days ahead, as we open up America again, I promise you, we'll continue to put the health of America first. And as we work to bring this economy back, we all have a role to play. And we all have a choice to make. On November 3rd, you need to ask yourself, who do you trust to rebuild this economy? A career politician who presided over the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression? Or a proven leader who created the greatest economy in the world? The choice is clear. To bring America all the way back, we need four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House.
My fellow Americans were passing through a time of testing. But in the midst of this global pandemic, just as our nation had begun to recover, we've seen violence and chaos in the streets of our major cities. President Trump and I will always support the right of Americans to peaceful protest. But rioting and looting is not peaceful protest. Tearing down statues is not free speech. And those who do so will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Last week, Joe Biden didn't say one word about the violence and chaos engulfing cities across this country. So let me be clear. The violence must stop, whether in Minneapolis, Portland, or Kenosha. Too many heroes have died defending our freedom to see Americans strike each other down. We will have law and order on the streets of this country for every American of every race and creed and color. President Trump and I know that the men and women that put on the uniform of law enforcement are the best of us. Every day, when they walk out that door, they consider our lives more important than their own. People like Dave Patrick Underwood, an officer in the Department of Homeland Security's Federal Protective Service, who was shot and killed during the riots in Oakland, California. Dave's heroism is emblematic of the heroes that serve in blue every day. And we're privileged tonight to be joined by his sister, Angela. Angela, we say to you, we, we grieve with your family. And America will never forget or fail to honor Officer Dave Patrick Underwood. The American people know we don't have to choose between supporting law enforcement and standing with our African American neighbors to improve the quality of their lives, education, jobs, and safety. And from the first days of this administration, we've done both. And we will keep supporting law enforcement and keep supporting our African American and minority communities across this land for four more years. Now, Joe Biden says that America is systemically racist and that law enforcement in America has, and I quote, an implicit bias against minorities. When asked whether he'd support cutting funding to law enforcement, Joe Biden replied, yes, absolutely. Joe Biden would double down on the very policies that are leading to violence in America's cities. The hard truth is, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. And under President Trump, we will always stand with those who stand on the thin blue line, and we're not going to defund the police, not now, not ever. My fellow Americans, we're passing through a time of testing, but soon we will come to a time for choosing. Joe Biden has referred to himself as a transition candidate, 
And many were asking, transition to what? But last week, Democrats didn't talk very much about their agenda. And if I were them, I wouldn't either. I mean, Bernie Sanders did tell his followers that Joe Biden would be the most liberal president in modern times. In fact, he said, and I quote, that many of the ideas he fought for, that just a few years ago were considered radical, are now mainstream in the Democratic Party. At the root of their agenda is the belief that America is driven by envy, not aspiration. That millions of Americans harbor ill will toward our neighbors instead of loving our neighbors as ourselves. The radical left believes that the federal government must be involved in every aspect of our lives to correct those American wrongs. They believe the federal government needs to dictate how Americans live, how we should work, how we should raise our children, and in the process deprive our people of freedom, prosperity, and security. Their agenda is based on government control. Our agenda is based on freedom. Where President Trump cut taxes, Joe Biden wants to raise taxes by nearly $4 trillion. Where this president achieved energy independence for the United States, Joe Biden would abolish fossil fuels, end fracking, and impose a regime of climate change regulations that would drastically increase the cost of living for working families. Where we fought for free and fair trade, and this president stood up to China and ended the era of economic surrender, Joe Biden has been a cheerleader for communist China. He wants to repeal all the tariffs that are leveling the playing field for American workers. And he actually criticized President Trump for suspending all travel to China at the outset of this pandemic. Joe Biden is for open borders, sanctuary cities, free lawyers and health care for illegal immigrants. And President Trump, he secured our border and built nearly 300 miles of that border wall. <laughs> Joe Biden wants to end school choice. And President Trump believes that every parent should have the right to choose where their children go to school, regardless of their income or area code. <laughs> President, Trump, President Trump has stood without apology for the sanctity of human life every day of this administration. Joe Biden, he supports taxpayer funding of abortion right up to the moment of birth. When you consider their agenda, it's clear. Joe Biden would be nothing more than a Trojan horse for the radical left. The choice in this election has never been clearer, and the stakes have never been higher. Last week, Joe Biden said, democracy's on the ballot. And the truth is, our economic recovery is on the ballot. Law and order are on the ballot. But so are things far more fundamental and foundational to our country. In this election, it's not so much whether America will be more conservative or more liberal, more Republican or more Democrat. The choice in this election is whether America remains America. It's whether we will leave to our children and our grandchildren a country grounded in our highest ideals of freedom, free markets, and the unalienable right to life and liberty, or whether we will leave them a country that's fundamentally transformed into something else. We stand at a crossroads, America. President Trump has set our nation on a path of freedom and opportunity. Joe Biden would set America on a path of socialism and decline. But we're not going to let it happen.
President Donald Trump believes in America and in the goodness of the American people. The boundless potential of every American to live out their dreams in freedom. And every day, President Trump has been fighting to protect the promise of America. Every day, our president has been fighting to expand the reach of the American dream. And every day, President Donald Trump has been fighting for you. And now it's our turn to fight for him. On this night in the company of heroes, I'm deeply grateful. Deeply grateful for the privilege of serving as vice president of this great nation and to have the opportunity to serve again. I pray to be worthy of it, and I will give that duty all that's in me. In the year 2020, the American people have had more than our share of challenges. But thankfully, we have a president with the toughness, energy, and resolve to see us through. Now, those traits actually run in our national character. As the invading force learned on approach to this fort in September of 1814, against fierce and sustained bombardment, our young country was defended by heroes, not so different from those who are with us tonight. The enemy was counting on them to quit, but they never did. Fort McHenry held, and when morning came, our flag was still here. My fellow Americans, we're going through a time of testing. But if you look through the fog of these challenging times, you will see our flag is still there today. That star-spangled banner still waves over the land of the free and the home of the brave. From these hallowed grounds, American patriots in generations gone by did their part to defend freedom. Now it's our turn. So let's run the race marked out for us. Let's fix our eyes on O Glory and all she represents. Let's fix our eyes on this land of heroes and let their courage inspire. And let's fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith and our freedom. And never forget that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That means freedom always wins. My fellow Americans, thank you for the honor of addressing you tonight and the opportunity to run and serve again as your vice president. I leave here today inspired. And I leave here today more convinced than ever that we will do in our time, as Americans have done throughout our long and storied past, we will defend our freedom and our way of life. We will reelect our president and principled Republican leaders across the land. And with President Donald Trump in the White House for four more years, and with God's help, we will make America great again, again. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America.
here to perform our national anthem. Please welcome country music superstar, Trace Atkins. So proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still Sadles that star spangled banner yet away or the land of the free and the home of the
It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us for our special coverage of day three of the 2020 Republican National Convention. As Republicans continue to make the case for President Trump's re-election at their convention, several crises are brewing across the country, including a dangerous hurricane along the Gulf Coast. Texas and Louisiana are expected to see catastrophic storm surge, extreme winds, and flash flooding. And California is battling some of the largest wildfires in its history. The state is dealing with hundreds of fires. Several of them are major. Meanwhile, a city in Wisconsin is reeling after another night of violent protests in the wake of a police shooting of a black man. All of this comes as the country continues to fight the coronavirus pandemic. More than 179,000 people in the United States have died, and more than 5.8 million in the U.S. have been infected. The theme for the third night of the RNC was Land of Heroes. Speakers took on a similar approach to previous nights, praising President Trump's leadership while criticizing the Democratic ticket. Mike Pence delivered the final speech of the night. He formally accepted the Republican vice presidential nomination from Fort McHenry in Baltimore. He touted President Trump's handling of the pandemic and defended law enforcement. The vice president also blamed Democratic leaders for not doing enough to stop civil unrest across the country. Let's bring in Lonnie Chen and Antoine Seawright. Lonnie is a Republican strategist and former policy director for Mitt Romney's presidential campaign. And Antoine is a CBS News political contributor and Democratic strategist. Welcome to you both. Thanks very much for being with us. Um, Lonnie, let me start with you. Uh, tonight's speakers covered a variety of different topics. Who do you think the intended audience was for these messages? Well, I think there were two intended audiences, Elaine. I think first you were you were seeing an RNC that was endeavoring to speak to the Republican base. And I think you heard lots of themes that are familiar. The ending when Vice President Pence was trying to uh, draw that contrast between where the Biden team would lead America and where the Trump team wants to lead America. I think that was certainly something that would be appealing to base voters. But I think you also heard some efforts uh, to reach out as well. You heard some elements of trying to expand President Trump's electoral base, trying to make him more attractive and appealing potentially to those who did not vote for him last time or who voted for him but aren't sure this time around. So as with other nights of the convention, night three featured a duality of sorts, an effort to reach out, I think, to both of those audiences. And, you know, I wonder, Antoine, um, about your reflections. As we heard from Vice President Pence, uh, who touted at one point the administration's support for law and order. And I want to listen to some of what the vice president said. When you consider their agenda, it's clear. Joe Biden would be nothing more than a Trojan horse 
for the radical left. The choice in this election has never been clearer, and the stakes have never been higher. Last week, Joe Biden said, democracy's on the ballot. And the truth is, our economic recovery is on the ballot. Law and order are on the ballot. But so are things far more fundamental and foundational to our country. In this election, it's not so much whether America will be more conservative or more liberal, more Republican or more Democrat. The choice in this election is whether America remains America. Uh, Antoine, what did you make of that and, and uh, what we heard from the vice president tonight? Well, I think the vice president, like many other speakers we've heard all week, continued to try to paint a different picture um, than all of us see here in the United States of America. It was a continued theme for the VP, uh, as it was for every other speaker, a speech full of lies, anger, uh, frustration, and fear. Uh, none of the speakers, especially Mike Pence, uh, touched on some of the realities we face in this country. We did not hear anything about debt and deficit, something Republicans always tend to lean on traditionally. We did not hear anything about climate and energy. Uh, they tried to paint an alternative picture to the real economic situation. There was a clear-cut ignoring of the worst pandemic since 1918. And then when you think about where we are tonight, a storm headed to the United States of America that could be Katrina, could have Katrina-like impact, uh, social unrest because a black man was killed in Wisconsin, shot seven times in his back. And so when you talk about law and order, that has to be into consideration. Nothing about police brutality, nothing about the most transformational issue of our day, healthcare. So the speeches tonight, especially by the VP, ignore some of the realities we face tonight and some of the challenges we will face tomorrow. I was very disappointed, but not surprised. Uh, you mentioned to the previous, your previous question to the other speaker was, who was the audience tonight? It's clear that the audience all week has been an audience of one. They were trying to convince themselves that they are doing the right thing by advocating for the policy in the agenda of Donald Trump. There was no attempt to expand the base. In fact, I think tonight and all week has been an attempt to sure up the base because the ba they're not sure that they have the full support of the Republican base. Um, you know, Lonnie, I want to ask you uh, um, uh, about specifically one of the speeches tonight referenced uh, if you perhaps have some discomfort with the president's tone, look at what he's done with reference to uh, the president's uh, actions regarding the black community. But I wonder in the aftermath of that police shooting of Jacob Jesus Blake Christ. in Wisconsin that happened in front of his children, what do you make of the approach that we saw from uh, not only Mike Pence, but from others. You know, if this party is a party that is, in fact, trying to expand beyond just the president's base, does that approach, you think, actually work to convince some voters who might be on the fence and uncomfortable with the tone and tenor of some of the president's rhetoric? Well, look, Elaine, I, I think it's the only available option that the Republican uh, National Convention, that the, that the Republican speakers this evening had. Uh, which is to try and soften some of the edges of the president. And you've seen that repeatedly. Yesterday, there was an effort to humanize him. Today, I think you heard a few of the speakers try to talk about their personal experiences with the president. Given the rhetoric sometimes that we've heard, given the tweeting that we've seen sometimes, this effort to soften those edges, to make the president uh, more personable, uh, I, I think that is the best available strategy, quite frankly, to deal with these issues unless... Uh, they're going to take a completely different tack and essentially try to keep the president completely sequestered for the next three months, which is obviously not going to happen. So given the president, given his strategy, given where he is, the approach that you've seen the Republicans take in this convention is precisely as you alluded to, which is figure out some way to make him uh, more personable, more acceptable, and to humanize him in some ways, given all that's going on. 
Um, Antoine, a recent CBS News poll showed that women backed Joe Biden over Donald Trump 56 to 39 percent at this point. And tonight we heard uh, from White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany and the president's outgoing counselor, Kellyanne Conway. I want to take a listen now to some of what Kellyanne Conway said. For decades, he has elevated women to senior positions in business and in government. He confides in and consults us, respects our opinions, and insists that we are on equal footing with the men. President Trump helped me shatter a barrier in the world of politics by empowering me to manage his campaign to its successful conclusion. With the help of millions of Americans, our team defied the critics, the naysayers, the conventional wisdom, and we won. Antoine, as you listen to that, I wonder what you were thinking, because we are used to seeing Kellyanne Conway, of course, uh, going uh, out in front of the cameras and sparring with reporters oftentimes, uh, not providing sort of a character, uh, you know, testimonial, as we heard in, the, in her remarks tonight. What did you make of what we heard from Kellyanne Conway? Well, just because she says it does not make it true. Uh, the truth of the matter is she, like every other speaker, was trying to put a square peg in a round hole, trying to convince herself about the things coming out of her mouth were true when we know they were not. Uh, we saw what happened in the 2018 midterms. Women all across this country, uh, particularly some of the coalition of women that helped elected Donald Trump, voted for Democrats. That's why we have the most diverse majority in our nation's history. We also know this administration and the Republican Party have been terrible on issues that impact women, both women of today and perhaps the next generation of women leaders uh, leading towards tomorrow. And so the polls do not lie. They are a true reflection of the time and what women think about this president and this administration. If you ask any Republican, any Democrat, or any independent thinker about the agenda as it relates to women from this administration, I guarantee you, if you were asking them to give a grade, they would give you an F uh, because they have failed the American people particularly women, on women issues. Uh, you know, Lonnie, I wonder how much you think that particular area of women voters may be a vulnerability uh, for the president this year. Um, we saw not only Kellyanne Conway, not just Kayleigh McEnany, uh, but a number of women who have come uh, before the cameras during the convention to talk about the president perhaps in a different way, to, as you said, soften the edges here. Uh, does that sort of indicate a tacit <laughs> acknowledgment that perhaps this is an area where the president's support may be softening? Well, I don't think it's any secret. For many election cycles, there's been a, a gender gap. Uh, I think Republicans have suffered from that gender gap, whether it's Donald Trump or previous Republican nominees, including uh, Republicans who I've worked for in the past. So I, I certainly think that uh, there is a gender gap. I certainly think that this president would love to increase his measure of support with women, particularly in suburban areas, where uh, in 2018, the Republican Party, Republican candidates did not do particularly well. So there is work to be done. I do think that given the, the current time and given the current circumstance, the appeal to law and order, the appeal to, uh, to supporting that kind of a policy agenda is something that is intended to go directly at the suburban and exurban women that may potentially be uncomfortable with Donald Trump, but they look at the policy alternatives and they say, listen, that is something I'm gonna vote for. You heard the vice president talk about safety and security. Those themes are directly aimed at that population. So if they are gonna be successful, if Republicans and the president are gonna be successful, they're gonna to have to speak to that population. And I think those themes are the way to do it. Wait, well, let's oh, let's let's, let's stop for a second. You're talking ahead, about Antoine. you're talk you're talking about law and order. And again, a black man was killed at the hands of cop at the hands of cops shot seven times in front of his kids in Wisconsin. And the vice president and now you are repeating the words about appealing from a law and order perspective. What woman? What mother? Uh, think that this is an appeal that will make them vote for this party who refused to acknowledge some of the realities that exist. George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. I can go on and on and on about the names that have uh, names of people who have been killed as a result of 
as a result of being killed at the hands of law enforcement. So this idea of law and order, to me, is just a right-wing red meat I talking say, point yeah, to appeal to know, a certain others, element of the Republican yeah. base. Well, right, clearly there is a divide on this issue. It is something, though, as we heard uh, the First Lady yesterday reflect on in the Rose Garden, it's something that she has thought about this moment of uh, racial reckoning in our country. We will wait to see what it is the president himself has to say on the topic, if anything, tomorrow night. With that, we have to uh, go Antoine Seawright and Lan Hee Chen. Thank you both, though, very much. Really appreciate it. Laura, the massive storm is picking up strength in the Gulf and is going to hit Louisiana and Texas, bringing life-threatening winds and storm surge. Over a half million people have been ordered to evacuate. Laura is expected to be the strongest hurricane in the U.S. this year. CBS News weather producer David Parkinson joins me now. Hi there, David. So what is the latest? Where is Hurricane Laura now and where is it headed? Well, this is about as sobering of a weather cast as I can give you, Elaine. Uh, good evening. Here's the deal. This storm is just about to make landfall as an exceptionally strong Category 4 with winds of 150 miles an hour. So uh, Hurricane Michael is a good historical similarity in terms of your wind speed. That was back in 2018 when it had 160 mile an hour winds. This is stronger than anything that has ever hit southwest Louisiana. And if you made the decision to stay, uh, you're going to have to live with that decision because it is too late. Take a look at that. The outer band starting to make their way on. And there is the eye not too far from shore, probably 30, 40 miles. In fact, take a look. We've now got tornado warnings uh, in effect right now, and we'll continue to see those. So the stats right now, 150 miles an hour, moving north, northwest at 15. That's probably the only saving grace out of this storm. We're about three hours to landfall as it is 70 miles from Lake Charles. But here's the track of the storm. I want to point out by 7 a.m. Central Time, on Thursday, it is still a Category 2 with 110 mile an hour winds, and that is over 100 miles inland. It will maintain tropical storm strength all the way to Little Rock, Arkansas. So this is an incredibly powerful storm. And again, this was the Rita path where it was a three. This storm has 40 miles an hour more wind, and it is not just a one-to-one. -one. This is multiple orders of magnitude worse than Rita. So if you thought you could survive this because you survived Rita, you are mistaken. Wow. Uh, you know, the National Hurricane Center, as you know, is warning of catastrophic and, quote, unsurvivable storm surge. David, how bad could the flooding get? And are we talking about a surge that remains for a day or two or three? What do you know or what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so the, the storm surge is always the most deadly part of a hurricane. And frankly, you know, when you talk to, to people who survived uh, Hurricane Sandy in the New York metro area, they didn't really grasp the concept of the storm surge. Um, and it was one of those things where once you survive it once, you never go through it again. Um, if the people who are in the path of this storm of a 15 to 20 foot storm surge survive this by some miracle, trust me, they're not going to make that mistake again. But here's the deal. We've got three factors that we've got to deal with. So we've got the wind out ahead with the uh, eye wall of the storm. So 120 to 150 mile an hour winds just in this orange area. Then it expands to a 90 to 120 mile an hour range. That's now back to the Texas border and then also to the east and then into the 60 to 90 mile an hour range even further out that's 70 to 80 miles from the center all of that is in the early morning and overnight hours so that's when you're sleeping that's when it feels like the house is going to fall apart because it finds any weakness in trees in buildings even well-made structures and it exploits it it hammers away at it again and again and even by 8 a.m you've now still got 100 mile an hour winds well inland so that's one factor but then when we talk about the flooding it's a double compounding issue so we've got all this rain falling we've got 8 to 12 inches of rain falling uh, in most areas and some spots over a foot of rain and all of that's going to want to go into bayous and rivers the problem is is that when the storm surge happens the eye will come on and then it's the backside where more of it's just going to shove it's an additive thing elaine so here's the deal that you've got to look out for here 15 to 20 feet of storm surge that is for lake charles uh well east 10 to 15 feet of storm surge uh over 100 miles from the center and all of this carries 40 miles inland so just because you're not at the coast, all of this water is getting pushed 
further and further upwards, and then the rain has nowhere to go. So you combine the two, and you have a catastrophic flooding situation in Lake Charles. The previous record was 13 feet of storm surge. We're looking at 15 and a half there. That's over two and a half feet over the previous record. And when you look at the historical background of that 13 foot reading, half the city was underwater with that reading. I don't want to think of what that means uh, when we've got now two and a half feet more water in the city of Lake Charles. Yeah, I, I mean, looking at your forecast yeah, maps and, and having covered several several hurricanes myself over the course of my career, we really are just thinking of those people all along that coast there. David Parkinson, David, thank you very much. And we're going to have more news after a break. Stay with us. You're streaming CBSN. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original That's recording. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. 